My name is Ulva Yevstiba, and I am so happy to welcome you all here to the second day of the symposium, Lila Prada is a Superstar. We had an incredible evening yesterday with Abdella Taya, and it was mind-blowing and amazing. And I just want everyone to know that this was recorded, and we will, it will, you can find all these talks and including the one yesterday, uh, on our website soon. We will film everything here. And I do encourage you to go in there and, and look at that when we have published that performance, talk, presentation, what do we call it? It was really stunning. Uh, but today we have equally stunning, interesting, mind-blowing presentations from this stage. From the stage. And, um, I want to use the opportunity to thank all the participants of the performance and the talks and the, the lectures and the speakers who have come here to Oslo to join us. Um, I want to thank my team at the Astrid Fernley Mestead, who, who's just incredible, who's been working with this symposium for a very long time. And I want to thank Hendrik Folkerts, my friend who has been uh, and colleague who has been conceiving this, uh, working with us over the last year or more, um, creating this symposium and, and as a response to the um, culture, uh, queer culture year uh, 2022 of uh, Norway. Uh, and with that, I will just um, wish you a great day. There will be some breaks. Please be sort of aware of the timing on those. They are listed up in the paper that you have on your chairs. And um, I will give the stage to Hendrik. Thank you so much. Also, I want to say thank you to Fritt Ur, I have to say. Fritt Ur supported the symposium. Very important. Yes. Warm welcome again to everyone, to the uh, audience, of course, as well to our esteemed speakers and uh, participants. Very happy to see you here uh, today. We have a full day ahead of us. Uh, you'll be sitting most of the day, but you don't have to. Feel also free to maybe sometimes walk around, like stretch your legs. It's important to acknowledge the body as well, I think, on a day like this. And uh, to accommodate that, we'll have a lot of uh, breaks as well, as, as Solveig said in the uh, program. So yes, you can, uh, you can stretch your legs for sure. Um, let me see what's what here. Yes. I would like to start our Saturday session by paying a tribute to the artist and writer Greg uh, Bordovich. Uh, Greg was supposed to be part of our symposium, but due to uh, personal reasons, he could not uh, travel to Oslo. Greg is another superstar. His activism his unflagging insistence on a queer histories that allow for multiplicity, and the way he embodies multiple uh, personae in his uh, performances have all been a major point of departure for our gathering uh, today. A few weeks ago, he sent me the following description of what was to be his uh, performance in Oslo. Please allow me to read this out loud for you. Each, perform each a performance is improvised and never repeated. The artist allows names, labels, and st st stereotypes to attach to the subject until the a combined weight of all appellations becomes too much for one individual to hold. An artist and a, a performer, as an artist and a, a performer, I aim towards the dissolution of uh, identity defeating apprehensions of myself that appear static and one-dimensional. The live, real-time uh, performance is uh, entertaining for the uh, audience, uh, collaborators, and the uh, performer. These words, how the uh, combined weight of uh, appellations become too much for one, for one uh, individual to hold towards the dissolution of uh, identity was a key methodology of another superstar. Born in Mexico in 1941, Ulysses Carrion moved to Amsterdam in 1972. He went on to become an artist, his a practice unfolding along the axes of a conceptual performance and uh, bookmaking. One of his first solo exhibitions took place the same year, in 1972, at the In Out Center. 
The In Out Center was the first independent art space in Amsterdam, which from 1972 until 1974 offered a, a platform for new forms of art, a performance, video, visual poetry, sonic art, a conceptual art, and uh, artist books. At the grand opening of the In Out Center on uh, November 24, 1972, uh, Ulysses uh, presented six books installed on the wall like works of art in three rows of uh, two books each. All six covers of the books were uh, altered. The names of the writers hidden under black uh, plastic uh, tape and replaced by the name Ulysses Carrion. Another piece of the same plastic tape was imprinted with the typewritten indication, the collected uh, plagiarisms, along with a number. Uh, Carillon's artistic practice started with the ready-made. In this case, the books that he uh, appropriated as found uh, objects reconstituted as so-called uh, plagiarized uh, objects under his own name. Uh, Twelve years later, in 1984, Incidentally, also the year that I was uh, born, uh, Ulysses uh, organized a film festival at the Apple Art Center in uh, Amsterdam in honor of Lilia uh, Prado. Lilia uh, Prado emerged in the 1940s, indeed, um, as one of the great stars of the golden age of Mexican cinema. By the 1980s, however, her fame had faded, and very few people in Amsterdam had even heard of her. The artist uh, Ulysses Carrion went to uh, Mexico in search of his superstar and her films. He organized the Lilia, uh, the Lilia Prado Superstar Film Festival in the midst of summer in various cities in, uh, in uh, Holland with the Mexican uh, star uh, present. I here have the, uh, the uh, program of 1984 of the Superstar Film F Festival, which uh, Elizabeth Freeman very uh, sort of uh, generously uh, brought to Oslo. Thank you again so much for that, Beth. Um, there's an interview between Ulysses and his superstar at the very end of this. They speak mostly about her story, actually, and her fame, and also how she looks back at her life. She ends the uh, interview by saying that only now, in 1984, she realized who she was and what she had done. Ulysses uh, created a video work in the following year um, after the uh, organization of the festival called the LPS File. In the video, he uses the documentary uh, genre to narrate the not so smooth uh, organization of the film festival. Truth and uh, evidence are elusive uh, protagonists in the film, as the artists substitute all the Mexican context with friends from the sort of uh, Dutch art world and shifted the language from Spanish to uh, English. There is a, a constantly unfolding relationship between Ulysses uh, Carrion and the um, found, oh, sorry, and the um, ready-made. In the uh, Lilia Prado Superstar Film Festival and the video The LPS File, he moves between affirming the legacy of the movie star and using her iconic status yet unstable fame to uh, create what I would suggest is a, a quintessentially queer history, anchored in speculation and desire. As such, uh, Lilia uh, Prado became a found icon in an unstable queer uh, genealogy. As the artist said, don't you think my uh, gesture, my choice of Lilia uh, Prado, is just as uh, arbitrary as Marcel Duchamp's one? She is my ready-made. This is how I would like to think about a queer histories, comprising uh, icons that destabilize rather than uh, affirm, composed of ready-mades that upset rather than celebrate and forming a sort of a queer uh, historiography that uh, desires rather than formalizes. This symposium uh, takes place in the uh, context of the celebration of the, uh, of the uh, sort of queer uh, cultural year in um, Norway, the uh, commemoration of the 1972 decriminalization uh, of same-sex relationships between men. 
let us start with this uh, framework to understand what it signifies and celebrates. I cannot think of a better person to start us off with on the Saturday than, uh, than the, uh, than the uh, art historian and writer Matthias Hanbolt, whose scholarship has been nothing less than a very sort of uh, bright northern light. He has written about Nordic exceptionalism, whiteness and uh, anti-racism, reimagining queer and feminist uh, histories, and how archives function and uh, perform. Today he is with us to, uh, to sort of uh, present his experience from this uh, queer year. I am deeply honored and absolutely thrilled to welcome to the stage Matthias. Please give him a very warm applause. Woo! Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Hendrik and Sulvai, for the invitation. And thank you all for being here uh, this morning. Um, it's a really great pleasure to, um, to take part in this event. My presentation today, I don't know if I'm going to maybe take this away since I'm not, since I'm using the Madonna mic, it's better. Um, we, we talked about it, Madonna mic to Britney mic, and now it's called an Ariana mic. I know, but I'm older. <laughs> no, no, I'm Tiny bit. Now. <laughs> Almost. So my presentation for today is called Against Queer Monumentalism, um, Diary from a Queer Cultural Year. We'll start in October 2021. It took years before I had sex in the bed. In my early teens, it was the municipal architecture that formed the framework of my sexual world. I understood quite early on that the public urinal that I passed every day on my way to my Catholic school was not a place for kids. When I finally dared to enter the dark-lit room on the corner of Christisgata and Rasmus Meyers Allee in Bergen, I was totally unprepared for what I encountered. But it didn't take long before I was initiated into the social choreography of the place and found my routine. A quick stride back and forth in front of the art museum next door, slowly past the parked cars, a quick turn and jump into the doorway and in hiding behind the wall, buttoning up the pants and wait, the stench of old piss, illegible phone numbers in the joints between the once white tiles, used condoms between cigarette butts in the drain, the sound of closing car doors, shadows in the doorway, trembling fear, excitement, hands reaching out in silence, cold touches, coming and crippling shame. Decisions to never go back and eternal return. Ambivalent memories of my youth flash up as I look at my shattered face in the mirrored urinal, uh, which is the focal point of Boris Setre's installation, The Sound of the Atom Splitting, at Nietzsche Center for Contemporary Art in Lillestrøm. It's so unbearably beautiful, it's so provocatively elegant. The walls of the exhibition space are lined with thousands of dazzling uh, turquoise sequins, punctuated by rows of icy fluorescent tubes that light up in an undulating rhythm. Most of the carpet-covered room is taken up by a large platform that supports a slightly scaled-down version um, of the circular functionalist urinal from Stensparken here in Oslo, designed by the city architect Harald Ås in 1937, a place which in gay parlance is known as Charlihets Carousel, or the, love, the Carousel of Love, or Soppen, the Mushroom, among other names. The urinal is dragged up for the occasion with stripes of mirror that reflect um, the flashing light bulbs that mounted along the edge of the stage. While the scenography may pass as a nightclub, the melancholic gong sound that reverberates through the room clearly suggests that disco is long dead. Even the huge lump of congealed wax that hangs from the, uh, from the, um, from the ceiling signals frozen time more than just uh, lively body fluids. A monitor in the corner shows a looped video where a camera cruises down a deserted path in the woods. The forest is as void as the urinal. There is no action in sight. All that is left is a conspicuous emptiness and heart-wringing sadness. 
As I walk around the urinal, I'm overwhelmed by a mix of rage and despair. The contrast between the exhibition's hyper-aestheticized universe and my fragmentary memories of smelly urinals is disturbing, is nauseating, I urgently need air. On Nietzsche's roof terrace, I, it strikes me that although I've always valued the feminist slogan that the personal is political, I never told my coming in story as gay, and I rarely actually include erotic experience in my art historical writing anymore. One thing is remnants of old shame, and maybe more the meta shame for having carried so much shame. Another thing, I guess, is this nagging concern that writing too explicitly about sex will be used against me in the public. A time when media pundits, at least in Denmark, are continuously hunting for opportunities to attack scholars working on gender, sexuality, and race, and calling us out for being unscientific, and what's worse. But the sound of the atom splitting disturbs my defense mechanisms. The reference to an all-too-recognizable homoerotic world throws me back in time to a very well-repressed time in the late 1990s when public urinals constituted my realm of possibility or impossibility for sexual expression, and when the AIDS crisis kept feeding my fragile ego with the constant fear of early death. I had not su suspected to get emotional in my encounter with this show, and I definitely not planned to write about it. There has always been homoerotic over or undercurrents in Beresetre's work, since he broke through at the start of the 1990s. And while I've been fascinated by his spectacular cinematic aesthetics um, uh, of everything from dreamlike unicorns and Pegasus horses, who wouldn't? Uh, I'm gay after all. But his perfectionist lounge aesthetic has never really moved me before. But the sound of the atom splitting addresses me in a radically different way. The replica of the urinal from Stansbakken kind of punctures this atmospheric aesthetic that Setre is known for with his reference to such a specific historical gay public space. By putting an iconic meeting place for men who have sex with men on the stage, the sound of the atom splitting places itself in the middle of gay history. But I can't really decide how it situates itself in this historical political landscape. Nitya's press release claims that the exhibition quote, points nostalgically back to a time before the AIDS epidemic, when freedom, identity, and belonging could be explored with a carefree and promiscuous attitude, unquote. This reading is way too depressing in its quick fix superficiality. Because seriously, is the urinal really the symbol for the sexual world that gay men lost during the AIDS crisis? There must be something else going on here. November 2021. The rage and despair just won't leave my body. Although deadlines are piling up around me, I need to create some distance between Setre's exhibition and my overtly dramatic feelings. I write pages and pages with notes on the aesthetic and conceptual dialogues that the sound of the atom splitting establishes with ironic urinals by Duchamp and Pablo Bronstein, and with the aesthetics of absence and aids in works by artists such as Felix Gonzalez Torres, Kevin McCarthy, Alm Gennetragset, and so on. But my attempt to research myself into a better place fails spectacularly as I start reading through the reception of Setre's exhibition in Norwegian media. This is an explosion of joy, reads the headline in art critic Lars Elton's review in Dagsavisen. Quote, Setre's party of an exhibition at Nietzsche will enter history books. Elton's joyful enthusiasm makes me wonder whether we've seen the same show or whether there is something fundamentally wrong with me and my mood. In the review, Elton dutifully notes that the sound of the atom splitting has clear references to gay culture. As the myths go, he writes, they love glitter and glam. But he also argues that there is no reason to care about these homo-historical references. As he writes, it is perfectly possible to enter Beresetre's installation and just enjoy the aesthetic experience without thinking much more. Although he says the installation could be read as an illustration of the stigmatization that gays have been subjected to, all this is, quote, fundamentally uninteresting, he notes, compared to the satisfaction of the seductively beautiful aesthetic experience that Setre invites us into. Just enjoy, he writes. Just enjoy. Just consume. Elton's appeal to his readers to simply ignore the cultural, the political, the social aspects of the sound of the atom splitting uh, feels like a punch in the face. 
I don't have the luxury or opportunity to not think so much in the face of a work like this, and I refuse the accept, uh, to accept this reduction of art and gay culture to just some festive consumer experience goods for the curious majority. Fuck that. January 2022. Like most of my queer years, 2022 started with dancing, kissing, and a magnificent hangover. There's been little time to get kind of over that hangover this year, because the parties have been lining up in this quote-unquote anniversary year, where we've been invited to so-called celebrate that our sex lives have not been criminalized for the whole of 50 years. I have to admit that my gut wrenches a bit every time someone presents this commemoration of the repeal of Section 213 of the Norwegian Criminal Code as an anniversary or a celebration. It is as if we're talking about a golden wedding with a gay-friendly gay state rather than a divorce from a history of institutionalized homophobia. To mark this so-called democratic milestone in the Norwegian history, the Norwegian Archive for Queer History in Bergen, together with the National Museum and the National Library, as we know, took initiative in 2020 to make 222 a queer cultural year. Um, and invited, quote, all institutions, organizations, researchers, students, and others to join us in researching, highlighting, and making uh, visible queer history across the country. Although Section 213 on paper only criminalized, you know, quote, indecent intercourse between persons of the male sex, unquote, the law, of course, undeniably also oppressed women who have sex with women, not least through the invisibilizing of their existence. This law is, of course, one of numerous examples of the perpetual historical imbalance between over-visible gays and invisible lesbians in archives, historiography, and the public realm more generally. An imbalance that often is kind of covered over when queer is used as an umbrella term for all the minoritized identities covered by this cultural year. I never really get used to the use of queer as this kind of flex of, uh, or flexible and inclusive identity term. When I got, first got the taste for queer as a student in the early 2000s in Bergen, the term was still intimately connected to queer theory, at least in a Norwegian context, and we used the English word at that time. At that time, we didn't identify as queer. This was not an identity, but a critical perspective of sorts, or a kind of a position that helped us to historicize and to denaturalize categories and identities. We read Judith Butler and Sedwick and Warner and Berlant and Freeman, and we thought, to fight the regimes of the normal in ways we thought could liberate not only us gays and lesbian, bi and trans people, but everyone who was restricted by society's expectation of how to do gender and sexuality in so-called correct ways. And while queer theory helped me understand that it was not only me there was something wrong with, but actually the structures of the society around me, quite a few Norwegian lesbian and gay scholars and activists at the time resisted everything queer as they just they couldn't hear anything of the critique as an attack on the foundation of the political movement that they had fought so hard to establish. And I get that. We weren't really precise enough, I think. But over the years, these internal lines of conflict shifted towards other terms and challenges. Um, and, um, for instance, uh, trans and non-binary. Um, and the connection between queer and queer theory loosened up as the translation, shaiv, gained prominence as a kind of go-to term when speaking about the entire rainbow of minoritized identities. Although queer theory never really caught on in Norway, I would still argue, some of its norm critique, of course, was picked up specifically by the more intersectionally oriented parts of the LGBTQ movement here. But my old self still keep wondering what queer really means in this queer cultural year. Although Börsetre's installation at Nitya opened in the fall of 2021, it was quickly seen as a warm-up to the queer cultural year, which, despite quite limited government funding, has resulted in a surprisingly large amount of exhibitions, seminars, and events across the country. But my encounter with the exhibition gave me an appetizer of the ambivalence I've kept feeling throughout this year. The opportunity to see exhibitions that focuses on queer lives and experience has been heartwarming, for sure. But although institutions across the board suddenly want to party with us, nudged maybe by the prospect of earmarked ir funds, the interest does not necessarily indicate an institutional investment in um, giving space and place for queer perspectives on queer premises. 
Often I do have a feeling that a lot of art institutions, at least, their sudden desire to raise the rainbow flag is more about wanting to appear inclusive than doing the hard work of structural change. As Tonya Moussa notes um, in an article in FETS, it is important to remind people what queer cultural year really means. It points back to a broad grassroots movement that has stood on the barricades against the state, a counterculture that has given um, heteronormativity the fuck finger, even in times when activism had to take place in discreet forms because it was illegal to be like us. Yet our party speeches during this queer cultural year seems to have little room for discomfort that clings to the queer past, including the sadness, the frustration, the rage over the persistent consequences of homophobia, transphobia and racism, past and present. But we don't seem to have time to argue between ourselves now. The calendar is soon clocking towards 2023, and this time-restricted diversity campaign will be over and institutions will lower their rainbow flags and probably return to business as usual. June 2022. It didn't take many months of the queer cultural year before people indicated that they had had enough. Can there be too much good stuff? asks Lars Elton in a comment about the so-called avalanche of exhibition that opened in Oslo during the Pride Week or before in June 22. Quote, the art world has massively supported the information and discussion project where the lives of queer people are treated artistically. Some people think that there are too many art exhibitions and they get exhausted. Some exhibitions have been so one-sidedly oriented towards their own community that straight heterosexuals can feel excluded. Is this a relevant reaction to a phenomenon that peaks this anniversary year?" Unquote. I don't know if Elton identifies as one of these anonymous someones who feel exhausted and excluded by this phenomenon that is our lives, but he obviously finds it relevant enough to give space to the idea that the majority is victim of a dominant minority. The Norwegian media have spent a disproportion dis proportionate amount of space discussing the victimization of the majority the past year. And as Håkon Lillegaven has noted, these hyperbolic narratives on how minorities supposedly now hold the power to define and control and censor the public debates has, quote, set the whole queer movement and its advocates, specifically trans and non-binary people, in a constant defensive position, unquote. Under a week after Elton's comment in Daxavisen on June 25th, <clears throat> the Queer Bar London was the subject of a terror attack. Two people were killed, many were injured, and even more traumatized. Although one might come to think of the attack against the queer community would instigate a larger debate about the collective responsibility to deal with homophobia and transphobia and hate crimes and the abuse of freedom of expression, it quickly became relatively quiet, as Lille Gavin notes, in the Norwegian media. So much for a queer cultural year. But to return to Elton, he might indeed be right when he's arguing that the queer cultural year has been embraced by Norwegian art institutions in an unprecedented way. But quantity doesn't equal quality. After having left Norway 16 years ago in search for a more supportive queer art community, the fact that art institutions have jumped on the queer wagon this year feels too little and too late. The lack of institutional anchoring of the queer cultural year is also evident by the fact that almost all the exhibitions and projects taking place in larger cultural institutions is curated by temporary staff or external curators. The knowledge and competence is not to be found or kept in-house. Several exhibitions are also clearly impaired by the fact that the external curators have not had the proper time and opportunity to ground their exhibitions in in-depth collection research, but have had to conjure kind of magically alternative stories in a very short time with limited funds and under scanned working conditions. The fact that one single gay male independent curator has co-curated no less than four of the large institutional exhibitions this year says a lot, I think, about how few people either feel competent or are at least given the opportunity to curate exhibitions on queer art and queer history in Norway. The situation for queer art historical research is no better, it's really dispiriting. The special issue of the Norwegian art journal Kunst og Kultur uh, on queer art histories that is forthcoming in December received almost no contributions, despite having had a call for papers circulating for almost two years. 
Uh, although several master theses have been written in recent years that draw, um, that draw on queer theory and analyze art that can be understood as queer in different ways, there are shockingly few of these students who have continued to work on these topics on a PhD level. I still think I'm the only one, and please hopefully correct me, that have written a um, PhD in Norway uh, with queer in the title uh, within art history. And I've yet to see any tenured art historians who live in Norway who flaunt their experience in queer art history, although I know that there are some who are luckily interested in it. This is not only paradoxical, but is deeply distressing, because in recent decades, some of the most influential artists in Norway, including people like Børre Sete, have worked explicitly and insistently with queer topics. And although there is fortunately some amazing curators and critics in the room today, um, and others, who have done important work, made important exhibitions, catalog text and dissemination work, um, the development of queer art history in Norway, if it even makes sense to talk about such a thing, I would argue has mainly come from artists themselves. Fortidsminne, hard to translate, ancient heritage, ancient, uh, ancient memory. The word is painted in large white letters on the wall of a public urinal in Kampen in Oslo. The old black and white photograph that documents the inscription is reproduced in the fan scene postscript for curating normality that the queer feminist platform uh, Frank published 10 years ago on the f uh, in their attempt to draw attention to the 40 year commemoration of decriminalization of men who have sex with men. The pamphlet and the pink silkscreen ancient monument that they made on the basis of the photograph um, it's an example of Frank's persistent search of the historical archives of the queer movement for ideas and concepts that shed light on our political present and the future. The photograph of the ancient monument at Kampen speaks to the long tradition of fugitive communication and coded memory practices in queer communities. A kind of a coded world-making that can turn a dismal urinal into a space for erotic possibilities, if you only know what to look for. Frank's silkscreen print makes me think of queer theorist Jose Esteban Munoz's text about the artist Tony Just's photographs from public urinals in the US, where he writes, Queerness is often transmitted covertly. This has everything to do with the fact that leaving too much of a trace has often meant that the queer subject has left herself open for attack. Instead of being clearly available as visible evidence, queerness has, insist, uh, has instead existed as innuendo, gossip, fleeting moments and performances that are meant to be interacted with by those within its epistemological sphere, while evaporating at the touch of those who would eliminate queer possibility. Frank and Setre delivers quite different interventions into the memory culture of public gay sex in Norway. Frank Silkstream uh, draws attention to how the cruising culture's creative appropriation of public space have turned something like a urinal into kind of a countercultural memorial. And while Frank merely kind of displays the traces of these unintentional monuments uh, of queer sex culture, Setre has created an intentional monument with this replica of the urinal from Stensparken. Setter's installation seems in this way to point to kind of a larger shift in queer memory politics from the tradition of coded and tactical and ephemeral communication to a form of queer monumentalization. I borrow this term from Thomas Dunn, who uses it in the US context to analyze a new investment in telling queer history in formats that privilege grandeur, timelessness, and permanence, and that seem to secure that queer history cannot easily be forgotten or erased in an uncertain future. Seto's installation is not the only expression of queer monumentalization in Norway, I would say. The establishment of the Norwegian Queer Archive in Bergen in 2012 is perhaps the clearest monumental attempt to secure that queer history will indeed remain available for future generations. The monumentalizing tendency has also found expression in more conventional memorials, most lately perhaps in the commemoration of the legendary activist Kim Friele at Vogsalmenningen i Bergen and the works The Benches for Kim, by uh, Lina Vistigrandli. There is little doubt, I think, that Setra's decorated urinal um, has a monumental character, but I can't decide whether the installation celebrates or criticizes this turn towards queer monumentalization. If one follows Nietzsche's nostalgic interpretation, the urinal is, reads like a mausoleum for a bygone era of sexual liberation. But I really find it hard to take Setra's exaggerated aestheticization seriously. Could this empty and useless shell of a urinal, couldn't it just be read maybe as a kind of gentle critique of the romanticizing of cruising in gay culture? 
Or is this glossy urinal perhaps an ironic response to the Norwegian state's patronizing gestures of inclusion, such as when the Directorate for Cultural Heritage named the urinal in Stensbakken an official cultural heritage site in 2009 without doing anything to keep it, um, to keep it in well uh, maintenance? July 2022. After the encounter with the sound of the atom splitting, I see urinals everywhere. And the carousel of love, it kind of haunts me. At the exhibition Skapa, uh, which is kind of closet and creativity, um, uh, with the subtitle Underground Voices and Liberation Struggle in Queer Art History at the Oslo Museum, it's on show right now. Um, a simplified, downscaled replica of the functionalist urinal is part of the exhibition architecture. Skapa is curated by the artist collective Pride Art in collaboration with the feminist art workshop Svingsa. And the exhibition tells about the development of uh, queer activist art in Oslo, as the wall text formulates it. Um, and it centers on the stories of these two collectives that had curated the show. In contrast to Setra's unreachable urinal, here one is invited to step into the carousel of love, as it functions as a viewing room for a video interview with the amazing artist Finn Sack Hansen. The activation of the urinals is symptomatic of the exhibition that kind of buzzes with energy. Almost every surface of the room is filled with materials. Paintings, photographs, sculptures, video, books, posters, fancy and drag costumes, buttons, sex toys. It's kind of everything that art and aesthetics have had in its role in queer cultural and social history is on show. Seen from a conservative art historical perspective, Skapa's curatorial abundance appears amateurish. But this is also the exhibition's greatest strength, I would argue. Because Pride Art's conscious fuck you to conventional distinctions between professionals and amateurs, between art and kitsch, between art history and cultural history, feels really liberating this year. With thematic sections and precise descriptive text, the exhibition provides a really rich and quite moving glance into the contact zones between queer culture and the art world and its frictions since the 1970s and onwards, based from an Oslo perspective. A highlight for me was the corner that unfolds the story of the first so-called gay exhibition in Norway, Night and Day, organized by Eivind Rauset and Anne Reppe during the Humodagen, or Gay Days, in Oslo in 1985. It was the part of a series of exhibitions that started uh, by this uh, group called uh, Nordisk Homophile Kunstner, I think, from 1983 and onwards. I particularly love Rauset's iconic print, Night in Paris, Loneliness with a Duvet, that you can see on top, that I thought of yesterday when Abel Tsaya talked about um, hugging a pillow, um, where this young man in this um, print clings desperately to his purple flower duvet. But also Morten, uh, Ule Morten Nygård's prints that are kind of in Keith Haring-ish style shows gay sex in all its pleasurable intensity from 1980s, I think, is really beautiful. Skapa both thematizes and seeks to break with the dominance of gay men too, though, in their, in their series of annual exhibitions, through the collaboration with Sphinxa. Because Sphinxa presents a wide selection of posters and fan scenes and image production from the lesbian feminist part of the women's movement in Oslo. My personal favorites in the show includes photographs from the artist Inge Os collective performance project Serious Gruppe, or the Serious Group, where a group of women interacted with the vitalist sculptures in Vigelandsparken in a quite amazing way. Photographs from these performances also form the basis of a lot of the wonderful silk screens produced at Sphinx in the 1970s, such as the Serious Group's poster that reads, Lesbians are not seen, heard, not talked about, but they smell. Skapa demonstrates that the meager literature on queer art in Norwegian art history is not due to the fact that there is nothing to write about. The lack seems more to be due to the structural ignorance which is supported by how concepts such as artistic quality, autonomy, professionalism and tradition um, marginalizes alternative aesthetic forms of expression and use from the art historical domain. While Skapa manages to queer in a certain way the traditional art historical discourse and exhibition format, Kude Art Museum in Bergen's ambitious exhibition, <clears throat> The Queer Gaze, okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, it also includes some amazing work by Jacht Rongli and Amma Umad, and yeah, I had to abbreviate this talk. Um, while Skapa kind of queers the traditional format, Kude Art Museum in Bergen's ambitious show, The Queer Gaze, appears by contrast surprisingly disciplined and disciplinary. 
Kodas temporary curator Matthias Gasset and the independent curator Björn Hatterud have followed in the footsteps of the National Museum in Stockholm and Tate Britain by seeking to tell alternative queer art histories by casting self-critical eyes on material in the museum's collection. The use of the singular uh, in the queer gaze made me expect a kind of a pointed curatorial approach to questions of visibility, desire, and sexuality, a bit like a kind of queer take on Laura Mulvey's The Male Gaze. But The Queer Gaze is unfortunately a surprisingly phlegmatic and imprecise exhibition. According to the wall text, the show seeks to highlight stories that have been hidden or suppressed in the traditional museum exhibition and to open up new interpretive possibilities in other contexts. But the strategy is quite undeniably traditional, and the mediation is kind of void of any explicit political and ideological or even slightly provocative analysis and positions. The exhibition's thematic chronological structure starts with a section on desire and eroticism in, in um, Greek and Roman antiquity and moves to understandings of gender and sexuality in the time of the Vikings, in Christian sexual morality, and with norm-breaking women in the 19th century before moving up and ending up in contemporary times. The museum has not made it easy for themselves by seeking to present such an enormous time span in a queer collection-based exhibition. Because even though KUD is Norway's second biggest art museum, there is clearly limited material to work with in this context. The museum has therefore borrowed a few works here and there from other collections to fill obvious gaps, an understandable gesture for sure. But these occasional loans also opens a kind of Pandora's box of desires and thoughts of other works that they could have borrowed and they maybe should have included in a queer show like this today. And given that Kuda's own collection practice and his own collection history is never brought up for discussion, the institutional self-criticism that I kind of thought was the point of making a show that was collection-based is lost. The wall texts, written in the classical neutral museum rhetoric, jump back and forth between telling about sexuality in, for instance, antiquity, uh, and kind of modern queer reception and appropriations of these historical eras. And although the exhibition obviously draws on international research on how certain rich upper-class white men from the late 18th century exploited the homoerotic possibilities in ancient visual culture, and Christian culture specifically, there's just a lot, not a lot of works in Kuda's collection that really supports these stories. The exhibition works often include well-known motifs from such erotic negotiations, but few of them actually invite desirable exchanges. Take the modernist triptych Saint Sebastian by the artist Rolf Nesch from 1941 to 49. This is hardly the most obvious choice, I would say, when introducing how this martyr, uh, like this martyr, San Sebastian, who is regarded as the earliest queer icons, as the wall text to these specific pictures are telling us. I'm not a Nash expert, I would admit that, but this reportedly heterosexual artist, as far as I know, created these allegorical war images after seeing Picasso's Guernica here in Oslo in 1938. And he uses the San Sebastian figure as a kind of critical response to life under Nazi occupation as a German Norwegian artist. Are these war images included in the queer gaze because they break so br brutally, I would say, with a tradition of erotic idealization uh, that characterizes gay culture's appropriation of San Sebastian? Why are they here? Despite my best efforts, I remain unable to pinpoint what kind of queer gaze the exhibition is organized around, and it frustrates me. The queer connections are more evident, of course, in the contemporary artworks from Kuda's collection that are included in the show, where a larger proportion has been purchased with the extraordinary COVID funds that the museum received during the pandemic. But in rooms where the contemporary art is integrated with historical material, narratives tend to fall flat. Uh, take the room Intimate Interiors, for instance, where Per Barclay's almost sublime large format photograph of, yes, a urinal at SLM in Oslo, a gay fetish club, is juxtaposed with three paintings by Harriet Bakker, showing women alone at home playing the piano or reading. The juxtaposition is supposed to tell us something about, quote, same sex intimacy expressed in art. But this comparison just seems to reproduce so many cliches about the perceived differences between gay male sexuality and lesbian domesticity. I just think it must be a joke. A smaller part, the smaller part two of the queer gaze that opened in September this year included 12 invited contemporary artists who were not included in Kuda's collection. It was not properly installed when I returned to, to see the queer gaze in September this year, but I was allowed to sneak peek and it luckily looks far more promising. It even includes Frank in their print ancient monument. 
I'm hopeful for this part, as I've really, really struggled with the collection uh, section of the queer gaze. I so wanted to be generous. I had so looked forward to this first show in Norway about queer art history. But the disappointment gets the better of me. There are so many missed opportunities here, so many institutional and art historical problems and challenges that are not addressed. When I leave Kuda to go to the airport to Copenhagen, I pass by the old urinal where it all started. It's empty this afternoon and surprisingly clean. The old drain has been replaced by three small wall-hung steel urinals, and the paint no longer peels off the walls. But the stench of old piss remains the same. September 2022. Quote, you really missed out of a lot of fun since you never were a toilet whore like us. An elderly man from Oslo tells anthropologist Hans Viggo Christiansen this in one of the interviews he did for his dissertation, Charlihets Carousel, The Carousel of Love, Elderly Gay Men's Life Stories and Paths in Norway from 2004. The man that Christiansen, Christiansen interviews proudly bear designations such as toilet whore and pissoir whore. They were not ashamed at all of talking about how they traveled and trawled from urinal to urinal in Oslo in the 1950s and 60s on the hunt for sex. Christiansen writes, Almost all the men I spoke with could name at least a dozen different toilets and urinals in the center of Oslo where men had sex with men in the period before 1970, he writes. Christiansen uh, writes in a later essay about his surprise by the nostalgia in these men's stories of urinals. Uh, in the decades before decriminalization of uh, men who have sex with men. While urinals occupy an important erotic and symbolic function of these men's life stories, Christiansen argues that it's probably not the sexual play in these urinals that the men is really remembering with nostalgia, um, um, but more the humor and the art of storytelling associated with these places. Traces of this storytelling tradition is visible, I think, in nicknames such as the Carousel of Love. Um, um, instead of dismissing their stories as an idealization of their past, Christiansen suggests rather that their kind of inverted nostalgia turns dominant cultural narratives on their heads. Their romantic tales of urinals breaks kind of flamboyantly with the family-oriented narratives of Norway in the 1950s, as well as also the progress-oriented gay liberation narrative that we were used to that contrasts our contemporary gay struggle with this dark and gloomy criminalized past. At this anniversary of decriminalization, these nostalgic tales remind me, too, that the gay past is not only trauma and shame, but contains qualities that I, at least, can learn from. Qualities created to, are related to creativity and joy and storytelling and community that maybe can help me process my own past as a sad and lonely pissoir whore in Bergen. October 2.22. The urinal in Stansbacken is closed. Despite its status as a national cultural monument, it has been left to decline for years, and the municipality at the end had to cover the, up the entrance with a wooden board. During the queer cultural year, though, a major renovation project has started of this listed building. The contractor responsible for the renovation has wrapped the entire construction in a large white tarpaulin. But if you bend down and look underneath the cover, you will see that the white paint that used to be filled with tags and phone numbers has been sandblasted away. Only the raw concrete remains. To make the urinal functional for the future, the traces of the past have been removed. But the queer story is not over. Will the refurbished urinal remain as the most visible monument to the queer cultural year? Or can we hope that the traces of this commemorative year will not be removed as easily as the stains and phone numbers on a urinal on a wall in Stansbacken? Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Um, what a beautiful talk, Matthias. Thank you so much. I think I'm just going to sit here for a little bit. Um, we have some room just to uh, take some like uh, questions. We can also save it for later. Whatever you feel sort of good about in this moment, it's always a bit hard, I think, to formulate thoughts after such an incredibly sort of a powerful talk. But I, I did want to ask you one thing. Um, and to kind of expand the observations of this sort of uh, queer year a little bit into something that I have been wondering myself, like 
<clears throat> do you feel that in this year, sort of a queer, however expansive a term it is, and however sort of differently it has been used over time, um, was there room also in this year for perhaps a more sort of intersectional sort of uh, approach to talk about sort of a blackness at the same time you're talking about sort of a queer or uh, to sort of uh, consider issues related to land when you're talking about queer? I mean, there's so many strands that you could pull. And the second part of my a question, which is a little bit sort of different actually, it seems it has been very much discussed from the, let's say, the nation state sort of sort of a framework and that's because it's it's a law that's been sort of commemorated but have there also been uh, like nordic impulses in that so to speak to sort of consider a more sort of regional a perspective so i'm just curious how sort of sort of sort of a confined or expansive the approach has been in some cases um, yeah, thank you. It's a, a really good question. It's complicated. Maybe I'm not al always the best, the best one to answer it. But in my impression, there is, you know, there, um, the Norwegian Arts Council gave five million kroner to the Queer Cultural Year. Uh, it came in quite a few hundred applications. Uh, the applications was uh, no. Uh, the applications were um, uh, were evaluated by the by the Arts Council, not, not a specific um, expert committee, but the administration. Um, and there were quite a few projects that got support and some big institutions got support. Um, but the whole kind of idea of the year was a lot that people should just kind of do things anyway. Uh, and there has been a lot of things done, uh, and there has been a lot of grassroots projects, uh, and there has been a lot of intersectional projects as well. Um, and in a longer version, I had much more texts today that I wanted to share. And time, um, um, I did actually speak, or had planned to speak a bit about that, because there has been some quite amazing shows. At Achtendal, for instance, Hanan Benamer and Nur made a project about queer Islamic um, kind of takes on, on public space. Uh, I tried to look through the Retriever, the Norwegian media platform, the database, to see whether that was at all mentioned. Because, of course, Boris Sietre's show that I uh, started with you know, has been received everywhere, every, and even got the Arts Critic Prize, right? Uh, but the economy of attention has not given, for instance, the exhibition at Artendal, like it has a tiny mention in Klassekampen, but that's the only thing. And I couldn't travel because it was only open for a month. Uh, and I couldn't find any pictures online. I couldn't find any descriptions uh, of, from any art. So I couldn't really analyze it. Um, and I think you can see the same a bit with some of the projects in SAPMI. Uh, you know, Marco Menno, the fantastic Sami festival, had a lot of queer projects. Lisa Ravna was also there and did, was part of the Vogus Way project with Timimi and many others. And although that has been discussed a bit, I think, in the Sami context, but in general, majority media, I haven't seen any proper reception of that. No. So I think there has been a lot of initiatives that has been taking place. And of course, the Reclaim the Pride movement has also done a lot of work, not in the framework necessarily of the queer cultural year, but because so I think there is a lot of things has happened, but the economy of attention has been, I think, limited. Um, but I'm not based in Oslo so there are, or other places in Norway, and there has been things. You know, there's an exhibition at the Polar Museum in Tromsø right now that what Jacht Rongenli has some important work. So I think there are a lot of more happening. Uh, and hopefully other people can speak to that in the room. Um. So you had a question as well. Yes, or like it, it's, it's a kind of question, comment, both, I think. Um, first of all, I had so high expectations for this talk and because I've heard you talk before and you did not disappoint, this was excellent. Um, when you, you kind of ended it talking about Love Carousel and how the act of making it into a monument for the future, you actually had to erase the past, which actually points back to, I think, one of the overhanging um, subjects or, or very pointed messages of your talk that who was this year really for? Because I feel as if it has been centered very much in a majority non-queer um, context. And then the queers, have not really been allowed a voice or they haven't been given the space and place they should have had in this entire process. I don't know if that is just me being extremely cynical because it's so easy today to be cynical or if it is, you know, a factual observation. 
I think it is a really, really great and important question to ask. Uh, I don't think I'm the right one to answer whether that's because I am here on stage being able to speak about it. So those who are not able to respond to it, I think, uh, is probably the ones who really could answer it properly. Um, um, but I think it is an extreme, always an extremely important question to ask. And of course, there's also the question, are institutions like these ones and like the ones that have, are they the best houses for these kind of conversations is also a question, right? So do also people seek other, other arenas um, because they're more habitable? And, um, and that's an important question, I guess, to ask as well. But I think it is a super important uh, question. And I hope maybe other people have comments and can answer to you and speak to that. Uh, I mean, also, of course, the joy of a symposium is that um, we have lunch, we have breaks, there's lots of opportunities to actually sort of uh, talk over this. So I hope, you know, we will sort of uh, continue a little bit uh, over the day. Timimi. Timimi, sorry, please, of course. No, no, it wasn't even sort of a closing off, it was more an opportunity to say, if you have sort of uh, responses sort of uh, to this, they don't always have to be in this type of space, right? They can happen in a various type of spaces. So please, yeah. Um, so many things, my love. So many things. Um, thank you. First time I met you ever, you stood in the audience and I asked if there were any queer people in the audience and you said, <laughs> and since that, every encounter with you have just been gayer for every time. True. And I love you for that. <laughs> I do. Um, which actually brings me to, to my question and, and some sort of not completely finished thought. And like straight people, I am not, I am not surprised, but I'm always disappointed in how um, how actively they ignore <laughs> us uh, and how actively they pretend to not ignore us um, but I, I am I am overwhelmingly disappointed in in the queer art world uh, I mean, you are throwing shade, honey, left and right, and you're actually saying what's, what's happening, like all of these money that was for the queer culture year was actually for the institutions, then, then basically just told queer people to find other queer people that was good enough to be on stage, to be, I don't know, to be here for me is actually questioning myself, like, are we too straight passing? Uh, it, it's not been very radicalized. Like, people have been shot. People have been killed this year for being what we are. And it feels like that actually just helped the institutions in their PR campaign of how important this is, but it's, it's fucking white. Uh, and it's, it's gay in a straight passing way many times. We are in this very white echoey room, like white in so many ways. Uh, what would you say is the reason for people not risking more? Like the white queers who actually have these spaces, these positions, these privileges, because I will be gay next year as well. Uh, and I like the politics being the way it is. I mean, I'm just happy that I'm, I've got more than one minority because I don't know what I'm going to make my money from if it's not being a professional homosexual. Um, so why, like I, I hoped that the institutionalized, for lack of a better word, colonial queers would actually do more um, to give the rest of us more space. The way you are talking about it, I, I don't see that happening, like white gay man actually saying, what's up? Why, why isn't it happening more? Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, are, are, are the institutionalized gays, gays too privileged or, or is the homophobia worse than we think there? Because, I mean, mm -hmm. everything that would happen just now in uh, Iran, Scandinavian countries are, are fucking cowards. And we are like 
things are, things are turning bad now. Why are people not using their platforms more? Because we still have like at least two months left. Mm. It's a super important question. Um, and it's a question that I think, you know, um, Sami queer artists like Nilas Helander has asked that question in a Sami context for a long time. There are a lot of uh, curators working with Sami art who are gay men, non-indigenous men, uh, gay men like me, who are not curating more uh, queer Sami art, but also there are so many yeah, queers in the... Is gay, but when it comes to a queer culture here... Sure. Um, it's, it's difficult. I think um, it would be really interesting to have more kind of conversation about why why not, not more structural change happens? Because, of course, there's a lot of events, but I'm interested in the long-term knowledge production, the, the, in, the in infrastructures, and I don't see that a lot happening. Why, um, why is that? So, yes, I do think it is in partly because some of us are really privileged and it's easy not to do so, you take it for granted. And I think it is at the same time also certain forms of kind of in embodied homophobia, perhaps, that makes people not want to go there because it's easier to do everything else. And I think those two are mixed in ways that are, um, and I think they're, but I, I, I think we should have a... Is it, is it common for people, to gay people, to still lose their work because you're doing no. too much gay work? Or no, it isn't. are you that's just why, scared of it? Uh, yeah, that's why it is, you know, it is really paradoxical that not more is happening because I don't think right now, at least there hasn't been for white gay men. Uh, who have tenure as a professor that we lose our work before we do. We are attacked in Denmark. We are attacked a lot by politicians and dragged through the media all the time. Um, not so maybe so much in Norway, although some you've seen that a bit um, uh, as well. And I don't think there is. We don't have a lot of really good reasons to not do more and say more and talk more. I would say, at least people in my position. Um, but I think. Um you know, like also in Sweden, I, I mean, where I am based now and, and still learning a lot, like it's, I recognize a lot of what you're saying in, in that sense. It either feels like, you know, you can only sort of bring it so far sometimes before people start to <laughs> respond in a very sort of hostile way s s sometimes. And there is anxiety around that a lot, you know, and um, I thank you actually. Because it's, yeah. Sorry if I'm stealing time for someone else's questions. I'm, I'm just thinking that um, even in the most like privileged, like in gay privilege, privileged of countries where, where we do actually have rights, the, the like embodied, embodied fear of always having to look over your shoulder uh, is still there. I mean, holding, uh, holding, holding a hand is like, are we girlfriends or are we like gal and pal? Nobody fucking knows. Uh, the, the, the fear of violence will always be there. I'm just, I'm just thinking how, um, how much of, of the individualism in colonialism has gotten into the queer communities where uh, white uh, gay men will always be gay but also white and men. I mean, I understand that you, I understand that you are also scared, but what can we do to remind you that if you help us in, that you will not be alone there anymore? Mm -hmm. Because every time people react, that's the homophobia that you will have to handle to help us come there so we can do this together. Because if, if you're not using that platform, then you are not actively working to change any of the system from, from the inside. Then you are just very comfortable in your positions mm -hmm. and the rest of us are standing outside being showcase gays. Yeah, definitely. Word. I mean, I, I also Can like you... truly hope <laughs> that, you have, just one, one super quick thing, I also hope that uh, a day like this shows that somehow, right? I mean, this is literally why we're fucking here, like, at today. <laughs> so I, 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 I hear you, yet this is the work. <laughs> this is hopefully what we're doing. And I really, what you're saying resonates so strongly in terms of there was a lot of, like, fear and sort of, uh, sort of uh, anxiety from the past, but I think, yeah, to be in that space, sort of, uh, together, 
and I have to think so strongly about sort of uh, Abdella again, you know, with his sisters looking into the room, right? And I think we can all be in that room <laughs> right now. So Lisa, please. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Just a follow up to what uh, you've all been saying now, because so I work not a lot uh, because it's not really um, the focus of my research, but I work um, I work a little bit with colonial gendering and colonial heteropatriarchy. And what we have to keep in mind is from indigenous communities, like Sami communities, we already fear uh, the authority. And then being queer, in addition to that, just magnifies that fear so extremely. And then being in the, so I don't live in Norway anymore, but I feel that Norway is very focused on not focusing on these issues of coloniality, right? That, that um, queer, queering, queer as an opposition to the normative, right? That is a colonial construct. So why have no one really talked about this during this year? Why haven't we looked deeper? And I mean, I know, Matthias, that you do that. Like, you're one of the great allies that we have in SAFMI. Probably because you understand how it is to be marginalized and made invisible. You get that. So you're a part of us. You're with us. But I feel like the institutions of Norway they're not part. And just going back to what you were saying, the Wagas way was an amazing, um, like it was a collaboration between artists and performers. So selected artists were able to really go into the practice of creating something for a chosen performer. And the performer would then take that creation into or activating it in society it was a really great concept, and yet, where was the interest, right? Why did no one from Norwegian art institutions buy some of the artworks, who, which are amazing, by the way? We are. <laughs> amazing. And it's just, I think it's something to think about, that we are very privileged in our positions, but how do you use your privilege? Do you use it to uphold your privilege? Or do you actually use it to make everything better? And I think that this year has been a missed opportunity because we really haven't gotten to the structures. I think it's very easy to come back to all the time that uh, gay men are privileged because they are men, but I also know that everybody that embodies, like everything that embodies femininity risks violence. Uh, and <clears throat> I need you to remember that you are not alone. We just have to remember that you, you can work together even though you are in different positions. So what do you need now and like onwards uh, to keep helping the rest of us in? Uh, because we know that you also risk violence all the time. What, what, what do you as gay white men in these institutions need support system wise to let in the rest of us? I think one of the things that we all need is to find ways to dismantle and change a lot of these institutions and how they work. I'm, I'm talking mm. about conversations, support systems, uh, signing petitions. Let's take that over coffee. <laughs> I would love to talk more about that. No, ex exactly. Um, I, need to, I want to let that sort of a question sink in a little bit, actually, and not give a knee-jerk response to it. Because uh, it's it's an essential one, and it's obviously one that comes out of this year, as well as a missed opportunity. As you know, we've seen a lot of readings. I think in the last hour of what this year has signified, done and not done, somehow uh, institutionally on sort of in relationship to one's sort of own experiences. Um, I think what do you need <laughs> is is a good question. 
to maybe, if it's okay, uh, end this sort of a conversation f like for now, because I also want to give uh, Arnisa, of course, uh, the opportunity to uh, to speak. Uh, Matthias, thank you, uh, thank you for a beautiful talk and for being here. On my shoulders, the task to shift gears a little bit, uh, but also not really, because I do hope that everything that happens kind of on this stage, that's the idea at least, has some relationship to each other, of course. Uh, but we'll be looking at uh, Ulysses a little bit in the next hour. Um, and to do that, I'm going to ask to get the next slide so you can, ah, oops. Sorry about that. Um, I would love to introduce Arnisa Zekor to the stage. On December 3rd, 2016, uh, in, uh, in uh, Athens, uh, Henrik Volkerts, moi, and Arnisa Zekor over there, performed the work Hamlet for Two Voices by Ulysses Carion as part of Documenta 14's uh, program, The Society of Friends of Ulysses Carion. This society was founded by uh, Arnisa Zekro that same year, and I remain a, a proud member to this very day. Please welcome to the stage the uh, brilliant writer, uh, curator, and beloved friend of uh, Ulysses Carion, Arnisa Zekro. Hello. Hi. Thank you, Hendrik. I brought like things. Somehow I thought it's a lot of you and I, somehow I thought maybe it would be cozier. So I don't know, I will start putting them a little bit on stage considering that there is no break as I start talking. Can I help you? Yes, yeah. that would be very nice. So, you know, I thought no PowerPoint, so I made like prints and photocopies. So let's see how this will work out. Exactly. <laughs> Hamlet for Two Voices was a fun play. <laughs> yes, that is good. And then Hendrik, you know, like I made this copies. Yeah. This I will spread here for myself. I'll hand out a few. And then you can hand them out and people can keep one. Ah, yeah, nice. More helps. How do I talk? I also brought some books after the break. You can have a look at them. Things around your list is mainly. So ultimately, there is a little mental space here. We're good? Yeah. Hendrik? Nice. So I can begin.
We lived in a tiny house. Every day, we would listen to the records of Maria Callas. I haven't heard her singing since my father died. I came to Amsterdam to take over as president of the Friends of Maria Callas organization. We have members all over the world. I take my job very seriously. I consider this job an honor. The year is 1985. The art film Aristoteles' Mistake has just been edited. It painstakingly argues for 35 minutes and from seven different cultural backgrounds, namely Dutch, Mexican, Chinese, Japanese, Malayan, Polish, and Israeli, on the reasons why Aristotle Leonassis made a huge mistake in leaving Maria Callas for Jacqueline Kennedy. <laughs> I am four years old. Ulysses Carrion is 44 years old. He's walking through the canals of Amsterdam, going from cinema to cinema, wearing a gray jacket and dye-wrapped scarf. He first moved to Amsterdam in 1972, as Hendrik said. He was 31 years old then. Exactly 50 years ago from today that we are gathering together in Oslo, celebrating the decriminalization of men having sex with men here. 50 years before we meet each other, talking about stars, talking about queer history as a ready-made. Certainly, in 1972, Ulysses Carrion did not hear the word queer outside of perhaps some songs by Noel Coward, which I'm sure he loved. Certainly, he moved to Amsterdam in 1972 for a sense of freedom to live his life, to be gay in a city full of water. And indeed, like, um, sex with men was decriminalized during the Napoleonic reign in the Netherlands in the 19th century. I was not born that year, <clears throat> and from, not for many more to come. Yet, through the years, I've been researching Ulysses' work and his friends with my friends. I want to trace a line from my biography, coordinates to some of his projects, a sort of fictional archive. In 1985, he was already 44 years old. He spoke Dutch and had returned from a trip to Mexico, and most likely still not say the word queer, but for sure having a sense of ease in including in his artistic practices elements that would later be called of having a certain flavor of queer genealogy. For sure he was including in his artistic practice elements that were present in his daily life and the life of his friends and collaborators, like the passion for Maria Callas, like the interest for Lilia Prado. Slightly campy characters, but always with a sense of humor and conceptual tidiness. I like to call his practice camp sexual. A bit like camp and conceptual. It is not a coincidence that he called many of his work, including Lilia Prado, a conceptual performance. And I check with time, I don't know when I started. Okay. Most famously, he had moved to Amsterdam and soon after had opened an art space called Other Books and So. I discovered Other Books and So after having already lived for years in Amsterdam where I moved after growing up in Roma in the early 2000s. And 2001 is the year in which same-sex marriages were legalized in the Netherlands. I moved after growing up in Roma, where I moved after living in Naples, where I moved after being born in Tirana. Shortly after my study, I went to the archives of the Apple and ran across a project titled Gossip, Scandal and Good Manner also by Ulysses Carrion. I was so quickly enthusiastic. Gossip, Scandal and Good Manners took place in 81, the year I was born. 
Not only had I recently opened an art space called Wrong Wrong with my friends in Amsterdam, after an artist publication of Marcel Duchamp, but I also considered gossip a very worthy word. I was trying to construct a fictional archive, a fictional genealogy for myself as a young curator in Amsterdam. In reality, professional terms that used to describe what we do didn't fit me in a similar manner in which forms of prescribed romantic scripts didn't. But I still felt alive, even if inadequate. That should be on repeat. I wanted to show my associate belonging to the city I was living. And Ulysses was a channel, a dissolved body, like mine, and so unlike mine. So back in the 70s, like these white people chewing gum in Amsterdam, for Carion, life is conceptual and a bit chemsexual. In 1973, he made his first solo exhibition that uh, Hendrik mentioned in, in an out center. And he never studied art, only literature. The title of the solo show was Texts and Other Texts and took place in the in and out center. There were hardly any other solo exhibitions after this one. But yeah, he opened an art space other books and so, which then later became an archive, the other books and so archive in his own apartment in Tenkaterstraat. He never made much money, but he was a star in the 70s, full of life, and life was good. He was also publishing the Ephemera magazine, one of which I'm holding in my hand. Maybe it's good to look at him in those years. This is perhaps one of my favorite images. And some of you might have it in their hand. Do I see anyone that has it? No. Hmm. A mystery. Well, he's coming out of the other books and so on a basement on the Blumkracht. This was the staircase going there, the small art space about artist books, he started it. He's smiling, has definitely a moustache, which will be a trademark of his looks for the decades to come. He's slender, not too tall. This is a picture with his, what people call now, partner, Art van Benefeld, for many years. Is it a holiday in Acapulco? Together with art, Ulysses also developed a lot of stamp art, also something very popular in the 80s. They died upon one year of difference of each other in 89, both of AIDS, many of their friends gone. But here they are sunny, or exploding with happiness in the 80s. Something like 10 years ago, some students from London also made an exhibition about Ulysses. And I like that they looked into the mythology, what is, who was Ulysses, and they printed this image. I think you have that one. Yes. yes, exactly. It says, Ulysses, or Odysseus, in Greek legend, one of the Greek leaders in the Trojan War, whose exploits during his journey home are related by Homer. Also very famous for manipulation and trickery and different strategies. Stars. Somewhere between 1972 and today, in 1999, when I was in high school and Ulysses Carrion was already dead, the writer José Esteban Muñoz wrote about a strange thing called disidentification, 
And I know that for Hendrik mentioned that yesterday, which I was very touched, and many, perhaps for many scholars or artists dealing with this, it is a name that comes across often, but I'm not sure how that is in Oslo, so I thought of dwelling a little on that. The book was titled Disidentification, Queers of Color and the Performance of Politics. Munoz describes this identification as a third way in dealing with dominant discourse. Instead of buckling under the pressure of dominant ideology, such as identification, assimilation, many people moving from place to place have had to deal with that, or attempting to break free of its inescapable spheres, for example, communist, utopist, leftist, <laughs> no, I'm joking, but people would think that they can actually escape the sphere. The working on and against is a strategy that dies to transform a cultural logic from within, always laboring to enact permanent structural change, while at the same time valuing the importance of local, of everyday struggles of resistance. As Hendrik mentioned earlier, this word is one that can be very useful to entering the genealogies of myself, of Ulysses Carrion, of Lilia Prado, Gossip, Maria Callas, and other books and so. Perhaps in a way I wonder if I also used Ulysses as a strategy of this identification in a similar manner that he was with other trans and people in the 70s and 80s, including Lilia Prado. I would like to get closer to Lilia Prado project at this identification, but before that, I would like to stop for a moment in the year 1985. 78, lots of years. And there's another little piece. Hmm. I don't know who has this one, but it's two small works of Ulysses. It is just numbers and years all mixed together, like in a labyrinth. And somehow I thought it was an interesting way for, to enter the way that we started working today, thinking of 50 years ago. OK, 1985. I want to ask the question, what is it to be a star? I kept returning to this question. Over the summer with my friend Rory Pilgrim, we took a long walk among the woods in Friesland and spoke at length on different characteristics of stars. There are the shooting stars on the summer nights one wishes upon. And then what is it really to wish upon a star? That quick moment of burning desire and looking up into the sky and feeling in one's heart that the beating is real pulsating. Just the sight of a moving star can create that immense joy. There is also an element of distance, Rory said. One can never really talk to stars. Stars are lonely, he said. They are far from everyone, and the gravitational forces that bring other bodies in their orbits also keep them away. I'm not sure, I said, how many bodies have to be in the orbit for it to be called a star. And of course, there is explosive nature and temperament. On the woods, we spoke about our friend Eve, who is experimenting with performing the star. Like saying to people she's vegan, while in close friendships she cooks chicken. There is something so charming in the performance of the stars. It is like a testing of the multiple selves, a self-extension, an exercise in boundaries, truth and falseness. This identification also works in relation to stars, more specifically when one is an outcast, a wetback, as Carrion called himself. And indeed, it would be nice to see this identification as a way of shuffling back and forth between reception and production, a performance of decoding mass, high, or any other cultural field from the perspective of a minority subject who is disempowered in such a representational hierarchy. So how do stars perform? How to disidentify with a star? Only a few years ago, the American writer Hilton Owls 
wrote about his own fascination with stars. I was thinking of Hilton and his, and his white girls when Abdella was speaking last night. Because stars are mostly feminine in nature, in the old binary sense of fiercely explosive, passionate, and yet vulnerable. They can implode and explode and destroy themselves and go forgotten. They are in that sense hyper femme, even when they can be a male character. Lilia Prado fits this category. Most importantly, stars are born within performance history. Theater, at times, like the famous Sarah Bernard, if anyone remembers, in the West, but most often they are deeply connected with a performance that is mechanically reproduced, often cinema. In the beginning of another book, Women, by Hilton Alls, he writes, he writes about this, uh, a relationship with a person that he calls Sir or Lady, as I shall call him, sits on the promontory in our village, deep in movie love. He's running the same old flick in his head again. In it, the stars kiss breathlessly in true love. Sir Lady and the protagonist love each other, but they never touch. There is veneration, there is sensuality, even everything is hypersexual, hypersensual, but there is no sex. There is no daily life except in the way that daily life is highly a ritualized moment. Strange affair one can have with stars, always trying to grasp, but being, able, but being unable to grasp or when one grasps, everything becomes almost banal. Every man and every woman is a star, writes Aristotle Crowley. It is with this citation that the book Hollywood Babylon II by Kenneth Anger starts. Kenneth Anger is an American artist, filmmaker, also in a way, or maybe a gay man icon, um, already from the 60s on. The book was published in 1984, uh, Hollywood Babylon II, and it begins to narrate the writer's obsession with graveyards and old movie stars. The graveyard was a place his grandmother would bring him, and through her, he fantasized that once dead, he would be able to meet the forgotten stars in person. It is as if their light would reach him from another dimension, another temporality. Just as the light of the stars reaches us millions of years ahead, so when looking at the stars, one can only but look at the past. The stars are never contemporary. One can, of course, witness a diva behavior, a certain distance in a good friend gaining notoriety, but ultimately, the star always embodies another time, another temporality. And just like the planets we see shining into the night, the light comes from the past. When it reaches us, when it reaches us, it's already over. In the case of Kenneth Anger and his book Hollywood Babylon, everything starts with him visiting the graveyard of Rudolf Valentino, uh, a silent movie star icon. And I saw it from Kenneth Anger's book. When I found Valentino's stomp, it proved a disappointment. It was nothing special, just a space on the wall with two dinky flower vases, like those in the old-fashioned limousines, with Rudy's name spelled out in bronze in the long version. Still, I was drawn back again and again. These visits were charmed, and there was never anyone else around. I had Rudy all to myself. And that's also something, it's a pity that I left today because it's something I would have loved to continue talking and maybe it's something that we can continue talking about, this element of gender in stars. In the case of Kenneth Anger, in 1985's version of the book, the story is more bitter. The book is compiled of stories, many of them fictional, often gruesome, gossip, slander about many female forgotten stars. In a way, Kenneth Anger is gossiping, if not slandering some of them. 
presenting them in a scary imagery of decay and emptiness so close to greatness. Does one respect one's star? Even in the case of Ulysses Carrion, perhaps, he's not that close to Lilia Prado. Back in 1984, as Kenneth Inger is preparing the publication of Hollywood Babylon, I am three years old, and Ulysses is on his way to Mexico to meet Lilia Prado. In fact, for him, back to Ulysses, it is not about Lilia Prado. Her name only comes in by coincidence. She is available. She fits his profile. In this regard, it's perhaps interesting to reflect for a moment on the complex relationship of gay men with a sense of taste and female stars. It is a special bond, which is also at times about consumption of imagery and identity. And always in this summer in which I'm walking in the woods with my friends and thinking about today, uh, months ago, and talking about what it means to be a star, I was also, there is this podcast, Bad Gays, that I was listening to, and there was an episode about the relationship of uh, Maria Callas and Franco Zeffirelli, who was this, you know, filmmaker, uh, very, very gay, you would say, uh, also directed a lot of operas, and the episode was going into details about how he was talking about her, also having a sense of, like, how to make her, yeah, how to make a star, so he was, like, deciding, like, how she would dress, how she should lose weight, like, there were a lot of, like, uh, interesting elements, which, you know, now nowadays can also, they are for sure also offensive, but I thought also there is a very complex relationship there that has a history and should be looked at. And I think was even yet different for Carrion, because those elements are missing. Back in Mexico, Carrion kept a diary. After many difficult tries to find an actress, he finally met Lilia on April 14, 1984. He writes in his diary, Cora took me to Lilia's house in her old Volkswagen. The house in condominium looks big and expensive, but everything there is of bad taste. In the sitting room, it hangs a large full-size portrait of her in an almost caricature style. She wears a transparent gown, her hands on her hips. End of quote. Despite the negative description, he likes her and throughout the diary mentions how pleasant it is to converse with her. So she's not that smart, quote. She turned out to be warm, not so intelligent, unpretentious, charming, slightly vulgar woman. End of quote. They talk about him being an Aquarius and her an Aries. <laughs> exactly. Astrology was already then a proto-queer space of articulating conversations and friendship, even for conceptual artists. <laughs> Carrion's main objective, and I think that's what's so fascinating of this project and also of us being together from so many different uh, back backgrounds, was to find what he thought a second-rate movie star in order to express, to underline, to embody the second-rate position of Mexico as a country and as a culture in relation to the Netherlands. So it's almost as if these strategies of disidentification that Munoz describes in 1999 were already present in him because he's thinking like, how can I translate, you know, uh, the cultural differences, and he thinks of doing that by creating this film festival. Um, he says, the above, it, it is valid for any country, underdeveloped country, and I chose Mexico because I am Mexican. And by the way, what I wanted to... Ah, I had a picture of uh, them. I think this is the picture of that moment in the diary when he's gone to see her house, and like they first meet. And of course, he's in one hand, you know, he's doing something else. He's not Franco Zaffirelli, you know, but he's also has that also heritage of how is a gay man supposed to talk to a diva. And later, I saw those later. Okay. No, I 
just wonder with time, I don't remember when I started it and when I... Ah, perfect, okay. Thank you. So he embarks and is aware of the strategies he's using. He wants to make clear to the chosen actress that he's not making fun of her, and yet that his purpose of the experiments are clear, to present her as a first rank star in the Netherlands. Yeah, because that is the translation. Like, he deliberately wants to choose someone that is considered a B-movie star and present her as a first-rank movie star, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah. And see if people can actually understand that. He wants to construct a star to a certain degree. It is a conceptual performance, after all, commissioned by the Apple. Initially, it was commissioned by Will Smalls, who was the first director of the Apple, and who actually had given a lot of opportunities to artists from the gay community, such as Carrion himself or his girlfriend, Hattie Hausman. But now the Apple has a new director, Saskia Boss, to whom Carrion is a bit scared of, because she's new. And he writes many letters trying to explain his project and see if she understands and how can she can get on board with that. And because the way he works, it's not very common. And the Apple man manages, he manages to have this still being commissioned by the Apple. They pay for most of uh, the project, like traveling, or for Lydia Prado's ticket. There is all this whole story how Lydia Prado also wants a girlfriend to come with her. And he's like writing all these letters to Saskia Boss, how he wants the girlfriend ticket to be paid, but ultimately it's decided not to. <laughs> And those were very beautiful, sort of funny things in the archives to look at. Um, but it is not his first time of working with um, this conceptual performance. And I want to go back to one of his earlier projects that has been mentioned already now so many times, not just of Carrion, but also even in Matthias uh, earlier namely gossip, and now we'll, I'll tell you a little bit more in detail what that project is. Going back in another year, 1981, almost four like, years ago, we are in a cafe. The young Dutch art historian, Jörg Zutter, is telling his friend Peter Heinen that the Stedelijk Museum, the main museum in Amsterdam, was going to buy the archive of other books and so, yeah, which I showed you other books and so, the archive was in Carrion's house. Heinen, who at the time was writing for the Volkskrant, a Dutch newspaper, was listening with interest, but suddenly his face changed expression and he asked, isn't this one of those stories by Ulysses Carrion? Heinen realized that his friend was telling a gossip brought into the world by the artist. The Stedelijk Museum was never to acquire the archive of other books and so. <laughs> Still not today. Jörg Zutter, together with nine other accomplices, was using his body as a conundrum of gossip. He and others were actively chit-chatting with art friends about things invented by Ulysses Carrion. Zutra and nine others took part in a complex conceptual performative project on gossip that Carrion started at the Apple Art Center, the same place that commissioned Lilia Prado Superstar, under the title of, I love the title, Gossip, Scandal, and Good Manners. The collaborators had been given some spellregels or rules of the game, eight gossip stories and a notebook to write down the development of the stories, their distribution, how the stories go, and the reaction they would provoke for a period of three months. The full list is stored in the archive of the Apple, carefully typewritten on official paper in small map signed by Josine van Droffelaar, at the time the co-director of the Apple. And it was interesting how earlier we were talking actually about labor conditions, more or less, like where the money goes, like where, how is the labor. And 
most of those gossip stories that Carrion was spreading had a lot to do with precarious labor conditions of the artist uh, already in 1981. Even the gossip, like, but also desires, you know, desire to be a star and yet knowing of not ever being one or having access to that. So uh, the gossip of the State League Archive is going to buy the other, so other books and so archive is very much related to that or his desire to have a solo exhibition in a specific place. Because, you know, I think they were enjoying and with, him, with their friends, they were creating also like uh, parallel networks, but still like most of these gossips have to do a lot with that. Yeah, money, labor conditions, position in society. Um, this word of mouth dissemination culminated in a lecture performance at the University of Amsterdam on June 25th, 1981 with specific slides and drawings about different formats of gossip and it's important in art and anthropology. And I think very quickly, even in oneself, one could think like of many like books or films in which gossip plays such an important part. Carrion later also produced a film documentation of the process and a small publication. So these are some of um, the slides that he used at the lecture of the University of Amsterdam. Yes, that would be nice. Here you go. I will show a small film fragment as well. So let's see what we have here. Sacred writings, duty, irony, righteousness, information management, individual interests, transnationalists, yeah? Success or failure. Thank you. So now, I would like, I hope this is a sort of, you know, you get a sense of what was happening. I want to show an eight minute uh, film, from the film on the gossip sang language manners. And this will be a way also of sort of also witnessing Ulysses speak. Thank you. I don't know how I came up with the idea of using gossip as a starting point for an artwork. It just occurred to me one day while I was still lying in bed. But logic often prevails, and very soon it became evident to me that gossip was the next natural step to do in my work. Gossip was, so to speak, waiting for me around the corner. First of all, gossip is language. But in my work, I take language in the broad sense as a communication tool, and not necessarily in its relationship to literary forms and literary traditions. In the second place, gossip is anonymously and collectively created. This refers to my concern for identity and lack of identity. This concern is usually expressed in questions such as, who am I? Am I really me? Which are my physical limits? Who are you? Who are they? Am I the way they see me, etc. In the third place, gossip evolves erratically, and this is another key concept in my work. I mean the following. On the one hand, there is a closed space or system, a well-defined frame of reference. 
And on the other hand, there is a series of not so well-defined elements that evolve or change erratically. And in the fourth place, gossip is born in daily life. It is related to concrete facts, to exact dates and places, even if these are false. It refers to our basic activities and interests. And all this satisfies my preference for realism. Summing up, gossip is a language communication chain created by an anonymous and collective effort that evolves erratically within the frame of daily life in a particular social context. We have in gossip all the necessary elements for an artwork on the condition that with art one means the purposeful and alternative utilization of communication channels. Gossip is not art but gossip can be used as the formal model for artificial communication chains, which will reveal something about the users of the chain and something about the chain itself. Before going any further, I want to define and compare some basic concepts, some key words, gossip, rumor, scandal, and slander. I am taking as the basis for my comparisons the definitions given by the Pocket Oxford Dictionary. Gossip implies a confrontation between talker and listener. Gossip is transmitted from one individual to another individual. Gossip isn't always untrue, but it lends itself to exaggerations and misrepresentations. Rumor is less individualized than gossip. Rumor is general talk, something we hear in a number of places from not easily identifiable sources. Rumor is a collective creation. Rumors are, by definition, partially or totally inaccurate information. Scandal is a sort of gossip which implies wicked intentions. Like rumor, scandal is a collective experience. Unlike rumor, scandal implies a moral judgment. Scandal is a sort of rumor that, loaded with moral indignation, explodes. Scandal sounds like, ah, and rumor sounds like, pss, 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 pss. Whereas gossip cannot be inarticulate sounds, gossip is necessarily words. Slander is a direct attack on someone's reputation. Gossip, rumor, and scandal can all include a portion of truth, whereas slander is usually false. Slander is an open lie. Only gossip implies a certain degree of pleasure. Only gossip can have as the target people we love. And this gives gossip the possibility of becoming art. Not only gossip's formal model or structure is suitable for artistic purposes. Also the wide range of emotions that gossip is capable of embodying make of it an excellent artistic terrain. If this is gossip, information chain, then this is rumor, multiple movement. Then this is scandal, growing intensity. And then this is slander, definite target. 
If this is gossip, free evolution, then this is rumor, chaotic progress. Then this is scandal, intense radiation. And then this is slander, concentrated effort. If this is gossip, unit structure, then this is rumor, mutual influence. Then this is scandal, gradual advance, and then this is slander, tactical measure. If this is gossip, undulating reference, then this is rumor, rotating joint. Then this is scandal, positive weight. And then this is slander, precision bomb. We can now gossip stop as it. a privilege. Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, I thought it was great to have this, uh, share with you this moment of uh, the voice, actually, of Ulysses himself. Um, and I am thankful to the Lima. Uh, it's an organization in Amsterdam for the preservation of video art since the 80s, who gave access to the films and sharing fragments of them with you today. And I am grateful to uh, artist Evelyn Tao Cheng Wang, who created these dresses that I brought for a performance. I don't know if those makes more much more sense now after you have watched <laughs> the film. And so a whole other story, but with uh, Evelyn we do this uh, ongoing performance on gossip in different cities of uh, Europe so far. Um, um, Maybe I don't need to tell you how in dictionaries gossip is defined as small girl, girl talk or informal talk about people's private life that might or might not be true. Yet, as Carrion says, one can only gossip about one who loves. It's very different from slander or scandal. For Carrion, gossip offers a space to work differently with language and to reflect on different communication chains and subjectivities that engage in the spreading of information within Amsterdam art world and the proto-queer communities. He explained his interest in gossip very clearly when saying that gossip can be used as a formal model for artificial communication chains, which reveals something about the chain itself and something about the user of the chain. The writer Toni Morrison likewise reclaims it as a weapon of the weak. An interviewer asks her, Who are th uh, what is the weapon of the weak? And she says, gossip nagging. Mm. Also, it is something, gossip is also very class-oriented and race-oriented. There's often people that serve that gossip. Warning girls of the danger of gossip has a long tradition. Judeo-Christian texts point to the destruction gossip can generate. Ancient Greek mythologists propose fear of chatting women like the sirens in Odysseus, women whose chattering song can lead temptation, death, and shipwreck. Or medieval didactic texts of how ladies should not succumb to the pleasures of idle talk. The talk of women talking are associated with noise made by chickens, insignificant giggling chatter, in Martin Heidegger, a German philosopher, uh, Beings and Time, an important book of his oeuvre, the suspicious stool of idle talk is discussed at length. For example, uh, for the philosopher, gossip is what releases one from the tasks of genuine understanding. It is symptomatic of what he calls the falling of the Dasein, of being, of being unrooted. And I thought that was very interesting in relationship with identity. But also gossip, it is also something that is so connected to stars, yeah, star magazines. For him, exploring gossip was a direct link to the queer communities that he was living in. Now, coming close to a conclusion and to Lilia Prado. 
I repeat from Munez again, to, dis to disidentify is to read oneself and one's own life narrative in a moment, object or subject that is not culturally coded to connect with a disidentifying subject. In the film that was made after Lilia Prado, there is a section in which Carrion and his friend are walking in the Hortus Botanicus in Amsterdam. And his friends ask, why on earth should Lilia Prado want to go to Amsterdam? He asked me, what does Holland have to offer to Lilia Prado? Here in Mexico, she is, or at last, she was a big star. Thousands, perhaps millions of people adore her. It's answered. Holland is a barbaric country. They have no Mexla there, he said. It is true they are rich, but culturally they are very poor. Why should Lilia Prado go to Holland? Here she lives in a world of glamour, lights, flowers, expensive restaurants, big cars, jewels. Dutch people do not have any sense of spectacle, luxury, splendor. Yes, I know, but about the wonderful system of social welfare, which has by now disappeared. But that doesn't make people happy. Only dreams make people happy. If I were Linia Prado, I would prefer to stay here. But who knows? Try another star. And actually, it happens. He brings her to the Netherlands. And uh, in this series of, um, for example, I love this one. It's from one cinema in the province. It's not only Amsterdam, but also Groningen, Utrecht. There is a cinema uh, title. There is like one film that I love, Oblomov. Uh, from Goncharov's book, and at the same time is Bienvenida by Lilia Prado. And the newspapers like really take it. They don't understand. Sometimes they are like, but why is this a conceptual performance commissioned by the Apple? But they have titles such as Vamp as Art, O to a Wild Tigress, Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man, the political and social mechanisms which are used to impose a foreign culture in another country, a three-dimensional enlargement of a useful dream. Almost done. When talking about gossip and his conceptual performances, Carrion said that his intention was to test the private and the public selves, to check the boundaries of my territory and my endurance. Me, like him, constantly choose to do it by means of marginal, erratical, controllable channels. This lapse between truth and falsehood is true today, as in 1972, 1981, 1984, 5, or 1999. Only the mint notice in my uni years. where I often found myself in the borderline between truth and falsehood, between credibility and disbelief. I always liked making up stories. I remember going out with a Dutch friend to a bar called The Truth, maybe 2007 or 8. We would like to make up stories together, and already then, perhaps, there was a sense of dissolution of identity. He would always say that he was British at the time and put up a British accent and would talk for hours to people we didn't know, pretending to be something else, someone else, and it would be so much fun. It is queer imagining that traverses friendships and gossips, strolls through the archives on a Sunday afternoon, and so much more. Archives are a fiction. Nobody knows that better writes Munoz than queers, people who have had to cope with the fiction of a socially prescribed straightness. Queers make up genealogies and worlds, so let, them, so let us write them down. And so I continue to be the director of the Friends of Maria Callas. I allow fiction into my life. I allow stars, gossip. I am here because I want to dissolve identity. 
I carry with me the work of Carrion. I could still go out and pretend to be British. I walk by his house monthly, but I also still speak with my friend from the truth, making new stories, new anecdotes, and making art together, like today, with all of you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I <don't> know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, this is fabulous. <laughs> Thank you for grounding us so firmly. I think we have a short video clip that we're owed. We right? do. Yes. Yeah. So um, what I'd like to do is. Thank you, of course, for your beautiful episode of presentation and anchoring us so firmly in the work and world of Halises. Uh, we'll show the uh, clip now, if that's okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand the energy of the people in the room. It's like I wanted to show the last five minutes of the film, uh, the Lilia Prado Superstar film. Exactly, and then I think we'll sort of uh, sort of use that as a sort of a transition into a short a uh, break, which I think is nice to, you know, kind of uh, anchor ourselves a little bit, and then uh, return uh, after the break. Um, and there'll be opportunities also in sort of other uh, Q and A's to return to uh, Ulysses, if, if that's okay with you. Yes. Beautiful. Um, please start the film. I would say. Sorry. That's what we're doing. Um, if you could start the film, that would be great. Thank you. Send me the film Rumba Caliente for free. I saw everything was ready, and I returned to Amsterdam on the 20th of May, 1984. That meant that we still had uh, six weeks before the festival would uh, would start. Vamp as art. This film show what is and was mass culture in Mexico. Portrait of the artist as a young man. Ode to a wild tigress. This film festival is like a painting or a novel. The political and social mechanisms which are used to impose a foreign culture on another country. Wild Vamp visits Froggy Land, a three-dimensional enlargement of a youthful dream. Yeah, omdat u mij wel eens verteld hebt dat u niet in eerste instantie de, de beste films had geselecteerd voor dit festival. Ja, yeah, inderdaad. Het ging me niet om, om de kwaliteit van de films. Right. The issue of the quality of the films was irrelevant for this project. Besides, the films were extremely difficult to locate and obtain, so I had to be content with whichever films we managed to get. Maar het ging me niet om de kwaliteit van de films. Waarom eigenlijk niet? I am no film historian. My only concern was to confront questions such as what is a star, how is stardom achieved, and so on. Above all, my intention was to transfer a star from a given culture into another different culture with quite different values. Dus toch een beetje meer een onderzoek naar de voorwaarden waaronder roem en glamour ontstaat. Uh, and and yes, I'm interested in phenomena such as fame and glamour. But I wouldn't use the word research to describe this work. It sounds too scientific to me. All I want is to produce a direct confrontation between an audience, in this case a Dutch audience, and a myth from another culture. Thank you. 
A few weeks ago, I was in uh, Vienna to see the group exhibition Joy, Joy, Joy on the pepper side of uh, Super Infinite, uh, curated by uh, Kilobase uh, Pucharest as part of uh, Apparatus uh, 22. It was organized in the uh, context of the festival uh, curated by. It was a glorious experience, uh, an exhibition filled with profound um, melancholy and ecstatic joy at exactly the same time. I want to read a short uh, excerpt, actually, from that uh, exhibition uh, text, uh, and I quote, Growing slowly in the uh, crushing shadows of uh, trauma, anxiety, uh, ennui, uh, patriarchy, and dystopian realities, uh, Super Infinite, a utopian queer universe, imagined since 2015 by the, by the uh, artistic uh, collective Apparatus uh, 22, in which hope is uh, critical and uh, corrosive to the status quo, becomes a, a pretext for empowering uh, trajectories of joy, for exciting new uh, possibilities, for uh, techno-science and introspection into uh, dreams of happiness. End quote, and wow. Need I say more? It was everything I wanted a, a queer exhibition to be. So on that really wonderful note, and with that experience in the back of my mind, please give a very warm welcome to uh, Dragos uh, Olea and Sandra Temetrescu uh, of uh, Kilobase Bucharest. Please, welcome. Cool. Lovely fun. Mm -hmm. Hello, hello. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having us. We are a bit, uh, we are usually we are behind the scene, not very much in front of the scene, on the scene. So we are a bit shy. I think we'll read a bit <laughs> during the. We, we know we talked a lot about what we're going to do, how we're going to do, but then we thought, okay, oh my God, <laughs> it's a bit too much pressure, so we write, we'll read a bit some of the things. Okay, maybe we introduce ourselves a bit. Yeah, so uh, thank you again for having us. Um, so Kilobase uh, Bucharest uh, is a curatorial duo uh, where we are working with three main topics, uh, namely queer, uh, Bucharest, and economics. Uh, and it's, we have a sort of hybrid approach uh, between 
let's say, some serious academic curating, and uh, what uh, Dragos coined, mm -hmm. actually, as uh, clumsy curating. Uh, which, which button? Yeah. Sorry? The green button. Green, okay. Okay. And it works? Oops. Okay. Yeah. So this is us. Exhausted after some uh, intense months. <laughs> yeah. It's an exhibition we will talk about uh, pretty soon. Yeah. We, you know, we started this uh, for none of us. Uh, Kilo base is not the main thing that we are doing. Sunday's chief curator, uh, she's curator and then chief curator also at uh, the museum in Bucharest, NAC, Contemporary Museum, the only museum dedicated to contemporary art in Romania. And myself, I am part of um, Apparatus Institute Art Collective. So we decided that we have to focus because otherwise it's so easy to get lost. So we took the themes that are the most important for us as a way to get together and hopefully to, to give some uh, voice to artists that we, we adore, maybe. And then, okay. And then, um, we, while preparing the presentation, we realized we, sh we also have to introduce a bit Apparatus 22. Um, so it's Erico, uh, who's also my sister, uh, and Maria, and myself. Uh, we, we talked with Sandra to introduce Apparatus 22 because I think some of the things that we are doing, there are ferments from the work, they, they start as ferments from the work of Apparatus 22. Some of the things that are influencing, you know, the way we approach curating and, and exhibition making and the topics we have. So this is why we um, wanted to introduce a bit Apparatus. And I think I'll try to speak about, um, when I speak about Apparatus, I, I think I'll say they, and when I speak about Kilobase, I say, we, <laughs> so that we try to make it a bit more clear, although usually it's not very clear. <laughs> um, so ferment one, we have a few ferments because uh, we'll try to uh, sort of metaphorically pickle some things. So we try to put some ferments in the conversation. Um, first one is called Supra Infinite. Um, Hendrik mentioned a bit about this universe, it's an utopian universe. They, as Apparatus 22, started to think in 2015 as a way not to escape from this reality, but more like to, to find and to imagine a place where we can uh, f look back to our realities and to bring criticality from a place where hope is uh, uh, the new oxygen, is um, the survival, you know, it's the way to survive. So maybe you want, if you want yeah, to? Yeah, I would uh, read a bit about uh, Supra Infinite. Um, somewhere over the infinite, or better said, just beyond the infinite, a universe has slowly taken shape, supra-infinite. At first, it may feel rather similar to our world, a mere copy of it, but at closer inspection, there are plenty of asymmetries turning supra-infinite into a utopian container for emancipatory thoughts on identity, economy, politics, spirituality. Truly refreshing, there are no maps or GPS for traveling the supra-infinite, and this is how one stumbles into unknown potentialities by pure curiosity. Ghosts of familiar bleak futures prophesied by media and politicians are hovering like prowlers in our subconsciousness. Forget about them, or render them transparent. Hope is the new oxygen. Fermen 2. Um, this will go a bit about how we try to work with questions, which are very important for us as a way to open conversations. And it happened, um, um, it happened a lot in, in the practice of Apparatus 22 uh, for many years to, um, to find this as a way to, you know, to, to go in depth with uh, important conversation for us. And for this talk, we, we choose four questions that are important for, for our reflection about uh, fiction and uh, working with institutions. And the museum fictions. And the museum which fictions, is, yes. Yeah, the, somehow the energy you are trying yeah. to, to work around. They are chosen from um, several sets of questions that we did in different institutions. They are always done for the specific context as a reflection about first about the, that context and also about the potential of, of, um, of that institution in critically you know, reflecting about uh, what they are doing. So this one is yeah, Museum Future Tense. Or, uh, oh, those drops of utopia, how can an institution encourage their formation in order to change realities? So one of these explosions looks like this. <laughs> there are these enormous bursts, like on the stadium, but you know, with the biggest confetti that can fly. We tried bigger, they couldn't. And also we have to just be half in the machine because uh, yeah, it's a very primitive machine. 
two more questions quickly, just to to yeah to bring some more reflection in questions yeah, into the conversation. So, how to conjure a proliferation of fierce hybrid formats, decisive disidentification with norms, and supra infinite care? This was in a set that we did for Kunsal, Kunsal Ghent. And what metaphors for future art institutions could fiction provide? Yeah, another one. Ferment tree. Uh, okay, we'll have to take something one, from one of the bags, I see. Because I don't know which bag is which bag. Uh -huh. It's here. To the doom. Uh -huh. Okay, just like this. Mm -hmm. Can you read, Sandra? Yeah. Dry carcasses, grotesquely spread on steel tables, remains repulsively familiar. Yet what is that impossible bouquet of golden mane and downy fleece, complete with pearl tail? Wonderful, a chimera just froze before your eyes. It's from a series where we try to look at uh, language and fiction, and how you know through language we can we can um, coin or we can name the unnamed. We can coin uh, things that don't exist, and then uh, we're sort of in a way in, in between, you know, um, the, the things that don't exist, and then trying to, to render them uh, real or true or true. Yeah. And then we'll show you uh, one more example as as an attempt to as an attempt for us to, to work with fiction and also with utopia, and how complicated, because it's very complicated, at least for us, I don't know how it is for you, if you want to escape from this reality, but for us it's very complicated. That's why also we have to do this, because every day is crushing us, every day, the mundane, the, you know, the realities are crushing us, so we, we had to escape somewhere else. And then, sometimes it works like this, because I kept hearing the sound, um, sometimes it's extremely, extremely difficult, so you know, you, you do all the efforts to, to leave uh, this reality, you do all the efforts to imagine something else, but it's so complicated. And at a point we decided to, because we had done many things, and one of them is curtains. And of course there are many, many artists that work with curtains, and we thought, okay, how can we, how can we do something new about curtains, hopefully. And then we decided to do something, we'll show you in a second, oops. This is just a mock-up for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oops. It got messed up in the last second, yeah? yeah. It was intentional, of course. Yeah, 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 it was intentional, of course. Sandra, okay. one second. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm a clumsy curator when I do curating, so you see, it's proven. So it's not like, you know, I don't exaggerate with this. So mainly, we decided to do, uh, it's called the hours are not what they seem, and then um, we wanted to do uh, a curtain that it doesn't work as a normal curtain, but it's a curtain in the middle of everything. It doesn't show or hide something visible, but something invisible. So it, it would be like with three elements, like this, and then we just use it uh, you know, as a metaphor for this idea of going between our reality and supreme infinite reality, or other, other utopias. And we always work with this idea of three. It comes also from the work of the collective, but also this idea of three is very important for us as a way to, to break the binaries in many, many different ways. Also in the language we use when we talk about art or we write about art, yes. So this is, you know, we try to do this, sometimes we do it in exhibitions like... Ooh, ooh, ooh. Clumsy, yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, this usually is like, you know, it's like, it's something that, uh, it's in the middle of the space, so it's, yeah, it doesn't show or hide something visible, but uh, just this passage, it's a rite of passage from this world to <laughs> so hopefully another world, which is uh, not, not very easy most of the times. Okay. Oh, we have a mini song. I have to play something. Do you feel in between? No. Back? Uh huh. How do I play? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Okay, I'll uh, pass this. <laughs> Come on, okay. 
Okay. It's very important. Again, it, it talks about you know this uh, this very fleeting moment that we can uh, you know find our home in Spring Infinite or in other Utopia. It's so it's such uh, such uh, you know like mind opening to to try to to look at things from from totally different perspective and then to come back with with works or ideas that could make cracks in the reality. So you know it's always this uh, this uncertainty. Wanted to, to yeah to make a hint of that how complicated it could be for us at least. So yeah, I think that uh, at this point uh, we would want to share with you just a few thoughts we had about this uh, idea of uh, museum fictions and of the, the museum as fiction or of fiction as, uh, as museum. museum. Uh, and uh, starting from the fact that the museum in itself is actually a, a fiction, a fictional construct up to a certain point, uh, and at the same time it's probably the, the, most, the most real one, the most real fiction. So um, having the, prefer, uh, the privilege of being uh, self-referential while uh, on the move. So the museum exists, and uh, even more so outside its boundaries and outside its collection. And uh, it is always oriented towards the future, informed, of course, by, by the present and by the, uh, the past it, it holds, basically. So for us, uh, I think uh, where stark reality hits, uh, leaving us possibly lost in, in grappling with it, uh, the museum's mission as potentiality, let's say, uh, already already begins. Uh, and here we can uh, let it pickle, let's say, in, in utopia and take this leap of the museum as fiction or of uh, fiction as museum. Um, here the fictions of the museum um, are not pointing in the di uh, direction of a fictive museum, of uh, of a fictional place that's non-existent or a non-place. Uh, the fictions of the museum are happening, and they're happening precisely in those moments when transformation is needed, mm -hmm. when mutation is already in progress, when reconsideration is due. Uh, museum fictions are the core machinery of, the, of this polymorphous beast. Um, so imagining museums, uh, imagining and uh, making room for uh, the fictional within what's already a given, playing with the workings of the museum uh, in an entirely different context, uh, all of these are a challenge and our ground of possibility. And you will see in the, in the following slides that we prepared um, a couple examples of um, ex exhibitions and projects where we tried to, to make this somehow happen. One more question, <laughs> which is very important for us as a way to, to, to find ways that are you know, not necessarily related with, uh, with the scholarship of a museum, the seriosity that you know, it has to be in a museum most of the times, but to look at uh, something much more personal um, to find as, a, as an engine for transformation in a, in a museum or institution. So if Rafael Monta uh, Montanez Ortiz thought of a rainforest for his museum, what would be for SMAC? This was for SMAC, yeah? A perfect engine for radical reimagination. Re so um, trying to put emotion and critical reflection within the team of SMAC in this case, <laughs> about what could you know, make possible something that you know, they, they would never thought before maybe, but you know, trying to push them to think about something completely different as a way to, to bring in a museum, to, to make this uh, possible a seed of change, a seed of you know, proper change. 
Then we we'll we'll talk a bit about uh, Triumfa Media, which is a museum from uh, Bucharest. It's a museum for queer culture uh, that appeared last year. Uh, yeah, last year, and it was. Uh, I was, I was invited by a group of people uh, coming more from activism to, to join uh, the project of, a, of an uh, um, exhibition, an anniversary of 20 years of decriminalization of uh, same-sex relationships. So if you have here 50 years, we have in Romania 20 years. We had last year this anniversary. And uh, I have to tell you, in the beginning, I was, uh, I, I was more inclined to say no, because I knew that it would derail me from the things that we want to do with apparatus for at least a year. And, and, the, and then I, uh, I was not sure you know, it, it makes sense. But then, in the same time, I realized this is an opportunity that happens maybe every 10 years. Uh, like, not an opportunity, not for me, but you know, for, for an exhibition to happen on you know, a proper exhibition, a um, complex exhibition to happen on these topics. Because the last exhibition, um, let's say, unfortunately, it's also me and a good friend that we did 10 years ago in a museum. And then, since then, there were just very, very small projects, very scattered. So I thought, okay, if, you know, if this is not the time, then another 10 years maybe will pass. <laughs> and uh, so, we, okay, we said, um, we do it. And the, the Contemporary Museum where Sandra is working was partner, so then I, I put this condition that we do it together as a curatorial duo, also because I think it's a very big responsibility to do it alone, and it's much more interesting to have different perspectives, and you know, also for the conversation, but also for the quality of the exhibition and you know, the, the nuances that we wanted to put in, and, and the research, of course. Um, and the funny thing is that, um, you know, we have, with apparatus, we have a series of words that are immaterial, that are, in fact, we give name to institutions. And um, they always have to be related with spring finis, so with, with, uh, with a bit of utopia. Sometimes, most of the times, we invent a new word as a way to, you know, to catalyze a certain energy. So, you know, we have these words that are immaterial words, uh, traveling in public space, uh, hopefully seducing people into using these names and, uh, and using them in conversations, and also being something that is a core for that institution and for the team to understand when they got lost to, to, go, to go back to that core, let's say. And um, this, um, uh, the, the, the team that was behind this uh, project, uh, they had a very, let's say, unsexy and un an inspiring name, and we thought with, uh, with Eric and Maria, we thought maybe you should propose them a name. But then in the same time, we thought, Maybe they are not ready because they don't come necessarily from. I think we have a certain edge that n not many people that were in the project had uh, with us. They are amazing, they, but they come from very different. I think they, they didn't have necessarily that sensibility for contemporary art. And uh, we thought maybe they are not ready, but funny thing, two weeks later we get this email Would you like to propose a name for the museum? Because we are not happy, we don't, need, we don't have a name. So we came up with something that is almost like a hyperbola. It's called Tiu Familia. So I'll, um, I'll write a bit, uh, I'll read a bit about this. Um, so Tiu Familia, it's a celebration of past victories, but also prophecy, wishful thinking about a better future for queer community uh, and queer culture in Romania and beyond. A celebration of queer culture of difference and multiplicity, nuances about um, how identity is defined. Tiu Familia is a double hyperbola. hyperbola. Affirmative at power uh, 10,000 and above, because, because media, it's a, it's a prefix that denotes multi multiplicity. It used to be used as a unit to, to measure 10,000, and then it became obsolete, and now it's, it's measuring multiplicity. So we wanted to, to go back and to add another prefix, a media, which is like uh, the capacity to be like media. So we wanted for this, for to have this, you know, this triumph and the capacity to be like media for, for this museum. And we also thought it was part of the, how, uh, the entire conversation about how, how we can build a queer museum that uh, is nomadic, doesn't have a space, but you know, we're parasiting other, many other places. Uh, it's very fragile because there's no, we had a grant, but then there are not many opportunities for it, so we have to be very guerrilla in the same time. And then also, I think it's also an exercise about you know, how you can bring artistic sensibility also in, an element, in other elements of what a museum is, in, in this case, the name. But you know, there are many aspects in a museum that I think would, they would, they would, uh, the institutions would benefit if, if they would work with the artists in many aspects defining uh, you know, in, the institution. And this is just an example. 
Yeah, and so trying to also to clear the name of the museum, uh, what the name could be in a museum. So Tion Familia, just to tell you a bit, uh, uh, it's a poly museum fluent in multiple artistic, uh, artistic languages, researching, disseminating, and putting in the spotlight queer culture and queer artistic production in Romania. The practice of Tion Familia involves love and empathy, heightened at a hyperbolic power. Um, yeah. So it's a lot about critical thinking and clarification and querying about what a museum could be. And, and we, about yeah. various exhibition formats mm -hmm. uh, and various types of looking at, uh, let's say, retrospective, either uh, retrospectives of artists or of entire, entire groups and uh, generations of artists, even beyond these uh, 20 years that were basically giving the tone for, uh, for this whole series that will follow now. The funny thing is that we got um, the, the grant that um, supported the appearance of this place. It came from Norway, and, but it came through Ministry of Culture in Romania, which made the process extremely, extremely difficult. And we, we had lots of uh, political interference in what we tried to do. I think we are very, very naive in uh, when we started. We thought, you know, you are in the European Union, we can do whatever we want, not whatever you want, but you know, you have a, a certain freedom that are safeguarded. And uh, the Norwegian, the money were from Norway. So, but uh, at at Ministry of Culture, we had lots of lots of things that you know they tried to derail the project. So we had uh, we had uh, quite I think a couple of fal false starts. Uh, we were supposed to to open in May, and then we ended up opening in November uh, because you know everything was delayed, and then everything was uh, you know in, you know it was almost like in a book of sabotage. Um, and for, the, for, for this reason, we started the first exhibition. We, we did in, in a very small house in Cluj, it's a, one of the biggest cities in Romania. We got this invitation from a gallery called Zina to do uh, a show there. Like they invited us as apparatus and we said, okay, we need it for two familia. And um, this place, it's like this small house. Oh, no, it's next one, sorry. Um, very, very small house. It's like 40 square meters, four rooms. So we decided, okay, we bring a museum, and we have to do, you know, we want to do the museum thinking. It was called Tune Familia Museum Workings. And uh, we decided to do four solo shows, and uh, the fifth, uh, no, three solo shows and a group show with three artists, and then also an intervention on the f facade to, to think about printing. Um, so we really wanted to do a series, we invented then a series that we called Tune Familia Love Letter 2. Uh, we decided to do these love letters uh, as the first solo show to, to artists that were uh, you know, present in, on, in the scene for quite several years, but they never had a solo show. So we wanted to put you know, the first brick in their, uh, in their uh, CV, in the reflection about their practice, through Triumph Familia, to this idea of uh, exhibition as a love letter to someone. And these are just, and of course, you know, having these very small rooms, we had to be very, very niche in the way we approach uh, what, we, what kind of element we take from the practice of each of these three artists in the beginning. So, um, yeah, I, maybe I don't go into like many details because it's a lot, it's, it's a bit insane. Oops. Um, ah, okay. No, no, I'm insane. Okay. Okay. And then this is another, another example of a very quirky place that we found. We want to work, uh, like we like big, we like small, we like uh, all the sizes and all the, I think, it, you know, it's a challenge. We like the challenge. And then we, um, we, um, we, we, I, uh, there's a very nice place uh, called Kunshalbega, Kunshalbega in Timisara, and we eyed the space that they never used before. And in fact, we also give it a name, the long eye. Um, and it was like a corridor between the, the glass uh, of the building, the glass facade, and the, the first place that they use, you know, the box. And we kept, we almost begged these people, we need this space, we want this space. Also because, of course, they do the program with many, many times in advance, so it, everything was booked. We could do things only this year, and we also wanted to do something last year too. And then in the end, we convinced them, and we did this exhibition called Dot to Dot, which was mainly almost like an image that you do, you know, like in this, um, these images that you make. Uh, um, you it, with numbers. With numbers, yeah, yeah. And then you understand the image. So we try to look at, at this idea of, uh, of, you know, about many, many projects that, uh, you know, it's about, they were about pleasure, they were about uh, um, dealing with pandemic, they were about, you know, some amazing scripts about the body and uh, how, to, how to work with your body in, uh, let's say, querying your body. 
you know, okay. And then uh, finally, after uh, many, many struggles and uh, nightmares, we end up doing, you know, the, what was supposed to be the big exhibition, an anniversary, like a retrospective of 20 years of practices made in Romania on queer topics. And um, we lost, because the ministry kept postponing the money and everything, we lost the space at the museum. <laughs> so we had to rethink everything and to find places and everything to, to completely rethink. And then also we decided to do it bigger. We said, okay, you know, we, we just grow <laughs> from our ashes. And um, we called, the ex and we ended up doing a series of four exhibitions. It was like a central one and three other tentacles in the city. And we called the exhibitions uh, you, fe you Feel and Drift and Think. We, what was important for us, because of course we had, uh, we are also very stressed about the right-wing people, we are stressed about many things, you know. Um, and what was important for us is to, to use the exhibition as a way to to put emo people in an emotional state that would imply some empathy, curiosity, and uh, some... Um, yeah, we wanted to allure people uh, to see the works and then to have the conversations. Because this, in, people, uh, in Romania, people, when it's about this kind of topics, people like to cancel before, you know, to, to stop the conversation or to, you know... So for us, uh, we wanted to ha have an exhibition and also the way we communicated about it and about the works and how we did the tours was very much about emotions and appeal to emotions of people to understand difference and to understand perspectives that are coming from queer community. And it was not only about desire or queer desire or queer identity, but may, about many, many, many topics like, you know, ecology, uh, like, uh, I don't know, economics, like uh, critical uh, perspectives about religion and about, uh, so it was um, quite intersectional in many, many, uh, in, in the way we approached uh, the topics and, you know, sorry, I don't know what, uh, <laughs> I don't want to keep too much. Yeah. Look a bit at, uh, to look a bit. To look a bit. Also in the exhibition, um, we used a lot this idea with tree that uh, is very important. Like we um, we had some uh, elements that were um, that that were you know like in this in between between public space and the private space, and then uh, they, had, they were always related with tree. The way we use the colors was related with tree, and yeah. These are some of the tentacles. Yeah. Maybe I, I um, yeah, because I think sometimes I'm uh, too informal when I'm on stage. <laughs> I read uh, some thoughts that uh, we, we, how we thought about these exhibitions. Like one, um, it's like a multi-dimensional puzzle in which. Uh, 245 queer narratives coexist and diffuse one into another until the reigning aspect of love, empathy, and critical spirit empowered at the level of hyperbolic. We saw it as an imperative, necessary, fragile, precious forum, resisting restrictive definitions of scope, where the boundaries between public space, the agora, and the private uh, became blurred, thanks to the adventurous, magical, surprising exhibition layout. Uh, uh, it is also a non-linear, expected, unexpected, immersive, retrospective account of two decades of queer artistic production in Romania. No teams have been imposed beforehand, but they emerged following in-depth research and conversations with the artists, is what Dragos was telling earlier about a vast array of, of uh, themes in the exhibition. Uh, it is also a revelry-free celebration in which we invite you to feel and drift and sing among an abundance of queer artistic voices chanting about identity, desire, trauma, ecology, healing rituals, a daring and progressive future, differences, stigmatum, racism, the contemporary art system, the reclaim of public spaces, the splitting of definitions and oppressive norms, the language and neologisms of an extended vocabulary, fluidity and generosity. Yeah. I think we, um, we go back a bit to this idea of museum fictions. Uh, it was funny because we thought um, um, for this exhibition we also wanted to have this uh, chapter about the future, about museum fiction, about you know, what, would be the f what would be a sort of ideal muse uh, queer museum, what would be how queering can, you know, can make, provoke these changes also in a, a non-queer museum. 
And at the time, we were talking with a lot with Gaer, Gaer Haralset, I don't know, I never know how to pronounce his name. Uh, and um, he was writing a text for a book that we did about Bucharest, and he com compared uh, the museum in Bucharest, in fact, the whole city almost, with the city of bubblegum. So we thought, this is so gorgeous, because you know, there are so many aspects that uh, you can uh, chew on them, <laughs> you know, in, in, in having this kind of uh, very lateral think, uh, thinking at it. And then uh, we, unfortunately, for uh, practical reasons, we had to postpone this museum fiction section, but uh, Mainly, I think this is a section for people uh, that are in a sort of hot, horny, queer relationship with fiction. So putting lots of imagination into this. And then uh, we, um, what we want with this museum fiction is to, to go to be in this uh, halfway or you know, in between uh, in uh, um, utopia and reality uh, check, like slaps of reality and utopia. So we try to, to go that way. And we start slowly, slowly are st starting to gather the material for a book about this from different people. So um, just to mention a bit some, some things that we link with this, we'll uh, read something. Fiction. Friction. Ferment. Forth. Fiction. Phantom limb. Prism. Non-binary conjunction of material questions and immaterial daydreams. Fiction. Wild tongues, mistranslation as a form of linguistic possibility, ecstatic. Fiction. Many states in one, porous, most reliable dildo. Fiction. Incantation, laughter, bumping against the limits. Fiction. Spell, synecdo, slippery. Fiction. Prioritizing pleasure, meadow hunting. Fiction. Below the surface, detuning, Forging of ad hoc communities. Fiction. Does something the poet doesn't understand. Rawness, perpetual mutation. Fiction. Unnamed, arrow to save shadows, gripping. Fiction. A tickling tongue in your ear, triumphant, interspersed. Fiction. Droplets of the meaningless for shaping fresh forms of meaning. Mother of all paradoxes, non-human queerness. So talking about non-human queerness, um, we want to, yeah, to, to present you a short video that is about, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it includes one of the superstars we have in Super Infinity because we talk about superstars. Um, it's called Atletica Ideal. It's an artificial intelligence, a hybrid artificial, uh, you know, between, uh, hybrid between, let's say, uh, machine, um, technology, um, and also it includes a, a very steamy encounter with, uh, with the works of someone who's a superstar here, and not only here. So we, uh, um, it's very much an attempt, uh, it's an attempt to think from a non-human perspective, which again is really mindfuck, it's, only, it's impossible, you know, almost. And then we tried and tried and tried and uh, turn it around and um, upside down and inside out and everything and try to learn, try to, to think. I think it's very important, it was very important for us as an exercise to think beyond good and bad, moral, amoral, and this category, first of all, beyond binaries, but also these categories we operate with to analyze things as humans. So um, um, let's play and then we'll tell you one more word after. Charles Baudelaire. Flutter on your oily body. I am your Marilyn Monroe. Love a voice here to embody. I am Atletica Ideal.
It's part of a series of sex tapes between Angelica Ideal and U Artworks. And uh, we, we really took, uh, made the effort and you know, we took pleasure in a way to, to, to think about you know, extreme, a sort of extreme animes and to, to, to think from a perspective that doesn't know the difference between animate and animate or many other uh, ways of, that we categorize people, objects, beings, souls. Yeah. I think yeah, this is the this is it. <laughs> uh, very short because uh, we knew we are a bit uh, running late. So, thank you. We um, yeah, we prepared to pickle something, but then it's too it's too yeah, it takes more too much time. We of pickle next time for you. No, of course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> first of all, thank you so much, both uh, Dragos and Sandra, for your uh, presentation on some of the. Wow, uh, the many works that you have actually done in the last few years, um, and s both in terms of sort of uh, exhibitions, I think, and forming sort of uh, collectives in, in various ways. Um, of course, opportunity to ask a few uh, questions, um, and, and if you don't mind, I would like to ask you one, actually. Please. Like, I mean, you mentioned a little bit, uh, and that's something that we've been sort of uh, coming back to a little bit, of course, like, uh, that, you know, sometimes in, because you're a nomadic sort of a collective mm -hmm. in a way, right? You infiltrate or sort mm -hmm. of, or let's say, uh, exist in various sort of uh, infrastructures that may not always be your own, mm -hmm. let's say. Uh, and you mentioned also that sometimes, you know, that's met with like resistance, mm -hmm. uh, bureaucracy, sabotage even, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps. Could you kind of maybe talk a little bit about strategies of dealing with that actually? And, and how when faced with such a thing, what mm -hmm. you do as a sort of a collective, but also for sort of the, uh, for the, <coughs> pardon me, for the uh, artists that you represent mm -hmm. as sort of uh, curators as well? I think first we try to protect the artists. Like, um, it's not for example, we've been to so many 
troubles that you know we decided to mainly keep for ourselves or to try to sort mainly within us. It's not a lack of transparency, but I think it's also it would have almost killed us to go through 40 other arti 40 artists through all the you know small steps that we did and the backlashes and all this you know trying to get back. Um, what we do is like as, when we work as curators, what we do is for the artists. You know, we are there for you know to for the artists. So I think uh, what we can do is to um, to give to to sort of imagine a platform that is uh, exciting for uh, for them that would uh, put them in you know in maybe to do some new readings about their works because what we tried also with these exhibitions is to 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 bring some sort of new layers of readings to the works. And it happens uh, oftenly, uh, often for what we do in, in our work. It's like, yeah, rereading, misreading, <laughs> um, sort of together with them, finding some uh, new, layer, new, new layers to, to new angles to look at the, at the works. But um, I don't know, to, to, to deal with this thing, I, I told you we are very, very naive. Um, now, I, I don't know if I would have done it again if I knew through all the things that we went through. Because in, when we finished the exhibition, I think, uh, I felt very dry. I thought, I'm not going to do exhibitions anymore. It, it felt like it was very, very heavy and very dry. And um, also, I have to tell you, within the queer scene in Romania, things are very, very fragmented. Many, many, uh, um, how do you say, constellations or, and groups that don't necessarily communicate to each other. So trying to put together all these people was also a sort of a very complex, tiring, uh, semi-impossible thing. Because we always, we had all these humans coming, I don't want to show with this, we don't want that and that. And we try to, to explain, you know, we try to do, to show community, to show, you know, the wealth, the, the, um, the, the wealth of, you know, of ideas and the importance of these ideas that, you know, people we've been working for 20 years, some and others, you know, more recently. And I think it's, it was very important to, to highlight this. And, but, you know, we always had, there was always a, an issue for one year. You know, we get all these emails every few days. We're like giving a sign to Sandra, hey, we have a bomb. Don't, don't check your email. We have this, we have that. So it was, I think, extremely stressful. And we do laughing therapy. We do laughing sessions. Yeah, we have to do. Uh, we have all sorts of, you know, silly things that we have uh, between each other so we can relieve some tension. <laughs> and music, music. Yeah. I don't know how it, what it all for you, please. Uh, I also think now, uh, let's say more in the long run, uh, you know, as a strategy, and mm -hmm. if we have the opportunity to try and create such a platform, that in the end, you know, you can contribute to some sort of, you know, community building within what's happening in our, in our scene, even though if it's scattered now, it's not so, because it's also a, let's say, a young yeah. scene and art scene, you know, within the, the bigger, bigger scene, so. Yeah, talking about fiction, we had to sort of, you know, there were some holes in these 20 years, and then we had to um, reimagine the way we did the exhibition, so we fill in the holes in a different, so that it doesn't look like there are holes there, you know, you had to look, uh, because I think the exhibition was very important also as a way to address to politicians the, the subject and the importance of it. And we made the exhibitions very complex and you know, uh, we had enormous amount of words because we wanted to make the exhibition by design um, overwhelming, something that you cannot finish to do, to see, to understand in, you know, in one visit, you needed maybe four visits or you know, people kept coming back to, to the exhibition, to, to the exhibitions to, to check them. I don't know, like, no strategies. I think um, it's a big word <laughs> in Romania when everything is just from one day to another. It's, it's really survival. Yeah. It's, uh, it's difficult to explain in a way because sometimes it's very absurd <laughs> and mindfuck. And, yeah. But, uh, and I don't want to complain. It's very factual. I'm not complaining because, you know, we are there. We, we do as much as we can. We try to empower other people. We try to, you know, to, yeah to give some opportunities to, to artists that maybe they were overlooked. I think we're very happy also from this perspective. I think many people from the arts scene discovered practices that were very underground or not necessarily, you know, some of the practices were not necessarily in the art scene, you know, but uh, so I think, uh, yeah, some people got recognition that was not there before, uh, which was part of what we do, you know, trying to put all these uh, works and elements uh, to be, you know, in the, in the writing for our history. <laughs> Hopefully. Absolutely.
Because I would say in addition to building or to bringing sort of people from a fragmented scene sort of uh, together, you've also spent a lot of time building an archive of like uh, practices, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To yep. understand what sort of uh, 20 years, for 20 instance, years, yeah, of, yeah. Sort of queer uh, practices mm -hmm. in your cities and in your sort of a uh, country, what that uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, constitutes, if mm -hmm. you will. We did the insane thing um, because, you know, I think uh, we knew the scene, we knew people, we've been looking at the phenomena for many years. And, but we did the insane thing to, to talk with people and to really dig into their practices and to see how to take also maybe not so, not the obvious thing maybe, and to really, you know, and it was like so many meta narratives between all this work. So it was really an, an such an immense 3D puzzle to, to work with. And we decided not to come with uh, the teams from home, you know, because we can put a grid. It, you can make a grid, you know, about topics that people work, but really to, to extract the top, these topics almost like an oil, you know, from all these conversations. You know, it was important to reflect more and more in depth, you know, what was going on in the scene. Yeah, so. uh, you know, there's an Im important body of, of work and of research, uh, yeah. uh, you know, that ended up in, in the project with all the people who helped and everyone. Mm -hmm that can be used, you know, further on for... Yeah. And I think that's also super important somehow. And it's also nice that some of the works entered the collection of the museum to the acquisitions, but, you know, also being in a visible context, in a context, you know, that was very much research, and I think people were, were much more... The jury was, was much more, you know, giving more credit to maybe some practices they were not necessarily... Yeah. Before they didn't have... To, they were not looked at. So that was very nice for us too. Just for uh, reference, as we're you know soon gonna want to have some food in our yeah. bodies, um, and you know we've seen uh, kind of sort of an overview of so many things that you do. Uh, do you want to sort of refer to certain sort of uh, online sort of uh, platforms or sort of uh, references that people might mm -hmm. want to use to mm -hmm. maybe go back to certain yeah. things that you have done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe uh, because our website is in work. Um, with um, Kilobase, Apparato doesn't have a website. Uh, maybe triumphamiria.ro, yeah. uh, the Queer Museum, you can, you can see there also a manifesto. We did, I, did, I wrote it myself with uh, the curator for theater, uh, Joanna Gonza, and the curator, curator for literature, Vlad uh, Visky. Yeah? We tried, it's an anti-manifesto in the end. We tried to make a manifesto in a few points, but then it became like a stream of consciousness, never ending, never ending. But then, you know, it was, I think there were many things that were very heavy on our souls and minds, and we had to deal with them. So, yeah, this is what we tried to do. It was important because, um, as, I, as I explained a bit, uh, my, uh, my two colleagues, um, they didn't have much experience in contemporary art. You know, she worked in theater, but uh, Vlad is coming from activists. Uh, they're all brilliant, like very, very smart. Uh, so I think also part of my role was to try to understand, to, to, you know, to discuss what this could be as an institution and to, to bring them on board, you know, in how we can do this, you know, in a way that maybe it's, um, it's also very elastic and also more realistic in terms of, you know, what are the realities there. And that would give us uh, some uh, space to do more uh, experiments with this idea of museum thinking or, you know, yeah. So. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, thank you, thank you. If you would do me a favor and flip to the next slide yeah. on your little click yeah, there. Because yeah, yeah. then you see what's happening now. A break. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. A very warm applause for Sandra and Dragos. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, uh, Elizabeth Freeman. It is not an exaggeration to say that uh, Elizabeth Freeman uh, changed our lives, at the very least the way that we look at our lives and our, uh, and our uh, histories. Rather than emphasizing a queer histories as sites of loss and a trauma, she made a, a powerful argument in her book, uh, in her book uh, I'm Binds from 2010 for a historiography that's rooted in the uh, body, in uh, pleasure and in uh, eroticism. Of similar impact is her uh, juxtaposition of uh, chrononormativity and asynchronicity. Whereas uh, chrononormativity describes the uh, time that organizes our labor uh, according to neoliberal 
dogmas of a performance and a productivity, asynchronicity allows for a different a conception of a time, one in which uh, sort of the lapses in time put our past and our presence in a non-linear relationship with each other. This is all rooted in sort of a methodology of uh, erotohistoriography, uh, to use the body as an instrument in seeing and writing a history. Uh, Elizabeth will now take us into a dazzling a journey into uh, sort of a Todd Haynes 1987 film, Superstar, the uh, Karen Carpenter story. Elizabeth, I am so grateful that you're here. Uh, it is an honor to have you as our guest, and I am really looking forward like, to your talk and to having a sort of a Q&A with you, and of course with some of the other speakers as well uh, afterwards. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So I do want to say um, I'm showing a 43-minute film in three parts, which I'll talk about in a minute, and my own words are really about half an hour long only, so we'll catch up some time there. And then in the q and I'm going to invite Arnisa up as well, um, because that's where we sort of lost time, was for Q&As for that beautiful talk, um, and hope that we can have a conversation about that talk, about the Todd Haynes film, about my talk, and about the symposium as a whole. I'm hoping that the pieces will sort of come together nicely. <clears throat> um, so the title of my talk, as you can see, is Karen Carpenter was a superstar to Todd Haynes, Erato Historiography, and the Anti-Ready-Made. And I want to begin by thanking Hendrik and Solve and Umut and Elizabeth and Ina. I won't be able to I can't pretend to be able to pronounce last names, so excuse the informality, um, for bringing me to Oslo. And I want to thank <clears throat> a variety of over-the-counter drugs for mitigating the effects of my chemotherapy long enough to get me here. Um, it's, I have a very fragile body right now, and so if any of you have similarly fragile bodies, I just want to tell you that I feel you, and if you need to get up, Lie down, whatever it is you need to do. <laughs> I won't take offense. Um, so let me just begin by describing the somewhat unusual format of this presentation. Um, I'm going to intersperse my comments with showing a bootleg copy of Todd Haynes's Superstar in three parts. Um, I'm curious how many of you have seen this film? Not that many, which is really interesting. Good, I'm glad for that, actually. Um, <clears throat> my comments are designed to do enough close reading to justify fair use of this material, um, because it's been forbidden by the estate of Karen Carpenter from being publicly shown or distributed. <clears throat> so fair use would do it in the US, I hope it does it here. Um, by breaking it up into parts punctuated by my commentary, I'm hoping both to abide by the law and also to give us all enough access to the film that we can have an enjoyable and collaborative conversation um, in the Q&A. Look at that, there's my title. Okay. So, given a different context, Ulysses Carion declared, Lilia Prado could have been a Marilyn Monroe. I'm not sure these dates are very precise. This was a little bit of an internet forging on my part. But in any case, Monroe, Monroe, of course, was an international commodity, representing the most desirable American, and by implication, global sexual type. The qualities of American consumer products and the dominance of an American aesthetic. In the publicity materials for our symposium um, and in Hendrick's, some of Hendrick's opening remarks um, and in Arnisa's talk, um, there's reference to Carion's designation of Prado as a ready-made. Similarly, the American mythology about Marilyn Monroe was that she was plucked from obscurity in a California munitions factory and set on a course to superstardom ready-made for Hollywood, except for her frumpy name, Norma Jean Baker Dougherty, she was married to a man named Dougherty at the time, and her brown curly hair, which she dyed blonde and straightened. 
As Andy Warhol's silkscreens of Monroe's face repeated in glorious pop art colors attest to, her image rapidly became itself a ready-made, i.e. a standardized physical type, instantly recognizable and rapidly reproducible, available for immediate use on dolls, plates, calendars, and other merchandise. Now, the other context for understanding the ready-made is, of course, art history, where it signifies a common artifact, usually commodity, displayed as art. And we've actually already seen this in Matthias Stanbolt's talk. The most famous ready-made here um, is Dadaist Marcel Duchamp's 1917 fountain, a porcelain urinal turned upside down and signed R. Mut, submitted to an exhibition by the Society of Independent Artists. The piece was never displayed, but was photographed by Alfred Stieglitz, and so this image is of that photo. And notably, the original fountain has been lost, though Duchamp commissioned 16 replicas. Like the late Marilyn Monroe and Lilia Pato, then, the original fountain circulates only as an image and an idea. Now, what links Lilia Prado, and especially Marilyn Monroe, to Duchamp's fountain as ready-mades is a certain quality of smoothness. If original arts and crafts, made-to-order merchandise, and mere human beings are rough, showing the marks of production and or the wear and tear of use, ready-mades are seamless. All surface, equally accessible to everyone, and eternally new because easily replicated, Ready-mades are artifacts of what Walter Benjamin called the age of mechanical reproduction. Yet the ready-mades accessibility, reproducibility, and sheen also certify rather than diminish the aura of the purported original, the work of art in Benjamin's famous essay. So ready-mades glow two ways, forward toward the masses who were promised possession of them, and backward towards an ostensible original whose aura is endowed performatively by the copy. This smooth, infinitely repeatable quality of the ready-made also connects Lilia Prado to another American superstar, singer Karen Carpenter. Carpenter, who died in 1983 of an overdose of syrup of Ipecac, which she used as a sufferer of anorexia nervosa, was famous for being part of a jarringly wholesome pop music group, The Carpenters, whose squeaky clean image was quite out of sync with 1960s and 70s American rock. And then this is a single cover of theirs, um, and the reason I chose this out of the many images I could have is because Karen Carpenter really looks like a nun in this. It's really quite surprising. She was also possessed of an eerily clear, three-octave contralto voice, whose sound she and her studios managed so as to eliminate unnecessary creaks, pitch deviations, or vibrato. So she has all these things in her singing, but none of it's accidental. It's just incredibly sort of calculated, her use of these, um, these techniques. Visually and sonically, the Carpenters were the epitome of a kind of neutral, wholesome, ethnically white smoothness, neither the warm silk of an older jazz or folk nor the cold metal of an emergent electronic music, but a neutral, bland smoothness marked by genre terms such as easy listening and soft rock. These labels emphasized the music's palatability, its capacity to be re received without the listener feeling any oral or vibrational friction. Indeed, Carion's Lilia Prado is a Superstar film festival has an analog in filmmaker Todd Haynes's 43-minute experimental biopic about Karen Carpenter called Superstar, made as a collaborative student piece in 1987. Given the sleek quality of Carpenter's voice, of the genre of the music she sang, and of the ready-made in general, it was pure genius of Haynes to tell the story of her life using a distinctly American, though originally German, mass-produced commodity akin to a portable Marilyn Monroe, the Barbie doll. So this is a, um, an actual superstar Barbie from 1976 um, for sale on eBay. <laughs> There's superstars everywhere you look, as it turns out. <laughs> 
So Barbies are a commodity that epitomizes the quality of the commodity itself. Seamless, without orifices or genitalia, with a fully molded face and painted on eyes, reproduced in infinite varieties that all point back to an essential Barbiness. Barbie is the ultimate ready-made. And this is um, a slide of a box set of Barbie as buildings. Paris, New York, London, London, and Sydney, which I just think is sort of astonishing that you can take these, icon these iconographic buildings and you can sort of meld them with Barbie into costumes. And yet Barbie also remains Barbie, that she doesn't become something else in this architectural transformation. <laughs> so um, I want to show you a chunk of Superstar before discussing how the film addresses the smoothness of the carpenters, of Karen's voice, and ultimately of American self-mythologizing. If you've seen the film, you know what to expect, but that's not very many of you. Um, so let me explain what, what's about to happen to you. Um, <laughs> because the Carpenter State won a suit against Todd Haynes for using their music, the film was withdrawn from circulation in 1990, and it's currently available only as a bootleg. So the viewing quality is always terrible. And I'll have more to say about that in, in a bit, that condition. Um, but suffice to say for now, if you haven't seen it, the sound is murky, the image track is faded, parts of the frame are cut off. Um, the experience of watching it can be a bit frustrating, um, but hang in there, it's, it, it is absolutely worth it. I just wanna say that there is no better quality than the YouTube I'm about to show you. <laughs> I got it on DVD, I, got, I, I used to have it on VHS tape, it's all the same, it's all terrible. So we'll start with um, a little bit of Superstar, about, about 17 minutes, she's, and we're gonna end right after she sings, sing a song. quarter after and sax is jammed by 11. We better get going. Karen? Karen? What happened? Why, at the age of 32, was this smooth-voiced girl from Downey, California, who led a raucous nation smoothly into the 70s, found dead in her parents' home? Let's go back, back to Southern California, where Karen and Richard grew up, back to the home in Downey where their parents still live today. Long ago and oh so far away I fell in love with you before the second show
Now, Richard, I'm not trying to criticize. You know, we love your music. All I'm saying is that it needs more... More punch. Exactly. To break in. What you need is a singer. Mother, I can't sing and play keys and lead a band all at the same... Shh. What is that? Is that Karen? It is Karen. Richard, I think we just found you your singer. And lost me my drum. Yeah. Was that you just now singing? Sorry, too loud? No. Mom thinks that you should sing lead. What? No way. Never fall in love again. Oh, I'll never fall in love again. Who else has heard this tape? RCA, Columbia, uh, DECA. And they all turned you down? They said it wouldn't sell. That hard rock's in. And Holson's out. What's your name? Me? Karen. Karen, I like your voice. Tell you the truth, I think you kids have really got something here. Karen and Richard Carpenter. Just a couple of kids next door. Now listen to me. You kids are young, fresh, and it'll just be up to me to make young and fresh a happening thing. I know it's a rough road out there and the stakes are high, but don't you worry. We're a real family here at A&M. We'll take real good care of you. All you have to do is put yourself in my hands. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a special treat tonight. It's my pleasure to introduce to you the Carpenters. The year is 1970, and suddenly, the nation finds itself asking the question, what if, instead of the riots and assassinations, the protests and the drugs, instead of the angry words and hard rock sounds, we were to hear something soft and smooth, and see something of wholesomeness and easy-handed faith. 
this was the year that put the song onto the charts that made the Carpenters a household word. Are you all right? Uh, I'm sorry, Richard. God damn, I'm really flubbing it up today, aren't I? I'm sorry, guys. Don't worry about it, okay? I don't know what's the matter with me. Just relax. Take a deep breath. Look, we'll just do it until it's right. You just do what I tell you, and it'll be great. Well, I just want it to be perfect. myself think. Now, where was I? Waist, 28. Thighs, 20. Why do you need thighs? For the pantsuit, the hip hugger. I thought we decided against the hip hugger. Well, the pantsuit's adorable. You can't just wear long dresses, Karen. I don't care what you read about the midi or the maxi. I will not wear that hip hugger thing, Mother. It makes me look really fat. Oh, fat. I swear, ever since that stupid columnist called you party or something. He called me chubby. Whatever, chubby. You have just been so fanatical about your weight. I mean, that thing really went to your head. Oh, it did not. I just want to start watching what I eat. Karen, you lost plenty of weight on that Stillman diet, and you look just fine now, all right? Now, that's all I want to hear on the subject. You just concentrate on your career. That's what I am doing, but you got to look good in my career. Karen, Karen, you'll never get. Jack's taking us out for a huge celebration dinner in your honor. It's smorgasbord at Scandia. Oh, my. Well, what do you say to that? eventually destroyed Karen Carpenter is one that plagues many, many young women like her. The name of this private obsession? Anorexia nervosa. What is anorexia nervosa? Anorexia nervosa is a condition of self-starvation which affects mostly women in their adolescence or young adulthood. Sufferers desperately want to be thin and often transform their bodies to such an extent that menstruation ceases and they revert to a prepubescent stage. Do anorexics ever get hungry? The term anorexia means lack of appetite, yet those who suffer from it are obsessed with food and its preparation while they deny their own hunger and their body's need for nutrients. Do they really think they look attractive like that? Anorectics often have a distorted perception of their actual body size. Although experts still cannot account for this basic misrecognition, they do point out that the rigorous self-discipline imposed by the anorectic is often the cause of an extreme exhilaration, or high, which accompanies and rewards her denial of food. Such a feeling's coming over me There is wonder in most everything I see Especially for me And the reason is clear 
Karen. Hey, if I don't say so myself, I think we both look pretty good up there. <laughs> but who was that sexy chick at the microphone? Oh, yeah, right. Now, you kids are getting big, all right, but you're not going to get big headed. Not if I can help it. Come on, we were just kidding. Let me finish. Now, your father and I have been talking, and we feel that no matter how famous you get, you're both to continue living at home to avoid as much of that life as possible. I don't have to go into our policy on drugs. It remains the same. But we feel that in addition to this, you might start thinking about something charitable to do with your money. Sensible investment of some kind. Maybe even something for the Downey community. That's a great suggestion, Mom. And it's very keeping with our image. Hello? Oh, hello, Jack. Yes, we're all here. From who? You're kidding. No. This weekend? Oh, my goodness. What, what is it, Agnes? The president has requested you to sing at the White House brunch this weekend. <laughs> This first part of the film, I just would like you to notice how it foregrounds, immediately foregrounds smoothness. Its narrator has that silky voice that my friends and I sometimes refer to as an NPR voice, national public radio, sort of low pitched with no significant dialect. Um, the narrator refers to Karen as a smooth voiced girl who led a raucous nation smoothly into the 1970s. And here, the ideological work of the carpenters is laid bare. They were understood to heal the national rifts and wounds of the 1960s, including losses in an unpopular war, the Kennedy assassinations, and for many conservatives, the gains in civil rights for white women and people of color. The image track reiterates this smoothness with images of suburban, probably prefab post-war houses the soundtrack swelling with Karen's voice singing Superstar, homing in on a dollhouse version of the Carpenter Residence, whose original was located because history loves irony in the velvety sounding Downey, California. Inside the house, the dialogue between the Barbie dolls representing Karen, her brother Richard, and their parents seesaws between themes of smoothness and roughness, hardness and softness, their mother declares that Richard needs to break in. The father that the band needs more punch, and thus a lead singer. And the mother declares, when she overhears Karen singing in the bedroom, that she should be the new lead singer. So ironically, bringing Karen in as a singer is the percussive, penetrative solution to the problems of social conflict and American tastes alike. For as Richard says, hard rocks in, and Karen echoes, and wholesome's out. Yet, as the soundtrack of Carpenter's songs demonstrates, Karen's vocals only confirm the glossy, ready-made, whole, and wholesome qualities of the musical group. Just a couple of kids next door, says the A&M record agent who picks them up. After a montage of the Carpenter dolls performing, set to We've Only Just Begun, the narrator moves this to the national realm over a montage of American political imagery, including flags, protests, bombs, and a Miss America pageant. The year is 1970, he intones, and suddenly the nation finds itself asking the question, what if, 
Instead of the riots and assassinations, the protests and the drugs, instead of the angry words and hard rock sounds, we were to hear something soft and smooth and see something of wholesomeness and easy-handed faith. This was the year that put the song on the charts that made the Carpenters a household word. We then hear the opening bars of Close to You. Finally, and yet another doubling of the theme of smoothness, as Karen begins to develop the eating disorder that eventually kills her, we see fleeting shots of x lax the purgative that generated the contemptuous slang phrase, smooth move, x lax And I should say I'd actually misremembered that slogan as one of the company's taglines, <laughs> um, as it became more famous than any of the real ones. But it's just a kind of, slangy, I mean, it's out of date now, but smooth move x lax was sort of something people said to each other in the 1970s when they meant you're an idiot. <laughs> so, but it wasn't, it wasn't actually their, their ad tagline. I was very sad to find that out because that's how I'd remembered it. So in short, from the doll cast to the film's narration to parts of the image, track, and dialogue to the x lax as self-medication and as metaphor, Superstar is well aware of the power of the ready-made and its smoothness. And now onto another chunk of the film. The Carpenters um, come out of the Burt Bacharach for Alpert Town in the 60s. But their music was even cleaner, more purified. There was just something about Karen Carpenter's voice that you couldn't dismiss. I mean, here was this um, corny teenage girl with bangs singing these songs with that deep, sort of sophisticated voice of hers. To me, their sound was um, too smooth and manipulative, and their image was too clean and sweet. And so they epitomized for me the return to reactionary values in the 70s. And I never trusted them. I think Karen Carpenter was a very underestimated performer. And she was one of my main influences. Her vocal range, her phrasing, they were totally unique, totally different. So the way she evoked a kind of irony in the song. I mean, just listen to Rainy Days and Mondays. No one was doing that at the time. She was totally unique. But instead she became this kind of joke, this goody-goody girl. I feel like she never got the recognition that she deserved. Karen, you 
you starve yourself, all you ever eat is salad and iced tea. I really don't know why you're making such a big deal out of this. Here, eat this. I just want to see you take a bite. Come on, Karen. I don't want to. Stop it. Why? Why can't you take it in one bite? Following World War II and the end of rationing in the early 50s, America was reacquainted with food as plentiful and cheap. There were vast changes in food delivery, availability, and storage. Refrigerators, already a part of the American kitchen, became commonplace and thus eliminated the need for daily shopping. The growth of supermarkets with their rows and rows of dairy products, canned goods, meats, condiments, bakery goods, vegetables, fruits and samples brought a large display of food into everybody's range. Few could leave the supermarket without buying more than they intended. And the kitchen, often the center of the home, contained an ever-expanding variety of foods. Home life in America connoted the cozy kitchen, food preparation, and meal time.
Karen. I think she's coming, too. Karen? Oh, where am I? You're in the hospital, dear. You collapsed on stage. From exhaustion and malnutrition. You'll be here five more days. Then home for plenty of rest. You're going to be under Mom's constant care. I'll cook for you. She's going to fan you up. No more dieting. No more laxatives. And we'll all be together again. There is a discouragingly high failure rate in the treatment of anorexia. The refusal to eat is so annoying to doctors and family that intervention seems to focus entirely on trying to make the sufferer eat. When the anorectic is unable to comply with the dietary plan, she is often force-fed. In these cases, the patient is considered officially recovered when the normal weight is reached and appropriate sex role functioning achieved. Ultimately, treatments which assert absolute control over the patient's life only contribute to anorectic behavior, which is often the result of highly controlled familial environments. Listen, I have a toast to make. To Karen, whose public is eagerly awaiting her return. Oh, Karen. Karen. Thank you. And what do you say, Richard? We have a surprise for Mom and Dad. Oh. Do you think it now's the time? <laughs> we're sure. We're celebrating. Okay. Mom, Dad, seeing as I'm turning 25 soon, and um, Richard was 25 when he moved out, we thought this was the year for me to try it. Your brother was 26. Mom, listen. We found the most beautiful condo in Century City. Century uh, City? Out of the question. Mother, wait. For I will not allow Karen to move to some apartment an hour away from here after what just happened to her. Why can't she find a nice place in Downey? Why does she have to be out in the middle of... Because she doesn't want to live in Downey, all right? I'm so glad you could come. I wouldn't have missed it. How are you feeling? It's really great. I'm so excited about the new place. Did you see the TV screen? It's seven feet wide. It's a beautiful apartment. I wish you all the luck. Karen, I'd like you to meet a terrific guy. Terry Alice, this is my sister, Karen. Nice to meet you. Come in, Richard. It's open. Karen? I'll be there in a sec. Okay, but we can't be late. You remember what happened the last time? Jack's made time to see us. I'm ready, let's go. Karen. What are you doing with these? I, I, I was constipated. Oh, you liar! Don't tell Mom and Dad, Richard. Please. Why shouldn't Don't. I? Why shouldn't I tell them? Do you know you are just ruining if us? If you do, I'll tell them about you and your private life. Say one word to them. One fucking word, Karen. They're gonna find out sooner or later. You little bitch! What's wrong? Do the carpenters have something to hide? Come and mach me back. In the cold climate. Greater war approached America. Also, use for only $9.97. Start your subscription. Oh. Well, we're going to be giving a... You can be open. One, eight. Sure. Sure. Hey, I'm sorry. Yes, Whatever one knows that it is worth every bit.
sitting down? And why did she have to be out in the middle of... You collapsed on stage. All you have to do is put yourself in my hands. You have just been so fanatical about your way. All you have to eat is salad and iced tea. What are you trying to do? Ruin both our careers? Song. Okay. At this point, I want to turn to the ways that Superstar counterposes the smoothness of the ready-made, the commodity object, and American nationalist myth-making to a rough and frictive method that I will correlate with another mode of historical representational practice, which in my 2010 book, Time Binds, I call erotohistoriography. In that book, I define erotohistoriography fairly loosely as a method of encountering the past that uses the body and avows its role in that encounter and does not rule out pleasure or even sexual excitement as part of it. I developed this concept in counterpoint to Frederick, to Frederick Jameson's Marxist dictate that history is what hurts, suggesting that history can also be what arouses or stimulates in a direct, directly corporeal way. At the time I was developing the idea, erotohistoriography seemed especially relevant to non-academic queer ways of performing history, such as collecting and drag performance, which drew artifacts and objects lovingly near, even wearing them on the body to signify, among other things, dissidence from normative gender roles and marital reproductive life arrangements. Erotohistoriography, in other words, is a mode both of doing queer history and of doing history queerly, where queer signifies gender nonconformism, sexual alterity, or both. Key to the vocabulary I developed for the term is Walter Benjamin's concept of brushing history against the grain, a tactile metaphor that suggests how important rubbing, caressing, marking, fracturing, and otherwise engaging directly with the materials of the past has been for queer performance, the performance of queerness, and non-academic historical record keeping. You'll have noticed by now that Haynes's formal techniques undercut those of Hollywood cinema and traditional documentary in ways that are typical of experimental film. Eschewing the continuities associated with cinematic realism, beginning with the substitution of dolls for live actors, Haynes breaks into the film narrative, the biography, and the images and dialogues constituting it with distorted frames, static, sounds layered over one another, montage, and title cards, among other methods. I won't belabor those techniques, which are familiar to any student of Hollywood cinema and its aesthetic alternatives, except to note that they're in keeping with independent and especially 1980s feminist avant-garde filmic assaults or on or reworkings of the standardized, hyper-commodified and hyper-commodifying Hollywood star and film. The look is rough and DIY. But it is also compounded by the reception and reproduction history of Superstar, which I'd like to tie to Arado historiography. Ordinarily, most films are now ready-mades, available to the consumer at a local theater, but more than that, beyond that, via digital streaming or DVD, so you can just kind of have them. But because Superstar cannot be legally reproduced and distributed, 
It travels illicitly via, it travels via illicitly copied bootlegs. Some of these are videotapes of the film on a screen, i.e. a TV or movie screen, so someone's just taped their TV. Some are DVD or VHS, copies of copies of copies of copies of an original master VHS tape. The resulting terrible quality of the image and soundtrack, as Lucas Hildebrand has masterfully argued, have become part of Superstar's lo-fi aesthetic and a kind of mediated history of the film's uses and abuses by audiences. One can sometimes see the mark of the remaker on the bootleg, as in fingerprints or reflections on a screen or skips in the soundtrack, which you may have noticed. Other times, one sees the marks of the viewer, as in stretched out or muddied segments of a VHS tape that has circulated from hand to hand and rewound and, you know, so it just, there's like some of the VHS tapes um, out there just actually have like breaks and skips and DVDs have scratches. It's sort of unbelievable. In Time Binds, I argued that this kind of remaking of a pornographic film by experimental videographer Nguyen Tan Huang was erotohistoriography, er erotohistoriographic, in that it, it imprinted a record of the viewer's pleasure onto the material of the film. So in that, um, uh, Nguyen's um, film is a kind of, he shoots his own TV screen playing a DVD of a pornographic film that always breaks at the climax moment because it's been rewound so many different times that that's where the tape gets screwed up and his own face and mouth are like over this pornographic image. It's a really wonderful little film. It's called KIP. Um, and so it's very directly engaged with kind of viewer pleasure. Now with Superstar, I'm not sure that pleasure is as evident as simple embodiment. Karen Carpenter, especially in doll form, comes across as completely anhedonic, surrounded by a sterile culture and family members and industry people who seem at, be at best vaguely menacing. And what she does to her body may give her an exhilarating high, as the film suggests, but takes the form of self-denial, not, or not ordinarily correlated to pleasure, sexual or otherwise. Nonetheless, in his use of the body as the site of a struggle he understands as directly political, Haynes is an erotic historiographer. Superstar reads anorexia as a revolt against normative femininity and consumer culture. Many of Haynes' other films, from Poison through Safe through at least Carol, are similarly concerned with bodies that exceed the confines of their historical moment, people with AIDS and environmental illness, people with psychosomatic diseases such as anorexia and OCD, sexual and gender misfits, and with the ways these bodies stick the gears of nationalist myth-making from suburbia to whiteness to heteronormativity. Taken together then, the filmic techniques and the production and reproduction history of Superstar are part of how the film disrupts the smoothness of the Carpenter production machine, and by extension, the American national narrative that the Carpenters supposedly stood for. If the centrist and right-wing media pitched 1970s America as an effortless glide away from the rock-fueled rock -fueled tumult of the 60s and into the wholesome, white, heterogendered sexlessness of easy listening, Superstar is a glitchy series of interruptions, distortions, and disruptions that expose the fragility and falseness of that national narrative. And the film offers anorexia as a counter genealogy in the key of what Lauren Berlant has called female complaint. Not organized protest, but a privatized sphere of agency and control. The final horizon of this work, then, is Superstar's focus on anorexia. Rather than being a biopic that begins at the beginning of Karen Carpenter's life, Superstar details her last 17 years as anorexia consumed her. So let me show you the last little bit of the film, it's just about 10 minutes, before returning to that theme, and then making some suggestions about how the film can help us understand our contemporary moment, where narratives of national and even gay progress make little sense in a world ravaged by climate emergency, COVID, and global fascism. So, the last little bit of Superstar. Richard's is coming. Madison Richard. 
Karen. May I introduce you to... Karen. Pleasure to meet you. Tom Burris, good friend of Jack's. Hello. Pardon my enthusiasm. I, I've just always loved your singing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thoughts of leaving disappear each time I see you rise. And no matter how hard I try to understand the reason why we carry on this way, we're lost in a mask of with the divorce, Karen. And I know that you're under tremendous pressure. But we have obligations. We have contracts that we have to fulfill. We are still catching up from the setback that you had six years ago. Karen, people are talking about you. Your fans are worried. I can hear them gasping when we walk on stage. Now, what the hell are we supposed to do about that? Richard. I know. I... I know I'm sick. I... I know something's wrong. And I need help. What do you mean, sick? Mentally? Richard, have you ever heard the word anorexia? Of course, I've heard people call you that. Richard, I am that. And I guess I... I guess I'm just beginning to realize that it isn't something good. Is this Jerry Ben O'Neill? Yes, who's calling? Jerry, this is Karen Carpenter. Uh, I don't think we've ever met, but, but someone mentioned your name to me. I was told you were writing a, a book about... Uh, My about anorexia? Yes. Karen, if that's why you're calling, please don't be ashamed to talk. Believe me, I've been through the worst of it. And recovered. Yes. Yes, it's what I need. I've got to get over this. It's just, it's just messing up everything. You have no idea the kind of pressure I'm under. I've just got to get well. Karen, there's no such thing as a quick fix with this. Sometimes it can't be cured at all. But it's always a long, hard battle. How long? Three years, minimum. Three years? That's out of the question. Karen, listen to me. If you really want to shake this thing, you'll have to put everything else aside for as long as it takes. Since my recovery, I've been working very closely with my doctor, assisting other anorectics. And I couldn't recommend him strongly enough. What's his name? Dr. Stephen Levenkron. His treatment is in New York. But believe me, it's more than essential to undergo treatment away from the pressures of home, family, and career. So that's what I'm going to do. Alone. New York? For how long? Now look, I know that you're all concerned and won't like being excluded from my recovery, but Cherry couldn't stress enough how much, well, how much family life and career add to the stress of anorexia. Cherry also came from a tight-knit family. Now who is this Cherry person? Where do you find her? Cherry is Pat Boone's oldest daughter who recovered from anorexia. What do you mean by family pressure? You should go with her, Agnes, to check out this love and crawl character. No. No one is to come with me. I've got to do this alone. I have to.
Yeah. 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 Did you notice how she cleaned her place? Mother, didn't you notice there are children starving in Africa? <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. It's true, and she's even back to her old favorites now. Chili and tacos. And that three-course meal at St. Germain's and after you, the Grammy reunion. You haven't lost a pound. Or gain. A hundred and eight. One and eight. eight. Oh, eight. <laughs> now, that. Karen, don't you touch those dishes. Your father and I will do them. You kids run along. Now you have an early session. All right, thanks a lot, Mom. so busy lately. Well, we're recording a new album. Oh, I know it's soon, but, but yes, I stayed right at 108 and I'm eating well. Nope. I haven't touched the next glass or even thought of it. I just feel more in control than ever. Well, you know what I mean. And all thanks to you. Well, thank you for calling. I, I promised to call soon. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thanks again. Bye. Every time So, in this final segment of the film, where Karen's anorexia peaks and she attempts recovery, another one of Haynes' experimental techniques comes to the fore. To show her weight loss, she whittle, he whittled away pieces of the Barbie doll representing her. In some ways, this is an analog for Superstar's own use of spliced in footage, montage, and damaged or distorted tape and sound. Or conversely, these techniques can be read as the aesthetic version of what anorexia does to the body and to the mind. I recognize that the film is sharply critical of anorexia as a logical, though pathological, response to commodity capitalism, diet culture, and what we now call fat phobia. At the same time, I want to read this whittling and the anorexia that it represents in broader terms as itself an assault on the ready-made, 
on the commodity form that is the celebrity, and on national myth-making. And finally, I want to claim this assault as a kind of erotohistoriography historiography that puts pressure on what I originally thought I was doing with the term. Now, it was all but impossible to watch Superstar in the early 1990s when I first saw it without recognizing that Karen Carpenter's anorexia provided a powerful allegory for the AIDS crisis. At the same time that Carpenter was starving herself to death, people with AIDS, predominantly gay men, were wasting away to skeletons. They too were subjected to the national contempt for femininity, especially in men, and some of them additionally to the cannibalistic consumption of celebrities. Rock Hudson, for example, maintained a public persona as an all-American heteromasculine hunk at what was likely a great psychic cost and died of AIDS-related causes in 1985. Superstar is thus, at least allegorically, not only the story of a murderous national misogyny, but also the story of an equally murderous national homophobia that let gay men die for over a decade before antiretroviral, anti, antiretroviral therapies and PrEP, pre-exposure prophylactics, were made available to those lucky enough to have good health insurance. But watching Superstar today, I'm struck by how much the film resonates with contemporary forms of body modification in the context of climate change and COVID, and allows me to see these contemporary body practices as a rato historiographic in a different way than I'd originally been thinking when I coined the term. For Haynes's whittling of the Karen Carpenter doll's body and face also invokes cutting or self-mutilation, a practice that straddles BDSM cultures, and the communities of self-harm that have arisen on social media platforms such as TikTok. Indeed, even anorexia itself is a different kind of disease or practice than it was 50 years ago when Karen Carpenter suffered from it. Once most prevalent among cisgender girls and women, anorexia is now often co-present with pathologized practices such as cutting and or with transgender identity. Understood as a fantasy of self-modification, cutting grants non-medical or pre-medical people, usually young people assigned female at birth, a certain quasi-medical intervention. Understood as an expression of body dysphoria, anorexia too gives this same population a way to achieve the angularity associated with masculinity, to stop menstruation, and sometimes to grow light facial and body hair. And while Carpenter herself was not trans as far as we know, as Karen Tongson and others have elaborated, she was also not fully gender normative. She was a tomboy who played the drums. Even the film, when it discusses femininity and normal gender function, normal gender function, recognizes that anorexia has long been correlated with a wish not to hit female puberty. Haynes's use of the cut both in editing Superstar and in his treatment of the Karen Carpenter doll, registers and compounds the bodily harm that anorectics enact upon themselves. And I think we can connect that to gender transition as part of a range of do-it-yourself medical interventions on normative embodiment. Yet all this still pathologizes all these acts, anorexia, cutting, and even transition. Many would object to grouping anorexia and cutting with transition, and that we would all agree that gender transition is self-actualization, -actual not self-harm. But I think that the co-prevalence of cutting and anorexia with gender transition, particularly among contemporary young people, has things to tell us about embodiment in the age of COVID, a climate disaster. And I think Superstar helps us see all these forms of bodily modification as potentially corporeal historical practices. Frederick Jameson has argued that when a population can no longer conceive of a deep history that contrasts with their own moment and provides a way of reflecting upon the present as contingent, the body remains the only field of intervention. This paradigm unfortunately casts bodily practices as effectively false consciousness, as a set of acts that could and should be transformed into collective political agency of the sort a baby boomer, which Jameson is, would recognize as such. However, I wonder if the collectivization of anorexia, cutting, and gender transition via social media networks such as TikTok and YouTube might be recognized as itself a kind of political act. Carpenter's anorexia was aimed, we can presume, 
against not only her family, her managers, her national image, and the pressure to be whole, wholesome, and perfect, but at least implicitly against the way that her specificities were ironed out in service of a national swing rightward in the 1970s. What are today's young people's various bodily mo body modification practices aimed at? While their explicit statements about what they're doing are likely to be along the lines of achieving a certain coherent identity, the practices themselves don't always add up to this, and indeed might be read as an intervention into the coherence of heteronormatively gendered and sexualized embodiment. Young people who starve their bodies into androgyny, cut patterns into their skin, or pierce and tattoo themselves are certainly not making a bid for heteronormatively or sort of normatively heteroreproductive bodies. Even those who undergo gender affirmation care do not necessarily fit into the models of gender continuity, fixity, and binarism that they must produce in order to access such care. And those who use DIY methods to achieve their felt gender may fit even less neatly into these medicalized narratives. Why all this now, then? And why superstar now, again? I submit that like the AIDS epidemic and misogyny, today's COVID, climate change, and to a certain extent even the rise of global fascism are historical changes that can be felt on the body as illness, as extreme heat or cold, as hunger or the wounds of physical attack. Registering these changes with self-controlled bodily activity, cutting, anorexia, piercing and tattooing, transitioning, is a form of writing this history on and with the body, but not in the key of pleasure that I insisted on in 2010. Rather, I think these activities might be read in the key of solidarity with the bodies made vulnerable in this historical moment. Refusing health, gender legibility, and triumph narratives is a way to ally with the casualties, the sick, the disabled, the displaced, the beaten. Recall that in Superstar, Haynes cuts in a doll body seen from above, face down, buttocks up, being spanked by a doll hand, right? Like several of these, like what are they, right? Yes, that registers the disciplining of national subjects by narrative narratives of progress and coherence. Yes, it registers the disciplining of the female body by the anorectic, the cutter, the body modifier. But it also registers the shock of encountering historical change with the body, as indeed it is always encountered, whether we acknowledge that or not. Thank you. What a beautiful talk. Thank you so much. Thanks. Oh God, and, and I mean the whole talk, but the last part especially. Uh, I would love to unpack that a little bit in the sort of a conversation as well, but also to make some uh, connections actually. And, and please uh, sort of uh, consider this, and I love this actually, uh, consider this an open forum. Uh, so again, like a yesterday evening, raise your hand, have a shout, uh, make yourself known in terms of sort of uh, questions, uh, observations, and things you would like to share with the uh, group as well. But maybe um, before we go in, into the last part of your talk, Beth, like, um, this morning we saw um, some films that you showed as well, and, and now we're seeing sort of this film, and they were, you know, more or less made around the same time, actually, uh, first, and especially sort of a gossip and scandal, you know, like that film by uh, Ulysses also has sort of a documentary, sort of matter of fact, sort of type of uh, approach, right? And um, I was very sort of uh, caught by that word smoothness that you kind of highlighted in a way as of course, you know, sort of integral to how this, how this superstar kind of was marketed uh, effectively, right? But also incorporated then in every aspect of sort of her body and in relationship to sort of the ready-made. So, uh, Arnisa, I'd love to kind of um, invite you first to maybe reflect a little bit on how uh, Ulysses use sort of the documentary genre and then in relationship to perhaps how someone like Haynes in a very different way kind of put it upside down once again. Is it working like this? Yeah. Well, uh, thank you Beth, love the presentation. And, um, we didn't see the whole films because uh, of Carrion. Um, for example, in, it's 
documentary, but like in Superstar, there is something that is also very mockument, like not real. So the LPS file, Lydia Prado Superstar, uh, which Beth actually bought an original um, program um, from the US. <laughs> but the film itself that was made to document the project or to exist as an artwork, was a documentary of Carrion going to Mexico, except the fact that it was all filmed in Amsterdam. And so different characters that were supposed to be Mexican uh, friends or collaborators were played by other friends in Amsterdam as if they were uh, in Mexico, but at the same time very clearly showing that they were not in Mexico. So there was this idea of camouflage or like having other characters, like in this case the dolls were here. And in Gossip Scandal and Good Manner, for sure, there is a there is smoothness, but a different type of smoothness is like already like aware of its sort of irony in Carrion. So that's again, I was going back to this term camp sensual, but because and I don't know for the original performances of uh, the Carpenters, for example, how that was constructed. Maybe it was a slightly different smoothness in the case of. Um, uh, Karen, like, I don't know how much that awareness of what was happening to her was there. Well, I think in the case of Carrion, how he was constructing the films, there was already that awareness. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think there's a, you can see that Haynes is riffing on not just the documentary, but in fact, the public service announcement, which is in, in the US anyway, a very kind of nationalized genre, right? The kind of, you know, warning to consumers, only he's doing it against consumer culture. Um, and I think the Carillon, you know, it's interesting in that the film, one, the, the one on gossip, where you're sort of the expert talking heads and Haynes sort of uses um, the same technique and there's a kind of deep irony of the way the soundtrack, the Carpenter songs are used for sort of against themselves um, and not just as illustrations of like the progress of their career, but sort of as commentaries on what's happen happening with, with Karen herself. Um, so all that is super complex. In terms of the Carpenters, you know, the Carpenters are campy only in retrospect, you know, they, I mean, because she died so horribly, you know, you have to have a really good gallows sense of humor to, um, to kind of go there with, with them. But they're a little bit like Abba, you know, that the, the cleanness and the sort of earnest wholesomeness can be now we can be amused by, we can, we can sort of mock, it's part of how Carpenter has sort of not been taken seriously as a, as a musician. And I think Haynes is walking this really interesting line where clearly the Barbie dolls and stuff are camp, but they're also not. They're not kind of hyperbolic and flamey and like excessive. There's a kind of deadpan quality to the way that he uses them, which makes it feel both more like a documentary and also like something that's you know, like not supposed to just be funny. It's, 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 and I find Haynes as a filmmaker just really stunning for the way that he always begins from a feminist place of critique to say things about, um, about gay male experience and about his own experience as a gay man. It's very, very hard to do and he does it, he does it beautifully. Yeah, and I think so the uh, choice of dolls in relationship to the sort of, uh, sort of a quality of the film also does something, right? When you see these dolls kind of move on the screen is if it was really sort of high def, let's yeah. say it would have yeah. been a very different experience yeah. and they, they morph on the screen into bodies. It's very it's Yeah, a very he goes back and forth experience. between live and, and kind yeah. of the miniature is there and you're not really sure if it's stop motion or if there's exactly. just somebody underneath the Barbie doll kind of working <laughs> the feet. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. And so I, I guess, you know, what brings, I, so when Hendrik asked me to do this and I thought, you know, how the heck am I gonna talk about Norwegian nationalism and Norwegian queer history and Lilia Prado, who I've never heard of, heard of and Ulysses Carion, who I've never heard of. And I thought the only film that makes any sense is Superstar in relation to this whole event because I think Carion and Haynes are both people who were creating something of great artifice you know, to kind of intervene on the naturalizing of particular aspects of, I guess, in Carion's case, you know, Dutchness and and um, and and Amsterdam, right? That's where he staged the festival, and and um, and in Haynes's case, um, this kind of like smooth hetero 70s, um, where you know, gay men were beginning to zero convert in the 70s and started dying in the early 80s. 
I'm also just thinking how the the two the works connect with each other also in Haynes and in Carrion, but from what I understand in Haynes from your beautiful talk, there is a very specific awareness on communication strategies and sort of uh, meta-national, heteronormative ways of discourse. And perhaps we're both, again, a bit cliche, but this, ident this identification is something, a sort of strategy that is working for both things, from mainstream culture to uh, sort of hyper-femme ideas, um, and also sp specifically communication and strategies of like how information is distributed and who is talking to whom. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I'm curious, I'd love to hear from the audience who haven't seen the Haynes film before, what, what they saw, what you saw as convergences or divergences between these two artists. You know, mine, of course, is very much in the context of a very American-style nationalism. I think Garion's dealing with a completely different questions of nationalism. And then, of course, there's the whole, this entire symposium being, I under, as I understand it, a sort of intervention onto the hyper pink washing of, of Norway, right? Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, just to briefly comment on uh, your last question now. I think that film is one of these mediums that you can really, in a very visual and very contextual, but also very uh, in a very bodily way, actually break down boundaries, create fluidity. And I think Superstar actually displayed that really well. Um, so I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about that later, but <laughs> I had questions for you both, or questions slash comments. So I'm gonna start with Arnisa because um, gossip is very interesting in the sense that in a lot of communities and contexts where people have been barred from the um, the channels of information. Gossip has sort of become the solution to that problem. And so oftentimes when you talk about gossip in a more normative context, it has a really bad reputation. Whereas when you move into indigenous communities, for instance, gossip is essentially the foundation of our connections to one another over large spans of both time and place. And I was just hoping you could maybe reflect a little bit more on the, the context and situatedness um, of the project itself and gossip, like the, the, I don't know, the ambiguity of gossip uh, depending on context. And then Elizabeth, loved your talk. Um, and one of the things that really struck me, that I really felt resonate within me, was your suggestion that all of these ways of modifying body is done in solidarity, in a, like connecting with, with those that suffer in the world. And it made me think of, for a very long time now, in, again, in indigenous communities, we have studies that show how the body is impacted uh, by colonialism, not only in as directly impacted, but actually intergenerational trauma, uh, historical trauma, and often that has resulted in poor health, uh, high suicide rates, um, and there is something about how do you deal with the bodily impact of that when you have no choice. And so I find it, find it very interesting, the suggestion that someone would, in essence, harm their body in solidarity when the people whose bodies are being harmed would give anything to be able to move away from that, if you get my point. Totally. Thank you. Let's let Arnisa start with gossip, and then I'll take that up, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, so there are several things. One element is gossip itself, and then there is gossip within the work of Carrion and sort of the context in which he was working. And I think that for Carrion, already then he was sort of tapping upon some of the things that you said and wasn't perhaps being fully articulated because that was also the beginning of the 80s. So I think that's how to put this. Maybe sort of... 
uh, his way of disidentifying with that was through really what could be called like, yeah, gay man aesthetic to some degree plus conceptual art. So it's thinking he was very much aware that it's associated with women, with like specific classes and racial profiles, but you know, there wasn't so much full articulation in that. Now, within my thinking over the years over gossip that has been different and that has been also great to collaborate with different artists who have been able to enrich that and in within my group of uh, people and scholars, a lot has been done throughout the point of view of feminism, for example, thinking about gossip, uh, in particular talking about a very well-loved well work of Silvia Federici, with sort of really tracing a history of how gossip became politically de demonized well, in mainstream culture, and that is also how I was also reading Heid Martin Heidegger, and um, how it is actually really valued in a lot of communities. So this is uh, how I can answer to that, and thinking that the way to situate the practice of Carreon is in between, because it's also sort of a sort of knowledge, or not knowledge, but more articulation of it, that I guess he didn't have access to fully. It was almost like as if, Maybe the artist in this 80s was sensing that, you know? So there is this element of attraction, gravitational force, but not full articulation yet. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the question you asked is really important. Um, I mean, I don't think that the populations that are sort of collectivizing via TikTok, some of these practices are would say that what they're doing is solidarity. I, I think that's sort of my perhaps utopian speculation. Um, and I think where there may be, so in some sense, the, there's a way that sort of injuring yourself feels almost appropriative, or like why on earth would you, or it's a privilege to get to do that when there are people who choo you know, don't choose whether or not to be injured. But at the same time, um, I think that one of the things that both COVID and climate have done is, you know, impacted the bodies of populations that have been pretty sheltered from the direct impact of these things, right? And so, um, and so it's, it's, you know, COVID was a, was a, um, has been, still is, an epidemic in which populations died differentially, absolutely, but suddenly people who never thought of themselves as potentially, you know, mortal from a, an epidemic were. Um, and there's something about that, that the immediacy of that, that I think that gets acted out um, as um, on the scene of the individual body. Um, so solidarity is a funny word because I don't, I don't kind of mean it in a, in a kind of, full historical consciousness way. I mean, it's almost like maybe an, an unconscious way of becoming collective with unseen others, right? Um, the other thing to say, though, and this is a completely different tack, is that a lot of this stuff emerged or became distilled through and by the lockdown when young people were staring at themselves on Zoom all the time and were seeing mediated images of themselves and being horrified by what they saw and feeling alienated from what they saw. And, and, and so tur turning off their cameras or changing themselves. So I mean, I know I, my kid is 16 and part of the reason I was interested in these questions is that we literally had the convergence of cutting eating disorders and, tra and transition in one kid during the pandemic. It was like, I don't know, and I was diagnosed with cancer at the same time and I was like, I don't know if I can survive this. I have to think about how to think about this. Um, but in any case, I, I, I know, you know, five or six parents whose kids developed eating disorders. Um, you know, lots of parents whose kids started cutting themselves at very young ages, sort of eight or nine. Um, there has been a wave of transitions that have overlapped with those behaviors, and it's been really hard for therapists to sort out sort of what's chicken and what's egg. Are they trying to achieve gender modification with these behaviors, or is this a more generalized dysphoria, and how do we treat it? Um, and I would say that it has been, but again, it's hard to separate this from my particular networks, um, more privileged kids that this has shown up with, you know? And so there's a way that they're 
acting out and with a certain kind of agony of the body that's newer to them, you know, than other populations who've always had to negotiate it. Um, I hope that goes some ways towards addressing, I think it's a really important point to just sort of say, you know, solidarity is a strange word, right, for something that is also an expression of privilege. Um, I think that's important to just acknowledge. But I'm also trying to think about these practices neither as pathological nor as utopian, but just to kind of to try to look at them along, along a continuum or a plane or something. And I think that's really risky too. And I was like, someone in this room is gonna to wanna to kill me. Because, you know, talking about transition, which we think of as um, affirming, right? And we think of as, as ameliorative and healing and putting it in the same plane with cutting and anorexia, which are behaviors we want to, you know, stop in people, can also seem like a violation. But I am interested in this sort of like, um, operations on the scene of the body, right? And the question of what it means that they have been collectivized by social media in a very different way. There have always been, you know, communities that do these things, face-to-face -face communities that, that tutor each other in these things and do them together, but, but there's kind of a whole other mediated horizon now. So I'm just trying to think it through. Think through my own historical moments and my kids, yeah. Anissa, I saw that. You, you had a response. For a moment, I was thinking, like also earlier, you were talking about this sort of genealogy of pathologization of ways of getting control or of trying to get agency by mm -hmm. female bodies, which I feel like it's also in a way how you introduced anorexia, or mm -hmm. I read it that mm -hmm. way, and I was very happy to read it that way, and cutting and. Of course, it's a vast, and we are, I mean, I'm an art historian, so I don't know how much I can speak, but I would say, like, why is it always pathologizing so very often in relationship to trauma, mm -hmm. um, sort of safe and consensual repetitions of cutting or sort of body modifications totally. are what leads to healing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's hard to say that about, about anorexia, but m maybe we should also, you know, that, that we, we should always hold out that these acts are not necessarily just to be cured. Um, that they may be forms of care as well as forms of cure. Um, and I think they may be, I'm hoping, that they may be forms of care and forms of mutual <coughs> practice that at least might represent a kind of descent from a certain kind of normative, you know, whole, healthy, in, in the case of my milieu, all-American body. That's, that's kind of what I'm at least trying to hang on to. No, this is exactly right. I thought, <laughs> I was like, you this need is some not water, a are you okay? <laughs> 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 everybody all right? Is everybody breathing? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm also looking around the room. Of course, I have uh, questions, but um, please raise your hand. Yes, please. Um, thank you very much for both of your talks. I, I just cannot but ask this question for our problematic that maybe, um, or may seem. Because um, it seems that there is an entire sort of like strand of uh, anorexia also, which has not been talked about, which is like the supermodel mm -hmm. and the world of fashion that actually instigated that entire sort of and also institutionalized an entire movement. Um, and also like when we think about the um, non-sexualized body that the Barbie dolls, mm -hmm. for instance, they represent, I think. A, Aaron Farocchi and One Image, and you know, those sort of works that I've also tried to understand how image is built for consumption. Uh, and so um, it was difficult to, you know, like uh, understand, and maybe there you can help me, um, to understand how to rebring those very traumatizing sort of processes into an uh, aesthetized sort of form, which, which becomes aesthetized to a certain extent through the end of your talk and mm -hmm. with anorexia. So I, I really want to try to understand mm -hmm. what does that mean for, you know, like in aesthetic terms also. Um, I think that, you know, at least in its own moment, the Haynes film is very aware of the fashion industry um, and, and celebrity culture 
as having produced a kind of anorectic, you know, universe that women had to live in. And part of how I read that, that cutting and that whittling that Haynes does on the, um, the doll body is as an expression of sort of the cannibalism of culture on women's bodies. I think that's all there. Um, and I think for me, it's not that I want to erase that history or that I want to say that's not true of anorexia, but rather that I also want to hold out for, um, I guess for body practices as not just symptomatic, if that makes sense. Not just, not just pathological, not just signs of misplaced agency that could be put to better use, but as ways of working out and finding a language for something political. Um, because I think that so many um, things that young people do and things that women do are so often privatized and pathologized and not read as a political language of any kind. Um, so that, I, I hope that goes some way in addressing the concern because I think it's, I don't mean to erase the very important critical work that this film actually do, did in its moment and still does in linking anorexia to consumer culture. It's very clear, you know, you get the sort of abundance, post-war abundance, and then the kind of the subtitles which are hard to read but are about anorexia. Um, but I also, you know, having, having known several anorectic students um, ha was very interested in the, the, the kind of, um, and I guess aesthetics is the right word, um, and I mean it more neutrally, that the, the kind of form of anorexia as a way to say something that they couldn't yet say any other way. And I didn't want to, I never, my, my thing I always say about students is never assume what they're doing is not politics just because you don't recognize it as politics, right? Because that's saying, that's the kids today, get off my lawn, they don't know how to do activism, they're just on their screens. Like, they're, what they're doing is political in some sense or another. It's just, it's up to me to decode it and to learn about it, not to sort of condemn it as not political enough. And so that's why I've been trying to think about this moment where one way to read the kids today is like, oh, they're obsessed with their bodies and with diagnoses and they're just constantly working on their identities and their selfhood and oh my God, could they please just get together and have a, you know, ha do an action or, you know, chain themselves to a building? Like that part of me says that, right? And then another part of me is like, you don't know what they're doing. You have no idea. And at least thinking about it in terms of a form, a language, an aesthetic, isn't necessarily to empty it of political content. It's just to say, I can't read it, you know? But I found quite like remarkable also that um, kind of the last part of, of your lecture, that kind of reconsideration of the method of sort of uh, erotic uh, historiography, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And, and can you like talk a little bit more about that, how you yeah. revisited that method that has been really sort of quite, yeah, quite integral I, to a yeah. lot of your work? Well, part of it is um, I don't want to let go of pleasure. I, I, I like pleasure, and I think we should have more of it. But I think at the time I wrote that book, there was so much about lack and shame and melancholy had been sort of reclaimed, right? And I was like, wait a sec, what about, like, <laughs> and also I remember I took um, an early version of the Arado historiography chapter to Brown, and these two Marxist dudes got really mad because I said that historical consciousness could involve pleasure. And they were like, that is not possible. And I was like, really? That seems really weird. I'm queer and like we do it all the time, <laughs> you know? Um, but now I think there's a way that pleasure is too simple of a term you know, that I, that erato historiography, I don't want it just to collapse back into sort of pain and, and, um, and suffering and shame, but that um, not all of the practices are motivated by pleasure and not all of them produce pleasure. Um, and some of them are about, um, I don't know what the right word is, but like allegorizing historical shock, right? Just allegorizing the impact of history 
whether that's painful or pleasurable, I'm not sure it matters, and are just about insisting on the centrality of the body to historical encounter. And so for me, that feels like a little bit of a modification or sort of a you know, letting go of my sort of ferocious insistence that pleasure was the most important thing um, in 2010 when it did feel, and it's not that I don't think it's important anymore, I just think we're in a really complicated moment. Well, and you know? I think in terms to your, so in part, like, uh, to your point as well, is that, at least how I saw it, like, the body holds that as well. Like, I think it's, it's not one or the other sometimes. Yeah, right? yeah, like, yeah. Well, that goes back to the first sorry. night, right? And the, the mem be, being gay and the memory of joy, right? Being gay as, as a way of memorializing the joy that Abdullah's sisters had, had to give up or had to contain and, and, and sideline. Um, that's another form of memory and of history making, right? Is being gay in memory of joy. But well, I, th I think also there is this fact that in the Western world where art as a canon was born, uh, there is this tendency and has been since the 16th century to categorize everything. We need these very neat little labels to mark things so that we can order it and make sense of the world. Whereas, and for instance, talking about like, trauma in the body. Uh, a lot of indigenous communities also believe that good things is in the body, that mm -hmm. good thing mm -hmm. gets inherited, that good memories are something that you inherit from ancestor. Mm -hmm. So nothing is ever only bad. Right. Things can also be good. But of course, in this context, um, responding to your talk, I that was what I was focusing on, of course. But I do think it is problematic that we continue to categorize, even in the, you know, this sphere of decolonization, and I don't know, I don't know if that's even a word, I like queering everything, let's just say that. I was thinking of how do you say de -hetero <laughs> Yeah, but I was thinking like, how do you de -hetero Right, what's the analog yeah. of the like, colonial that would be about <laughs> sexuality or yeah, like what's, something, something, something I don't like know. that, like, yeah. We, we, yeah. We're not there yet, but yeah. the, the point of it is that um, I think we... Is it head lag? <laughs> head lag. <laughs> I'm so tired of it. Yeah. 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 yeah, but I mean, we tie ourselves up in these boxes and then mm -hmm. we get sort of... <laughs> We stop ourselves from expanding and exploring and erasing boundaries because we're so indoctrinated to think that we need these boundaries in order to make sense, mm -hmm. right? And I, I think maybe that's one of the things that I really enjoyed about your talk, that it sort of implemented this uh, beautiful refusal mm -hmm. to allow boundaries and categorize, categories mm -hmm. to decide how or like, how do we understand things? How do we view things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, there's Thank not you. really a question. It's just more no, of a I, comment. I appreciate that, as I sometimes think I'm a very rigid thinker. So, <laughs> no, I think that's 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 a beautiful segue to you know kind of go back to these two uh, artist work, like Haynes and uh, Carillon, in a way to. Uh, consider something that we actually discussed a little bit over lunch as well, and that it keeps coming back as a theme, these, these sort of gay men's kind of like relationship to like femininity, and I think you made a really wonderful point, which sort of Haynes is indeed so good at, that he starts often in sort of a feminist kind of sort of point of departure and makes his way to various other kind of intersections, of, uh, really, and I think you know, like uh, Ulysses is also sort of, uh, sort of, let's say, sort of, uh, what's the word? Like uh, complicating all these sort of categories. And that's that's I think sort of the best word. And um, I think uh, Abdella's talk sort of yesterday evening as well. You know, when we touched on it, I think it's such a rich sort of a topic. And I know you would like to share something about it because you had to leave it out of your talk in, in sort of a certain ways to speak about that relationship to sort of femininity in that sense. Um, I don't want to put you too much on the spot, yeah. but I just find it really interesting. No, but I actually thought of responding because you were thinking a little bit like of the categories and I also hear it sometimes now suddenly like the word queer encompasses carry on while I'm sure like it's a word you for sure never used. You know, so now that is also a word that's like very often like engulfing everything and uh, that 
fear of like like somehow even when trying to sort of get rid of categories, we end up categor like making categories all the time. And indeed, like what I have learned from closely studying the work of this artist, but also through my own life, um, has been that complication of the category. So what he does is like, oh yeah, yeah, I, and that I think is also the power of disidentification. I love categories. Let's make this one, and let's make the blue one, and the red one, and so constantly changing them and reshuffling them and sort of finding all these different definitions for gossip and like all these like drawings that he made. Like if gossip sounds like whoo, rumor sounds like eh. So there was that complication and sense of humor, but also the desire to really not have the category and not have everything written down, repeated and repeated and repeated. So that, I don't know, what did I leave out from, yeah, like, I was thinking, ah, yeah, what I left out, what I left out, and that came, uh, there was also something that was, you asked earlier after Matthias Stoke about, like, you were talking about the sort of white male identity, right, gay male, gay, gay, man, gay man identity, and I was thinking, I had that a bit in my talk, that I cut out thinking, me working on Ulises Carrion, who was this artist from Mexico, but also thinking like, how did I, my consciousness coming to existence and the lack of articulation for my consciousness to come into existence. And that was very often articulated by sort of gay man writers. Like, um, I don't know, when you showed Oscar Wilde, that was really like adolescence. And one question, when you were asking uh, Matthias that question, I was thinking that for myself, like, how do I decolonize my own gay man inside? Mm. Yeah, like my internalized version of sort of this intellectual gay man or like artistic sort of with a sense of aesthetics which was a way in which I started to understand the world and sort of test my own boundaries and um, that is like a long quest like in the film when she asks for help she calls and she's like she, she realizes that the cure is not a short cure, like it's, there's like this long process. <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess it's for sure a very long process of healing or trying to also see like these inner categories, internalized categories and mm -hmm. yes, I guess that's... Yeah, I guess I would just add in terms of Haynes and it's... I'm just like running through his oeuvre and deciding if this is true across the board and I, I think it might be that for Haynes, it really is white femininity um, that is kind of his point of entry. Um, and with all the problems and promises that that means, um, so his protagonist is, is always a white woman, and, and, it's, um, and it's always a fragile white woman whose pathos is, is, is part of her whiteness. Um, and I think that's really different than somebody like Garion or the way that Abdella described his Egyptian dances where it was like the, the, the villainous woman or the woman, which is also a racialized position, right? I mean, and, and it's hypersexualized, but, um, but I think there's, on the one hand, I kind of want to, I want to say that it's unusual for a gay man to start with not a woman as an icon, but from a kind of female feminist point of view. That's, I mean, that's a weird thing about Haynes. But on the other hand, I'd really want to tease out how dependent that is on whiteness as the way in for him. I'm not kind of not prepared to talk about all of it, just, you know, all of his work that way. I'd have to sort through it film by film. Uh, I just wanted to say, somehow, uh, throughout the days, hyperfam has been coming up mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And Before we um, grab some uh, caffeine, or whatever suits <laughs> you, um, just having one more look around the room, uh, to see if you'd like to add something to the uh, conversation, observation, a qu like a, a question, again, can also happen over a uh, caffeine. Um, Oh, please, to Mimi. 
what is the best part of your work? What, it, like, working with what you do? What, it, what is, Which what is the best? Us? Both of you. Me start? Because we talk a lot about, like, ooh, like, abstract and problems, but what, what is the best thing with your life that you've chosen through the work that you do? I, I love research. I really do. And I don't always get to do it, and also because I have to make a living, and it's very difficult uh, for that to happen. But so actually, like, moments like this uh, are important and somehow I don't know I always I love to also think about the dad and things from the past that's a beautiful question um, I think for me honestly it's that artists give a damn about my work and I get to talk to them because I can't make art I was, I can write fiction, I guess, you know, I probably could have been a decent fiction writer, but went another direction, but I can't do anything visual. I can barely get dressed. And so the fact that artists think that I have anything to say and make art in dialogue with me, and then I can make dial make my work in dialogue with artists is really, really precious to me because all of my beloveds have been artists. That's always who I've fallen in love with um, and who I've been friends with and who have saved me from the horrors of academe. Um, so that, that interface is the best part of my work, honestly. So thanks, artists. <laughs> Can I ask you what your favorite part about not being straight is? <laughs> Not having to hang out with other straight with straight people. <laughs> I mean, it's the company, <laughs> right? Uh, enjoying people. the superstar song of the Carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you all so much, and please another very warm applause for Beth Freeman and Arnisa Zeko. Um, a coffee break. Uh, we'll reconvene at 4:30. Uh, if that's okay with you, uh, for a, a panel, a conversation uh, with four amazing artists, uh, Christian uh, Bendayan, Dee Harding, Sam Holton, and uh, Timimi Murak. Uh, so thank you so much, and I hope to see you in 30 minutes again. Thank you. That's fine. Hi, everyone. We're ready to start again. Um, what an amazing day. What an amazing two days. I think in particular it's been fantastic but also really thought um, mind-blowing to follow all the participants and also the audience and coming to this from so many different angles but then everything somehow knits together and to see how through icons, through thinking about um, our our own our own bodies and how we are participating in in this platform and in this subjects that we are dealing with um, also have our vulnerabilities, um, which is a strength. And I think that's a beautiful that's been a beautiful way to look at this and to follow everyone who has been talking. That everyone has been so personal and so generous with their stories and I want to thank you while I'm here. I want to thank everybody for that. I think that has been really, really amazing and um, extraordinary. And we are going to continue now um, about the ready-made. So we've been talking about icons, icons as ready-made and how icons also, you know, by, by thinking about them, they also say something about the the world in which they live, the world in which we live, uh, and why we love them, and the reason why we love them, the complexity around that love. Um, and I think also this thing about the ready-made, to think about ready-made in that, in that way, is also incredibly constructive and opens up, and this is exactly what we wanted, to create a place where we have a dialogue, where things are more open and also the way that we can open up the frames around something instead of just pointing to where the frames are. And I think that's, that's for me at least, that's been something that I've been 
been really appreciating that has been done. And the ready-made, so following Ulysses Carillon's proposing of Lilia Prado as his ready-made, and here is this quote, which I think is beautiful. Don't you think that my gesture, my choice of Lilia Prado is just as arbitrary as Marcel Duchamp's gesture? Lilia Prado is my ready-made. This picking of a ready-made, I love that. So echoing that articulation of the ready-made, each of the artists um, that we will have in the panel, one by one, um, and then first, sorry, just to explain, we're gonna start with one by one of the artists that in the end will gather in a panel. That's how we're gonna do it. Um, and we have invited them to reflect on a found icon. And it can be a person, it can be an object, it can be an event, it can be something that has informed their mythology of practice. And we will, we have asked these questions to Christian Bendayan, I need to my glasses, I'm so sorry, this is just, I have to do it. Christian Bendayan, based in Lima, Peru, who's also gonna start. And then we have Dee Harding, based in Brisbane, in Australia. And then you have Sam Hultin, based in Stockholm, Sweden. And then we have Timimi Marak, based in Stockholm, Sweden. And they're all gonna gather here with Hendrik. But we will start now first with Christian. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> I, uh, at first, I'd like to thank everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank especially Hendrik, who contact who contact me and invite me to be part of this symposium. And then I have to say sorrow for my bad English. I'm learning in the last months. I will try to read the best I can. <laughs> and I will talk about a, a friend. She's Valentina. Valentina is a superstar, an Amazonian superstar. Uh, my name is Christian Bendayan, in Spanish, and uh, I'm a painter. Uh, all my work is about the Amazonian, especially my my city is Iquitos, and I used to work with my friends. More of them are transgender women, and maybe I have 30 years painting with and painting all my friends in Iquitos. Uh, and I know many histories and that histories are part of my work as a painter and as a curator. And well, I will start talking today about Valentina. This story is from Iquitos, a city that was never established, an island surrounded by rivers without road access, the best known city of the Peruvian Amazon, not only for being prosperous economically, but for its tales, which present Iquitos as a kind of constellation or extraordinary planet that Peruvians have not discovered yet, and with which they often have all kinds of exotic and erotic fantasies. Iquitos is the name of a perfume produced by the French movie superstar Alain Delon, often advertised in the media with the phrase, succumb to the temptation. <laughs> Iquitos is also the port where the journey of La Jangada starts, a raft that serves as a floating scenario throughout the Amazonian novel by Jules Verne, who, like Alain Delon, never got to know Iquitos. Iquitos also is that city at the end of the world in the middle of the Amazon, where Mick Jagger lived for a few months while shooting Fitzcarraldo by Werner Herzog, where it is said that one morning he screamed in the streets, this is the first time in my life that I am free. Iquitos 
is a galaxy of superstars that day by day oscillate between the forest, the rivers, and the streets, a thousand light years away from the globalized world. Perhaps one of the things that feed the Peruvians' fantasies about this place is the sexual freedom shown there. From the light clothing that is a product of the tropical weather to the name of the foods and drinks commonly linked to sexual vigor and reproductive fertility. This island had a parallel history to the history of Peru. It was not colonized under the same norms, and the presence of religious thought did not manage to repress the predominance of their mythical ideologies. For instance, it is common to hear that homosexuality is acquired by drinking the waters of certain rivers or by eating delicious fruits in excess. As you might notice, Different elements from their ecosystem are, part, are present in their tales. For example, when a woman gets pregnant and doesn't know or doesn't want to say who the father is, the paternity is usually attributed to a pink river dolphin, a species that inhabits, inhabits the water of the Amazon River. It is also said that when people disappear mysteriously, they move to live in the deepest of the river, in an internal party at the mysterious ghost ship there, or that we live eternally lost in the forest guided by the Chuyachaki, a demonic goblin guardian of the nature. These world perspectives have been historically despised by the rest of Peru. And not so long ago, a president said that Amazonians are not first category citizens, meaning that their rights are less important than the rest of the citizens in the country. During the 80s and the 90s, the internal armed conflict took place here in Peru. This was a confrontation between terrorist groups and not less guilty military groups. Since the jungle is hard to access, terrorists hid there and, in this place, the most brutal acts of violence of the conflict were committed. In, 19, in 1989, in the Amazonian city of Tarapoto, a clandestine journal announced that eight homosexuals were ajusticiados, executed by the terrorist group MRTA, the Tupac Amaru Revolutionary Movement, during an operation of social cleansing. This day is known as the Night of the Gardenias, when a group of citizens, part of the LGBTQ community, were enjoying at the bar the Gardenias until they were cut and killed with firearms. Their bodies were left in the streets of Tarapoto as a treat to those who didn't fit or follow the ideologies, ideologies of this fanatic group. It is commonly said that Iquitos is a city full of gay, lesbian, transvestic, and transsexual people. Among other possible reasons, it is commonly attributed to the great in migration during the years this internal conflict took place. The beauty salons of Iquitos are one of the few places where you can hear stories about terrorism in the Amazon, especially regarding the night of the Gardenias, since most of the beauty salons are run and staffed by trans women. Among these women, located in the poorest neighborhood in Peru called Belén, there lives a legend that shines like a superstar. She works at the Salon Marco Antonio Unisex, and it, is, and it is not a secret that her life seems to surpass fiction. Her name is Valentina. 
Valentina tells us that before turning 18 years old, she ran away from Iquitos to Lima without money, so she started helping in the ship's kitchen, taking advantage, ad advantage of her culinary skills. She left Iquitos and said goodbye to her friends with whom she used to play volleyball in the streets, dressed in shorts and small t-shirts, waving their long hair and proudly expressing their femi femininity. Then, however, it wasn't all roses. Sometimes the police arrested the girls without further explanation, then were taken to a cell where their hair was cut off, demanding them to be more masculine, but also forcing them to do sexual favors to be released. Disillusioned with love and justice in her homeland, Valentina boarded that ship to get to Lima, the capital of Peru, seen as a world of opportunities. There, she said to eventually prostitute, she, she had to eventually prostitute herself on the streets for several years, but she never stopped shining. The rumor that a beautiful woman from the Amazon was walking at night under a dark bridge waiting for clients aroused the interest of a famous producer and a star hunter. A white Mercedes Benz parked in front of her. From inside, a distinguished woman dressed elegantly with a very thick voice told her that she was as beautiful as she had been told, and then invited her to attend a casting, to which Valentina attended punctually the following, the following day. A few months later, Valentina was shining more than ever on the stage of the beauty pageant Miss Gay Universe of Peru. Her cinnamon skin and her exotic beauty were fundamental in order to performing as Miss India and winning the crown that led her to be Miss Gay Universe for many years. After this last edition, the pageant was closed by the authorities' repression. While holding the crown and as part of her work, she visited several LGBTQ communities throughout the Peruvian territory learning about their issues and supporting them, and giving advice through the several struggles they were facing. On that tour, she finally decided to settle back in Tarapoto. The Gardenia was the place where she used to meet with her friends. However, that night, a few minutes before going to this bar, gunshots and screams were heard from the nightclub a few blocks away from her house. The disparate knocking on her door alerted her to the presence of two of her transgender friends who told her that all of them had to escape from the city immediately. Valentina, always elegant, wearing high heels and red silk dress, looked around her house and decided to take a ceramic flower pot with a plant of green and red leaves, popularly known as the heart of Jesus, perhaps as a symbol of divine protection to which she was turning to in this disparate moment. Together, the three of them slipped through the trees, going deeper and deeper into the jungle. Some shots continued to sound, so they ran faster and faster without knowing where they were stepping, slipping over and over. Although Valentina's heels were completely covered with mud, and it was very difficult for her to move on that swampy floor, she didn't let go of the potted plant she was carrying. The three of them arrived separately some minutes apart, to arrive to a river bank where they found a small canoe in which they began their trip for three days and three nights, at first advancing in 
intuitively towards the city of Iquitos, where it was said that lesbians, travestites, transvestites, and homosexuals lived their identity freely. As they kept moving forward, Valentina noticed in the sky flocks of swallows that pointed in the direction they had to follow because she knew that swallows used to migrate every year to Iquitos. Finally, they arrived at a large boat transporting hundreds of people in which they continued their journey to Iquitos and was at this place that they heard on the radio the names of their eight friends murdered by the Tupac Amaru Revolutionary Movement. In the midst of sadness and hope, they arrived in Iquitos and then visit, beside Marco Antonio's beauty salon. Ever since Valentina not only has been working there, but also has gained fame as a singer. Her voice has enchanted audiences of all ages, even those of older generations who used to reject the LGBTQ community and now frequent the place where she sings. Some people visit her for the first time with the curiosity to listen to the trans superstar who in her songs evokes a speech against discrimination and in favor of the memory of her sisters. Every May 31, Valentina organized a party in her house, located in the Belen neighborhood of Iquitos, to remember the tragic event on the day of the fight against hate crimes and to proudly celebrate the LG, LGBTQ uh, community among balloons, beers, and colored light. Even today, we can still see the heart of Jesus full of life in the corner of her house. Iquitos is still the place of superstars like Valentina, who inspire stories that can be seen in movies, books, and visual arts, showing a different world with a necessary perspective of indomitable freedom to be known and shared with the entire world. She is Valentina now, last week. And this is a paint I, I do years ago. She's the last one uh, with the fire. And, uh, and uh, this, this painting was uh, an exhibition in the Museum of the Memory uh, of Peru. That's all to start. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. And thank you all. Thank you, everyone, for um, the invitation, but also the hospitality and the generosity shared today and also yesterday and last night. Uh, this is pretty significant for me to come from Brisbane. Um, I can elaborate on that, but we've got a short amount of time. But uh, I'd like to acknowledge everyone in the room, but also your families and your ancestors and your stories that can co collaborate to see that you're here present, uh, particularly those who are of First Nations and of queer and of oppressed and of politically outside home communities in your home, in your home places. There's lots we can talk about. I often have to confront this myself in um, outrage and deep hurt and sorrow, but also this is an opportunity for me to remember that there's a great deal of joy and uh, particularly vibrancy in the space to be able to grow and nourish each other. And that's, that's, that's the core of why it's important for me to be here today. So thank you all for, for, for joining and I honour you all. Okay, so I've titled this one today, The Conversation, a description of how I could make another Bujiru boomerang from central Queensland. So central Queensland is the name 
that is currently given to the territories of Aboriginal people in Australia on the eastern seaboard above Brisbane. So I was born in what is called, we, we refer to that as central Queensland, but my mother's a Bidjara woman and her father was a Bidjara man. And my mother's mother was a Gungaloo woman and my mother's, gra my mother's great grandmother was a Garingbal woman. So between those three uh, Aboriginal cultural groups, language groups as we would prefer to put that, I have an inheritance in central Queensland which sees vast cultural knowledge in the landscape, in what we would call cultural estates or, or cultural sites in the landscape, but also living in people's bodies and in, in, the, in the ecosystems uh, that we might traverse in that space. So a description of how I could make another Budgeroo boomerang, and this is where I, I initially thought about the conversation today around gender, because with a deliberate and uh, linear process, the Australian, the Queensland and essentially the British government sought to disband fam families and to disband ways of being and to fracture and to kill off ways of being and knowledge systems. Uh, but my mother has two very potent parents and I'm speaking I guess in present tense but they've both passed away but they're still very, very present. So my grandparents were both very potent people and my mother's a very potent woman as is my father. So with all of the history that is very obvious, we're still recovering from the specific systems which were called the mission system or the reserve system, which were deliberately attempted to destroy family networks and to break down knowledge systems. So as a baseline, and I understand many of us have got that down, as a baseline, coming towards describing another Budgeroo boomerang, gender for me comes in as a, a queerity or an oddity in that I inherited this Budgeroo boomerang from my mother and she got it from her mother. But perhaps if I was to adhere to some of those really old ways of looking at this, I don't know that my mother or my grandmother would have made or possessed this type of boomerang. And so uh, the, the, the boomerang itself, I, I could uh, source the timber from a range of locations across those three enormous ancestral territories. This, this timber is called Budgeroo. It's very significant for a number of ways in end of life practice. It's also an exquisite timber to look at. It's sought after by woodworkers these days, but ancestrally it has a relation to um, many cultural forms and one of those is the, the thrown objects because it's very strong, but it's also very light. And I could... I could build upon that. Why is it the fact that it's light important? Because in central Queensland, across those estates, many of those timbers are enormously heavy and enormously dense, and that's also a great wealth as well. So to have a, a, a beautiful and light timber in, among those estates means that uh, ecologically and culturally, Bidjara and Gungaloo and Garingal people are still very rich. So we could talk about how I could drive and, and source the timber, how to cut and season that timber, how to then prepare the timber for carving, and then I could look at the form of the timber and how to work with the tree itself and to work with the body of the tree in order to make a new boomerang. But again, we're drawing on knowledge systems which the way that I've inherited this, they've been gendered in a, in a new way. So this is where the complexity comes in, is that we get the joy now of negotiating what might have been called women's business or men's business, what, what might have been practiced or inherited through specific rites of passage. Um, these are coming to me and to our family now in ways which we get to determine and decide those. Um, determine and decide how we might uh, bring forward that older way or be open to a newer way. So I could specifically describe how we might all have a workshop as such, which, which the art world likes to do, have a workshop in making a Budgeroo boomerang. We could all go home with one and feel a little bit more Aboriginal. But what I'm actually getting at here is, in my early 20s, I spoke to my, my mum's brother, and he was beginning to offer me cultural knowledge and offer me insight into his world as a, as a significantly respected Aboriginal man in the region. And eventually I had to just say, Uncle, you, you, you do know that my partner's a man and you do know that I'm gay. And he was quiet and that wasn't easy. But he sat back 
And he said, yes, nephew, we know, of course we know. And I've talked about this with Granddad Tim, who was another generation above. He's three generations above me, and I'm fortunate to have known him quite well. But Uncle Milton said, yes, nephew, yeah, we know. And I've t we've spoken to Uncle Tim about this, Granddad Tim. And Granddad Tim said, in the old ways, in another way, that wouldn't have been acceptable. But we've got to find a new way. And it actually took me a really long way to come to terms with that, particularly even inhabiting that one man's knowledge and that old man's knowledge and all the other men's knowledge. How do I interact with them and learn and sit with them and be with them? But at the same time, they've already said from the outset, yeah, the big boss has said, we've got to find a new way. But that little sort of flag behind here said, um, uh, in the old way, that wouldn't have been acceptable. So as an artist and as a maker and as someone who's determined to not let my cultural inheritance die, this little voice up here sometimes says, particularly when we're engaging with the ancestral, that's not how it's done. That's not a proper boomerang. You shouldn't have got it from your mother. These little things, but actually, the big boss before he finished up, on my grandmother's line, he's on my grandmother's uh, family tree, he said, he, he, he described that it's okay and we've got to find a new way. Fuck, I wish he gave me an answer, but that's our job and that's why I'm, I'm racked with nerves and excitement and thrill to be here in this part of the conversation. So, uh, I'll touch on this again because it's inseparable, but this is um, a text produced by Thames and Hudson uh, in 1993. It's been reproduced a number of times since. There's been editions since 93, and I think the last one I saw was 2006. And this academic, Wally Caruana, Wally Caruana, I'm not uh, looking to diminish you or to uh, disrespect your legacy. And this map is incorrect, and we know it's incorrect, and I'll continue to keep saying that. So what Wally, what Wally Caruana has been presenting is a text that I was required to get in my first year at art college in an Indigenous entry degree, which was Contemporary Indigenous Australian Art. I was required to purchase this book, which is Aboriginal Art by Thames and Hudson, and this map is in the front of that book. This enormous part, which is sectioned now as Queensland, about probably under the N and S is where, roughly where ancestral territories are for me. Um, there's zero, zero, zero representation. And it's still, I, I just only a matter of weeks ago saw it in a Kunsthal uh, library, in a bookstore, they were selling this same book. So this map is grossly inaccurate. So again, uh, it's kind of like which part of representation and visibility do we swing that chair at today? So as a foundation, currently mining extractive industries around coal and gas extraction are the dominant cultures in the areas which, and agriculture, beef production are the dominant cultures in the areas where my, my grandparents' estates are. So that's another component of how to queer the space because they're those, uh, those, those, those industries of tearing up and abusing the mother that we, that we respect uh, are on my radar. So then I get to play uh, at times among some of that bigness and some of those, um, those realities of our family. And so what I began doing in 2006 was, I can come at this again through another violence, but what I decided to do was, due to the ancestral objects which I had in my home, what someone was doing to them. These were being routinely objectified. I had clubs, uh, nulla nulla as we would call them, but clubs which were routinely being identified and objectified as penetrative objects and disrespected for who they really are. So I decided, and I took that leap into the space of generating a new potential, I, I made uh, silicon rubber moulds of a range of those objects which I inherited. So then I've begun shifting them in their materiality and shifting them in their potentialities. Um, so I, I, looked, I sought to objectify them. So the body of work is called Body of Objects. And this, that one there is particularly a, a rubber cast of this, of this object here. Um, for a, quite a while, any of the, we're, we're now using queer, but any of the representations of myself which were beyond a cultural male body were not being recognised with the work. 
queerness or gayness was not re recognised with the work routinely, and it's often written in a really generous cultural frame, which discusses transformation and new period, and it, it discusses uh, material philosophies and all these kinds of ways that, and, and, and the reproduction of cultural forms. So when our scholars are writing around the works from a cultural lens, they're often on point and generous, but routinely what was occurring also was that the queerness was not being read with the work, which was always there. So in 2019, I exhibited this exact pairing of boomerangs, and it went unnoticed. Among, among a collection of 32 plinths, uh, and full disclosure, Hendrik commissioned that bundle of 32 for Documenta 14. Um, but among that bundle of, 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 of objects, which you'll see in the next slide, there's, there's some of the others there. This pairing, this coupling, wasn't recognised in a relational setting or in a potential personification. They were still rubber, rubber objects, rubber forms, or they were still boomerangs, they were still Aboriginal things, more so than the potential that these could be perhaps two people engaged in a relation. So, uh, looking at queerness and looking at particularly at gender and generating new spaces in the, in the, in the art practice and the things that we're interested in, often there's the, the, the slides back and forth. As we all know, I know it's in all of your work and all of your interests, but those shifts back and forth between which is the, the reading and which is the self which is being accessible at any moment. And that might be the one. So that's, that's the last slide I prepared today to be pretty brief, but um, actually there's one other thing which is important. So another example of an ancestral form or a strong old way that things were done or things are that has now got a new way. This comes from a different angle, but it's, it actually is so queer, which is really cool. Again, that same uncle of mine, my mother's brother, Milton Lawton, he and his uncle had begun making an, a, a women's uh, digging stick or fighting staff. Now that, that women's implement is about you know, 1.5 meters high. Um, it's made from Queensland rosewood predominantly and it is a digging stick which ancestrally was used for uh, ploughing the earth and, and, and accessing food, but also it's a serious women's fighting staff. And what's not understood often is in central Queensland, particularly my grandmother, Nana Ada, she would, could use that uh, women's fighting staff for a women's martial art, for holding peace and continuity and the law in the community. No women had been making that. I don't know of any of the women in all of our enormous connections that have ever made one. But those two men were making this women's digging stick. So one of the other ways that we have to do this now, if you look at that map, and if we, if we understand the gaps in our knowledge systems, that here were two senior men making a women's digging stick, not encroaching, but they were keeping that alive. They familiarised that form and that narrative, but particularly they valorised Nana Ada for being this kick-ass lawwoman. Uh, I can tell stories about Nana Ada and I can give specific information there, but another queering, I guess, of, of, of how do we keep a cultural inheritance strong in central Queensland is that in other parts of the continent, in Australia, Aboriginal conversations might be that that is women's business and that's not for you. You shouldn't be doing that. Well, that is not something that I would take up because it actually belongs to women's business. But here was two senior men who've actually now given an inheritance to the little girls in our family because I'm aware of four that have been made. And one, one has left our family to a mother of four, a single mother of four who I've seen use that digging stick to hold her space. Um, but if, we're look, if I'm looking in through my body and through my relation in my family at gender, very often I'm in a space with my mother or my female cousins drawing on my grandmother's knowledge, which many of it came to me, which can be passed onwards. But then here's two men in the family who have upheld this practice of making the women's digging stick, which now sits very strongly back in the hands of women in the family. So perhaps I'll leave it there. Thank you, Alan.
Thank you, Dee. Thank you, Christian. Um, and thank you for having me here. Um, so my name is Samuel Tin. I'm an artist um, based in Stockholm, and I uh, explore and activate queer history, often together with uh, my, my or other queer communities. Since 2013, I've made a series of queer guided walks in, for example, uh, Tirana, Belgrade, Stockholm, Gothenburg, Malmö, Chisinau. Uh, this is uh, actually from Oslo. This is uh, Lara Okafor, who, who was one of the guides here. Uh, these walks are based on stories told to me during interviews or written by community members themselves during uh, workshops that I uh, uh, facilitate. And the, the stories um, are both, or they both present a more official queer history of a, a place, but the emphasis is on the personal uh, memory of these uh, spaces. So, for example, here in uh, Oslo, let's see, uh, that was the uh, Kishinev one, and here, uh, uh, oh, this is from Malmö. Okay, uh, so um, uh, what? Da, 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 da. Um, so it, it uh, th they are also told in a first-person narrative, which is also important uh, to an imagined you. So, for example, here in Oslo. If you go to Möllergata 16, I think, uh, you have Venstres Hus. And the story there goes like, so we're standing how, uh, outside of Venstres Hus, and uh, 50 years ago, you and I went here to celebrate that uh, uh, male homosexual acts were no longer um, uh, 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 against the law, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, and uh, so I've been doing this a lot, and a project that followed on this was uh, a lesbian and queer uh, sing-along that I made, or a series of sing-alongs, uh, where I got together different generations of queer and lesbian people, and together we learned uh, songs from these di different generations. And uh, this is um, from Marabo Parken outside of Stockholm, and this is where I met uh, this person for the first time in my life. And this is Eva Lisa Bengtsson. Um, and we started talking, and after the sing along, she told me that she wanted to show me something. Uh, so we met, met, met up a few days later, and now I will, in a super, super short version, tell you what she told me that day. Um, so Eva Lisa, she was born in 1932. And even if she, at an early age, understood that she was a girl and not a boy, which her fa uh, family thought, uh, she didn't dare to tell anyone um, until 1964. And at this time, there were in mid mid 1960s, there were only a handful of doctors uh, in Sweden that had begun experimenting with uh, uh, what we today know as gender affirming care. And um, there were no official meeting places uh, or organizations. And RFSL, which is the Swedish version of FRI, uh, existed, but only organized uh, gay and bisexual people at this time. But uh, there were a handful of porn magazines that uh, uh, worked at relatively safe meeting places for trans people at this time. And in this particular magazine, Raff, uh, Eva Lisa got in touch with uh, Erika Sjöman. And together they started the first club for trans people in Sweden in 1964, uh, Transvestia. This is their first ad. And yes, I've read all Raff, Piff and Puff uh, magazines from 1963 to 1969 at the Royal uh, Library in Stockholm. Um, and after about a year, they got their own place, Spegelsalen, the Hall of Mirrors. It's a dance studio, so you have one of the walls are covered with mirrors. Uh, of course, a perfect catwalk for a lot of people who up until now have only been able to dress up in the privacy of their own homes. Um, 
after about a year after the first party, um, FPENE, an organization for heterosexual transvestites um, with its origin in the US, starts in Sweden, but also here in Norway and in Denmark. And the rules for membership in this new organization that soon becomes like the dominant organization for trans people uh, are very strict. You can't be transsexual, you can't be gay. And at this time they use the words transsexual and transvestite and not trans, person, uh, trans people as we do today. So, um, and also as a, um, these are all from tra transvestia, so I should just like, um, but um, I know, isn't it beautiful? Um, but in this new organization, um, uh, people like Eva Lisa, who was both transsexual and lesbian, didn't really fit in. So even if she kept Transvesti alive uh, until 1969, she uh, kind of moved away from the trans movement after that. Uh, and instead, she gets in touch with Stockholm's lesbian community. So she's a part of Group Victoria, um, Lesbisk Front. And she's also an important part of starting Kvinnohuset, the women's house in Stockholm. And during her uh, life, she also starts several organizations for trans people. And she's also an important part of the small group of trans people who, start, who pushes RFSL to finally, in 2001, include trans people. Um, she encountered a lot of... Um, uh, this is from the women's house. Uh, she encountered a lot of transphobia. In the 90s, there was a wave of transphobia that started to influence Swedish feminist and lesbian communities. And after almost, and this is an ad for a, a, a lesbian space, and it says only we women welcome, but no transsexuals or transvestites. And this was very common in the 90s to specif specify that you didn't welcome, uh, especially trans women. Trans men, of course, they didn't exist uh, in the eyes of these people. Uh, after 20 years of working with the uh, women's house, she received this very letter uh, telling her that she's not longer welcome at the women's house. Um, but she also found places where she was welcome, like uh, Jerry's uh, Dom Club. This is their first ad, um, uh, which was a lesbian club run by the butch uh, Jerry, this is Jerry and their partner Marta, uh, from their wedding in 1962, uh, so almost 50 years be before same-sex marriage was legal in Sweden. Uh, so here she found a, a place for her, and also at the kink club Lash, yes, yes. and also at Golden Ladies, uh, which is our sales group for senior LGBTQ women, this is from 1989. And the person in the uh, black dress is Matta, Jerry's partner. So these people, uh, yeah, hang out for a long time. So despite her great importance for uh, the queer movement in Sweden, relatively, has, relatively little has been written about her or about the history of the trans activist movement in Sweden. Uh, partly because of transphobia, but also because Eva Lisa could never live as a woman full time because her family couldn't accept her identity. And after she told me about her life uh, at this coffee we had, <laughs> um, uh, I nagged her for about a year to let me conduct filmed interviews, which she finally let me do um, in 2017. Eva Lisa passed away in 2018, and I found out because I she hadn't called me in a while. I f figured out her address and drove there, and, and a neighbor told me that the man of the house had passed away, away uh, a while ago. And after a while, I got hold of a family member of Eva Lisa who also told me that she had been buried under her legal male name without her. Uh, big queer uh, network of friends. Uh, 
this is from the memorial service that me and uh, her other friends um, arranged at RFSL shortly after this. About uh, six months later, I drove and picked, picked up the material which the family members said that she would otherwise have thrown away. And when I went through the eight moving boxes at home, I realized that Eva Lisa, for more than 50 years, has carefully and meticulously created a fantastic archive with a unique material uh, from Swedish trans history. Um, and for the past three years, I have worked to uh, make this archive and her uh, his, uh, history accessible through uh, Eva Lisa's, uh, the project Eva Lisa's uh, Monument. If not monument, but a, a, a memory work, is memory uh, maybe a better way to put it, uh, for a, a person who was never, never able to be, uh, be who she was uh, full time, but who nevertheless pay the way for an uh, entire movement. So yeah, that's me. Thank you. Uh, first off, because otherwise everybody's going to forget, uh, thank you everybody working with the like, technique stuff. You could like plug us at any moment and you're doing an amazing job. Thank you for that. They can also have a little bit of an applaud, I think. I had so many things planned out to say, like I, I had a plan. I don't always have a plan, gay ADHD, and you, the, like the one who knows, they know, but like I had a plan, and to sit on this stage after all of you is just like, how the fuck did I fit in with these giants? Like the work you do is fucking humbling. Um, but I think that's also what is going to bring me to my point. I um, fell in love with you the first time we spoke, Hendrik, and then we've been chatting and you looked amazing in your shoes last night and was just like, we're gonna go on dates. Uh, to choose a thing, a one thing, a person, to me is, it's, it's not possible because it's not a one person doing anything like what it's it's not a superstar uh, i've also also like always been more interested in villains than stars because what is it that makes the villain a villain um but to have a starting point somewhere um would be two people uh, and that is my mom uh, Nika Nika Marak. Uh, yeah, she can get an applaud. That was the most humble applaud ever. I'm sorry, Mom. Um, and then it's uh, the absolutely amazing, my forever queer crush, uh, Nasi Marili. And it's, yeah, they, they can also have an applaud, please. <clears throat> so many of the things uh, that the older I got made me different was never a, a problem. It, it made me different and it it absolutely became like an obstacle in conversations but it was never a problem because I've always felt loved I, I, I can talk shit about my mom but I will punch you in the face if you talk shit about my mom I will and people can be like ha I will We've had arguments, we have had disagreements, but I have never had to choose between my queerness or my culture. Like I came out because it was a thing you did, but I didn't have to. I've always 
felt loved. I've always had a home to come back to, and that is a privilege, especially among queers, that is so fucking rare. And the older I get, the more I realize that. And all of these things that made me different, that was never an obstacle, it was never a problem, instead made me the problem. Like, I, I, my body was like problem personified, like saw me and queer and loud mouth and everything I did that annoyed the fuck out of my teachers is what I make a living from now. <laughs> Which is also like, mm, being forced fucked with a language that I never got grades in, and I work as a poet. <laughs> I mean, uh. and I thought first that maybe it's my mom. Uh, maybe it's just my family. And then, because I grew up like both in Zahmi, uh, from Jokmok, and in Stockholm, but meeting other like indigenous and Sami people, I was like, okay, so this is a cultural thing, this is a Sami thing, so this, this is like the different... Pe like my friends did not say hi to their parents, they went and I, like hid, and like, I don't know. Uh, Yolanda Rorabum, also a fucking queero, said that uh, every kid that has had the, can you wait outside, what we're gonna eat, could you wait outside or wait in my room, and like, if, if you never heard this, you were most likely the family saying this to someone's kid. Not sorry. And then 2015, I had been in a, I, like, back when I thought I actually liked cis men. I'm sorry. Uh, it was a weird time. And it was a fucked up relationship with uh, an also Sami man. And then uh, I was asked if I wanted to be a part of this production called Vahak, and Nazi Marili working with it. Uh, this Swedish Irani amazingness. And my first meeting, like encounter with this person is a picture where they stand with a Molotov cocktail. And I was absolutely in love. They were so loving and so raw and so inviting and so honest about everything and we decolonized the room before we even touched the script. Like what, what are the trigger points in this room? What are the class differences? What are the pronouns? It was my first interaction with the word non-binary. Uh, the word non-binary was spoken by Tobias Pogatz, another queero. And I had to ask what it was, and they said, oh, but it's, th this is binary, so this is non-binary, which is funny because it's a very binary thing to say. So my first interaction with the non-binary thingy was in a, in a BIPOC queer room. And it was absolutely amazing because everything that I thought was just like, maybe this is just my family's way and femininity, maybe this is my culture's way and femininity, because my dad has been the one cooking and braiding my hair and my mom is a storm and he is a mountain and when she crashes, he's there, he's always there and he's, he's soothing and he's quiet and he's so kind and he absolutely did not want to talk about sex. When I was 12, I asked my mom about blowjobs and she was just like, oh, okay. Um, I, I was, my, my question was like, if somebody comes in your mouth, what do you do? And my mom was like, you're 12, but we're having this discussion, so. Um, the realization was that at the time, like growing up, it was not like an eye opener that my mom is giving me all of these tools and all of this love. And at the time meeting with Nassim, it was not a like, oh, so this is how you do it. It was a realization that, oh, there's more people like me. Because when people are like, mm, there's no one like you, you're original, like there's just one like you. I don't, I don't want that. I don't want me to be only me. That's fucking lonely. I chose my mom and Nassim because to me, they embody how to work as a collective. I'm grown up with saying hi to your neighbor 
and to never leave without like making sure that can you text me when you get home? Nobody should be hungry. We didn't grow up with a lot of money, but there was always food at home. And then I met this amazing person working to have like a gender neutral pronoun with the amazing uh, art collective uh, group called Ful. Um, instead, it has been a realization in every project from t like after 2016, after this tour and onwards since 2016 till now, they gave me a standard of how I want to work, how I want to interact, how I want to live my life, how I want to feel and make other people feel in a room. And it was not a realization there and then. It is something that I have been given without someone saying, I am giving this to you, I am teaching you this. They are, they are, they just are. There's so many amazing queer people. There are absolutely so many amazing queer people and there are just as many ways to be queer as there are queers. So if I'm going to talk about the collective, I want to start with these amazing human beings. Because it's not, it's not just the food presented or the, on the table or, or the art presented on the stage. It's when people say it's, it's not the destination, it's the journey, they can actually personify that. I know that you, Ailey, has done that first time we worked with Skadja, an amazing film. I'm, my tits are in it. If, you, like, if you're not intrigued, it's gay and there's tits. But you handpicked 10 different people who had never worked together, put them in your house. And it was absolutely amazing. Like, I, again, didn't have a lot of money. I never went to like, meet other people and be like, ooh, beach stuff. That was like, we had a gay 10 days. It was absolutely awesome. During the, the Vogas way, I've been working with queerness and culture for years. And during the pandemic, I started talking to this absolutely gorgeous person whose brain I just like, I could hump it because she's so smart. And we started talking and like every time we picked up the phone, it was just like we talked for three hours and then we didn't talk for two weeks and then three hours. And then Lisa Ravna calls me and says, do you want to be my activist for this? And it was absolutely gorgeous. First time I uh, performed by myself in Harsta, uh, I met Matthias because I said, are there any queer people here? And you said, yes. And it's a small town, so not many people dare to say yes. And that's also the same time where my amazing professional stalker, uh, Regina, started Hashta Pride. She, she started the first Hashta Pride. Three, like 3,000 people showed up for that parade. That is absolutely crazy. So yes, we can do, we can do huge things. We can stand on a stage and we can, we can burn flags. We can do all of that. But it, it's, it's the small things, giving compliments, being kind to each other. You can look at fucking Kate Bornstein, uh, It Gets Better on YouTube, wrote the book uh, 101 Alternatives to Suicide for Freaks, Teens and Other Outlaws. That is absolutely gorgeous. They may be illegal, unethical, self-destructive, but they're all in the book. These people to me represent what a collective should be. It should be, it should be. Honest. Because that's actually the only thing we can, we can do. The only thing we can do is try to get to learn how we work so that we can present ourselves who we actually are, because we need each other. When I, am, when I am burnt out because I'm standing on the barricades, I need you to have sex and drink wine and remind me of why I am doing this. I don't want to have, fight a war against something, I want to have a struggle towards something. 
the collective, I need people to make out and to burn flags at the same time. And these two people represent that through their art, through their love, through every fucking cooked meal. Um, Christophe Insulander, amazing, super gay, who made my outfit for, because 2019, uh, Stockholm Pride asked me to perform, and I was like, pink washing bullshit, but fine. If I can do whatever I want with whomever I want, and you can ask no questions, then I'm in. And they said, yeah. So I invited any and every activist I could have, and Christophe Insulander uh, gave me his amazing idea of making bricks. So we had this rubber madras that I cut up and I was like spray painted it and we said like XOXO Marsha P. Johnson and uh, greetings from Lapland. And we didn't tell any of the security guards. So we just like had a bunch of activists starting throwing rocks from the stage and they were like, Ugh. and he said that, yeah, no, Stockholm Pride is not really my thing, but like if, if the Sami homos are doing it, then that's fine. And he works with big artists, like the superstars, supernova stars and said that, yeah, that's fine. So I understand that it's a bit abstract and that my mouth is also super dry. Uh, that's not a hint to the lesbians in the room, it's just my medication. I love that I hear other ADHDers giggling in the audience. Like, do you have, are you neurodivergent or gay or both? But since I'm talking a lot, I'm just going to finish up with, with this. Uh, before that, anybody who's not signed uh, petitions, uh, like sign their names uh, to help uh, everyone and everything happen happening in Iran, uh, do that. Um, so, short text and then I'm fucking done. Yep. Is that okay? You are also, I've got ADHD. You're allowed to move. You do not have to sit still. Like, you do not have to be polite if that's hurting yourself. <clears throat> Stockholm Pride Parade 2007 was the first time uh, Sathme was visible in the parade. The first time we participated with our flags and wearing Gapte, our traditional regalia. There's a picture on my Instagram that Moyetne, my mom, posted on her Instagram. She's also the reason why I was there, visible, not just as queer, but as Sami. Growing up, I have always felt loved by my family, even when we've had arguments. I've never for a second doubted that love. And even though we've been made well aware by Swedish society that our indigenousness is either not wanted or exotic, I've never felt ashamed. Coming out was easy. I've never had to hide or tone down my culture or my queerness at home. My mother grew up during a time where people openly threw rocks at the Sami children. My mother is a part of the generation who often didn't get to learn their native languages because their parents or grandparents, due to their traumas caused by racist and colonial abuse, were too afraid to teach them. My mom fought for us to get the Swedish schools to give us a Sami teacher to help us actually learn the languages. My mother made us our first traditional clothing that we still have, hanging in the closet. My mom was the one who told me that we were going to walk in the Pride Parade in Stockholm, not just as queers, but as queer Samis. My mother did not just give birth to me. She gave me life. She gave me love. She... She gave me love, and love makes us strong. Love makes us shameless. And love makes us proud. She taught me that family isn't blood. Family is built with love without shame, and that the closet is for clothing. So, to my queer siblings, sisters and brothers, my kingster fam and fem dads, asexuals, gray sexuals, baby queer sex workers, poly babes, funky priders, aromantics, everyone in the closet, no matter the reason, and everyone who hasn't got or hasn't raised their flag yet, my whole queer family.
Thank you. Welcome back, everyone, um, for this beautiful last part uh, of our uh, symposium. Um, it's a part that I've been looking forward to because, um, God, you're amazing. <laughs> uh, and we've seen that now, and uh, yeah, that's, that's so good. But I wanted to thank you, really, from the bottom of my heart because um, the gift that you've sort of, you know, handed us this afternoon is to show a lot of yourself. And that is not easy, I know that. And so, thank you, really, for being here with us in such a way, because there's many ways of doing this. So please give them a very warm applause again. And in very beautiful ways, you have shared with us uh, yeah, this notion of sort of uh, icons, which definitely needs to unpack, you know, because it's a multiplicity always. Uh, it's a starting point, you know, for like, you know, sort of a conversation starter, if you will, <laughs> which uh, what we're doing now. But I would also like to um, kind of ask each and every one of you, and of course, please, like, respond sort of uh, to each other. It's a pretty sort of open forum. Uh, to sort of uh, connect these uh, sort of, you know, uh, objects in some cases, sort of uh, archives, sort of a, you know, sort of, an, sort of a city that inspires you, sort of a, a human being that sort of, uh, sort of uh, inspires you, to see how aspects of that informs your sort of uh, practice. Because, you know, I've, I've seen sort of uh, all your work and I think there's so many like relationships, I think, between what you shared sort of with us and also what you do as an artist. And, and you mentioned that, of course, but I just want to dig a little bit deeper. And uh, Christian, uh, if it's okay, I'm gonna start with you because you uh, paint and you paint wonderfully. It's amazing work. Um, and I think Valentina to have you know, her as sort of an icon makes so much sense because often in your work, there are these figures that are just so full of sort of as uh, sort of uh, elegance and sort of a uh, beauty and sort of history and sometimes you emphasize that in a certain way by having them have wings or sort of you know making them in a certain kind of like fluorescent way and especially in sort of your new series as well sort of i think certain formal sort of aspects sort of uh, come in where you highlight a sort of a person such as valentina or sort of as uh, sort of uh, other people as well could you could you make that sort of, uh, sort of a jump a little bit sort of with me on how you sort of uh, paint your figures actually and, and the thinking behind that? Well, I, I took a decision uh, maybe 25 years ago to paint all about my city, all about uh, the Amazonian region because in Peru, it was so hard in that time to show the other cities uh, that are not Lima, the capital. The official spaces, uh, the official places for the art don't show uh, the rest of Peru, the rest of the art production from Peru, uh, only show the uh, Lima art uh, and was so hard first to decide to paint the Amazonian culture and uh, the Amazonian culture is uh, the, the Amazonian uh, cultures are not good, uh, I, I don't know the word, but are not good for the uh, Lima culture. Oh. No? Historically, it was a bad society given to the pleasure, to the uh, excess, to the sin. No? Uh, and the figures and the imaging of the LGBTQ and plus 
community. It wasn't uh, represented in the art 20 years ago the, in Peru, and it was difficult to, to believe in a society uh, so uh, with so much diversity, but the, the art was not talking about that. And if I decided to paint about my city, uh, it had to be with all it uh, defines it's, um, it's particularly form to be, no? Este, I grow in Iquitos, and it is a very um, free style of life. Many times I say and I heard that there were, there are not a social difference, social classes. And that's a really every people a, go to the same places, a, like the same things. And in the last years with the globalization that it was is it, that is changing. But uh, when I grow in Iquitos, the sexuality was so open. The people talk uh, of sexuality with the uh, children. And in Lima, that was so hard to, uh, to understand. And my 10, maybe 10 or more uh, first years as a painter in Lima, it was, uh, I, I, I don't have, um, uh, what's the, the word? All the doors was closed for me. And, but I used to uh, work with many people, and that people uh, was near with, uh, to me, until today, and I uh, hear the ideas of my friends who are my models too, and it's like create a, like a, like create as a collective, you no, know, a, a, most people know in Peru that my work is not a, the work of a single artist. Uh, there is a community working with me, and um, there are many projects that we we do together. Um, you know, I am a curator too, and make m many exhibitions with uh, people that don't uh, see so itself as an artist years ago, and now they understand that they are an artist in every day in their lives, and not only uh, can be artist uh, can be an artist painting or doing uh, by the formal ways, and that I think uh, creates a movement uh, in about the queer community and Amazonian community at the same time. Um, I usually it take photos, videos, and all that uh, I used to, to paint is my reference for, uh, for doing my, my work. And I used uh, materials not only uh, paint with oil and canvas, I use different materials that are, uh, have a big re relation with their lives, with the city. Uh, I used to, to paint in metal or uh, 
ceramics that are part of the, of the life in Iquitos. No? Dee, may I ask to um, kind of build a bridge there to you because um, even though you're not officially a part of the group uh, proper now, it is, right. these are friends of yours. This yeah. is an artist, a collective of uh, sort of, um, of most of exclusively uh, Aboriginal sort of artists living yeah. in uh, Brisbane, yeah. uh, including people like uh, Richard Bell, Gordon Hooky, yeah. many others, and sort of the group has shifted a little bit over the last sort of 20 years, I want to say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a long time. And I mean, maybe mistakenly slow, and please sort of uh, correct me if you're wrong. You know, you're in the circle of that group, right? These are your friends. Yeah, and, we share and cutlery. You, yeah, exactly. You, you see each other. And I, they I think really. I've got one of Gordy's cups, pardon. <laughs> exactly. And they, in so many ways, sort of uh, paved the way to make a shift from saying, sort of uh, aboriginality is also sort of an urban kind of mm -hmm. sort of a community, right? Yeah. And it reminds me a little bit of saying you, you know, sort of in Lima, sort of the doors were sort of, uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, closed and also there a new way has to be found. Mm -hmm. And standing on the shoulders of sort of a, a generation of a proper now, how is that for you actually? That's hideous. No, I'm being very, that's the way they would answer. Um, it's a great privilege. It's a great privilege. So, um, you know, the two artists you mentioned are very significant, uh, particularly presences in Europe, but also um, earlier on today, legitimately, it's in my pocket. Uh, in one of the other talks, I, someone was talking about imagining victory, and that's one of their languages. Um, but I also thought, and I've written her name, is Jennifer Hurd was one of the founding members of Proper Now, one of the few people who sat around the, the kitchen table in one of their houses and said, well, what are we going to do? And that's their story, so they should tell that. But Jennifer Hurd was my professor at art college, and Jennifer sat with me in her f final months of being a professor and said, if a warrior woman uh, can't imagine what she's going for, well, she won't achieve victory. So she was suggesting that you've got to be able to imagine victory to be able to move towards the thing that you want, particularly if you can imagine victory and then share that with others, then you can move towards that victory together. So that's, Jennifer came up today as well and she's at the core of Proper Now. But how is that? Um, it's just, it's just every day. So that's, I guess, the answer. How is life being a, a newer artist, uh, age doesn't have so much to do with it, but a newer artist coming after those other three or almost four generations who came before me, uh, the things that they have shared with me just come up unprompted. Yeah, I'm very often quoting the proper now artists, um, but what is really key for them, there's probably a couple of things that I take away. One is that their focus is to be accessible to their families and their home communities. Pardon, I do have a fast way of speaking, I'll chill, I'll slow down a little bit. But one of their priorities is to ensure that their work, uh, maybe it's not as, as formal as, I'm, as I'm, I'm describing it, but their work is accessible to their home communities. That's what I see as a priority and that's how I see their contribution continues to grow outwards is that um, their home families and home communities can access their own work. and they can still be at the dinner table forming the global conversation around what it is to be a First Nations person and a contemporary artist and your needs and wants in that professional space. So that one, accessibility. And the other one is just uh, accessibility as well. Like um, uh, you, you can get close to those artists. So as a student, and this was a long time ago now, but as a student, those very senior artists would um, just sit next to you at lunch as a student on a big long bench table. They would arrive and sit down and you might have, <clears throat> you might have been studying them and looking at their work in a lecture before you broke for lunch, but then they would pull up and sit next to you and, and ask you if you'd like some potatoes. So they're, they're the, what is it like? That's the stuff. We can feel quite good about ourselves at times being artists in the world and we can feel quite pretty about uh, our presence in the world but that's the stuff that matters to me. Mm. That uh, new, new people, new ideas, and particularly home communities can, can come and sit next to you and, and just pick up the conversation.
Well, and, and that is such a space that you were sort of uh, describing as well, I think, you know, to, to emphasize that notion of sort of being part of a group, being part of a sort of collective as well, and something that, um, because I know you mostly through your writing, actually, uh, but I also know that you are sort of an uh, organizer, you know? Would you mind, well, I mean, very, I mean, actively sort of uh, bringing people sort of uh, t together in whatever sort of, uh, sort of a shape or form, um, and I think it speaks to, you know, what you sort of shared with us this uh, afternoon of kind of being able to make those uh, sort of uh, connections. And do you, maybe this is a really lame thing to ask, but do you see yourself as an organizer in that sense, like to, to sort of uh, play that role? Because you've had, you know, sort of the a pleasure of being part of a lot of other people's sort of mini uh, collectives as, as well. No, I would see myself as a connector, but not as an organizer. I, I can introduce people to each other that have so much knowledge and that should definitely meet each other. But the, the organizing part, especially if we're talking about it as in like a colonial like uh, administration work, is that's not, that's not my jam. My, my head just goes and it does not work. Uh, but I'm good at talking and I'm good at connecting people to each other and I think I'm fairly good at seeing that these two people or these five people should definitely meet and do whatever the fuck they want because they make the world. They are an access to the world and a danger to society and that's why they should hang out more. Sam, I also wanted to ask you for, for, for a second, because, you know... Um, Your presentation was amazing. Totally. Yes. Yeah. Your presentation was amazing. Yeah. It was really beautiful. Oh, sorry. Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> Your presentation <laughs> was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Eva Lisa, of course, and, and sort of the archive that you hold at the moment, and... Uh, finding different forms for as well uh, in your own sort of uh, sort of uh, practice, and and you mentioned that um, like somewhat to like uh, readings and of course walks and like the film as well. But but how would you describe your because it's a recently found sort of uh, let's say uh, object in uh, in a way. But on the other hand, you've also spent some years with this now. How has the relationship with the archive sort of changed and how you relate to it as well as an artist? Uh, well, it's, it's very much a never-ending source of amazing material. Like, I can't stress how, how uh, beautiful it is. And uh, I have went, I've gone through it all. Uh, I haven't read every single word because that would take years because it's, you know, eight moving boxes of letters and texts and I always have something, to always have something yeah but I, I also want to stress that I the, the archive is not in my basement anymore luckily it as it uh, is at uh, Kurab the queer movements uh, archive and library in Gothenburg which is an amazing place so they they store it um, uh, but your question I don't know I'm just I'm uh, just obsessed with it, and uh, I think that I have known since like I had it in my home that I will uh, I will probably work with this uh, maybe for the rest of my life <laughs> in some way because it's it's still so and that's the thing right it's still so relevant for uh, the queer community today. I mean it's, I mean just the the theme of uh, one marginalized group, instead of solidarizing with an even more vulnerable group, distance themselves to protect their little status. I mean, we have, you know, white feminism or the early workers' movement not wanting to work with women. I mean, we see this all the time in all kinds of justice movements. Uh, and we, we have that today, certainly. <laughs> Uh, but I th what's so important with Eva Lisa's uh, history is also that we see the, the opposite all the time, the, the kink community showing up 
uh, golden ladies <laughs> uh, and like the um, the, the, the butch slash trans masculine who, that didn't use those words in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Uh, yeah, very much also showing up for their uh, trans sisters. Um, so I think it's, it's this story, I mean, it's, I think for me it's relevant to repeat it constantly in different ways. And I, for me it's very natural to work uh, with my community or the community that is uh, touched by this uh, story. Uh, so I, I really like the role as a facilitator because I, I also have this uh, little control uh, uh, person in me that likes to like uh, organize and put together and buy this cake and you know <laughs> ask my mother to hand out the cake because to have a mother in a in a trans community means something more than in other uh, spaces. So uh, yeah, I very much enjoy it. <laughs> but to do it, of course, in, a, in an accessible way, so you don't have to be like an artist, you don't have to be an, I don't know, gender theorist person to understand what you're experiencing. Oh. Could I, could I jump in? Um, and to ask a question, and, and I, I believe we've all got experience and also, we were speaking earlier on about um, uh, intergenerational and repetitive work and, you know, people putting in a huge amount of effort until it's time for them to not do that or to slow down or whichever. But I, I caught what you said about um, to repeat it, to repeat it, maybe repeating actions or repeating knowledge or repeating uh, histories, these kind of things. Um, are there strategies that you have which are helpful for you that you feel like sharing or are they your... Your, your, your personal approaches? Strategies for? Uh, for repeating or pr strategies for um, embedding, like uh, repeating and repeating and repeating until it becomes just embodied knowledge or embodied practice? I mean, I think that the, my, my very... What's it say, man? Also, my manic, <laughs> my manic obsession with it, and me speaking in 110, like <laughs> telling the story again and again and again, uh, which I very much enjoy doing, is part of that. And so I, I take the chance, and I also, the the city walks I do, I do them on a regular basis in Stockholm. I have like maybe 10 every year, so I do it, and I. I tell the story when I teach, and so it's just it's just a matter of like uh, getting the story in different contexts, or like writing, a, getting invited to write a text and write about it. So yeah, and 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 do it together with the community in a way that is relevant for me and for them and us. I don't know if that answered That's your right. question, That's but just, yeah, it's genuine curiosity. Yeah, I, I yeah, it's cool. Uh. Uh, the fact that you keep doing and keep doing. Mm. Mm. Also to see, I mean, now sort of the archives, archive has like uh, shifted to another home in a way. Of course, that then enters a different realm a little bit as well, I sort of imagine. Um, and <coughs> builds a different sort of uh, accessibility perhaps as well. Like I'm sort of curious what how that archive will live in this sort of a particular uh, institution. Could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it, in one way, it is accessible, but also like who goes to an archive? Like you have to be a certain kind of nerd or like, so I, I <laughs> so the, uh, but uh, I have I, a very close contact with them and we have very like strict rules like who can get access to it and certain material will be not accessible to anyone until like 50 years or something like that um, yeah and I, I, I don't know it's also something that might may be interesting also for you to talk about because I think a lot about also like like I really want to share the, the story with everyone like who wants to listen but I've thought more and more about like what it means when I share the story to people who are not queer, for example, and this is a conversation that I had with Samuel Girma, who's a colleague. We also organize these events at, in, in Stockholm at the moment. You can look up uh, Samuel Girma uh, under the for blackness uh, on Instagram. Absolute icon. 
Yes, he is truly amazing. But and we we talked a lot about like, okay, trying to create a room for uh, for us. For uh, he's black and queer, and I'm uh, white and queer. But how we can like think about care and 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 think about like because the events are open to everyone. And I don't know. We've had a lot of discussion. Like, should we just like not tell all stories in all rooms and you know, um, can I ask maybe you that? Yeah. Or if you want to continue this, what I started and yeah, couldn't finish. Yeah, um, maybe I'm hearing disclosure, what to invite people into and what to uh, not disclose. Um, I work, again, being in this body uh, and being able to meet my mother and her sisters and my female cousins and my sister in conversations around their inheritance Disclosure is really important, uh, and um, yeah, th that's pr pretty sensitive. But uh, so, what to share and when, and how to share, or uh, these are the things that we're working at. Particularly, and this comes back to art practice: being inside museums, being inside um, conversations, but also being visible. Lots of people have done lots of work about this for a long time. There's lots written, but also it does require constant attention. Yeah, I've worked with my mother a lot uh, since 2016 and almost every time it's a matter of just safety between the two of us to say, um, uh, what do you feel like sharing? This is on your terms. What do you want to tell an audience or even my cousin Hayley Matthew? My mother Kate Harding, I haven't named her yet. Um, Kate Harding and my cousin Hayley Matthew and I have just recently made a new big work. And the question was for Haley, um, a genuine, safe invitation to a public program. And the question was for Haley, do you want to share anything? And she said, well, then we would change the way we're working if I just disclosed everything. And that's the point of the practice. So I've, I've, I've touched on that, but the, the idea is that she knows that there's boundaries. And she reminded me in the invitation You've got a safe place to come and share with an audience, but she just called it and, and said, well, that, that counteracts the artistic process we've just taken up. Well, yeah. I mean, just a super short like, uh, anecdote. I remember actually a moment in uh, Bergen at a certain point, this was in 2019, during Paul, Paul uh, Preciado's sort of uh, program, which actually was a God, seven, eight hour long sort of marathon of a lot of uh, queer folks, actually, you know, like, sorry? Oh, <laughs> um, and uh, it, was, it was kind of amazing, I think, yeah. It was, it was kind of amazing, but also a very fragile space, because at a certain point, there were people kind of, you know, coming from sort of the uh, sort of uh, audience, like ridiculing that space and making it a very unsafe space actually for someone to be in. I'm not sure if that's where you want to go with that, but it's someone that I, I mean, God, now that I've thrown the term sort of uh, organizer out there, whatever, but facilitator, think about a lot, you know, like how, and, and I know you're doing that with sort of your uh, evenings as well at like uh, Jaspers, like how to actually build a space where people feel safe to share parts of themselves without facing another form of like a violence or another form of like a trauma somehow. But isn't, sorry. Again, saying this, I also know that I come from a privileged position of always having a home to go to that's where I'm speaking from, but um, <clears throat> it's always about the context and the context will always be colonial. Uh, it can be more or less colonial. It can be a more or less separatistic room. But when I do what I do, I'm not doing it for the straights. But I have been forced fucked with their their history, their knowledge, their version of me for such a long time that why why would I not take up these spaces unapologetically if I can from my privileged position of knowing that I can go home? I have a mom that will embrace me and say fuck them or don't because they don't deserve sex. Uh, which is a very interesting way of putting it because it excludes all of the asexuals. 
someone said that maybe all of the sex sirens are actually asexuals just like fucking with them, but just mentally, ADHD, derailed. My point is it's, it's not for them. So all of these, these reactions, uh, all of these thoughts about will we have to, we, we know that if it's, it's, it can be physical violence, it can be like economical violence, it can be emotional violence, it can be loneliness, it can be, it can be death in, in so many ways, on so many levels, like by our own hand, because we feel lonely. But having to look over our shoulder, having to, having to trying to predict every step is one of the worst things about being any of us. Mm. So uh, being unapologetically queer without calling myself an artist or an activist is also an act in itself. So when actively being an activist, actively being an artist, being an artivist, why, if, if they become upset, that's their fucking problem. When they turn it to violence, that, then it becomes my problem. But, but not being who I am because I'm scared will, not, will, will also give them the space to be comfortably straight. Totally, that's not at all Am what I, I was saying, actually. Am I making any sense? Actually. Because no, if, was, if, they, yeah. if they become upset, if they become annoyed, like when people are talking about, like, mm, how can we I'm not, just talk about yeah. queer, queer sex, for example, no, totally. that is something that would gain, like, would, would, would benefit everyone if we, instead of, of talking yeah. about reproduction yeah. sex and STDs and STIs, talk about yeah. how to have pleasure and, yeah. like, consensuality. That would benefit everyone, but it would be very queer. I agree. <laughs> so why would we not do the same with, with all of the things we are doing? Having a position where I can be openly queer, it, I think it's something that is scary, but it's a must. Totally. Sam? No, but I, was, I, just, I think that you, also, you were talking about like the, the safety for the, 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 the actual safety for Paul B. Preciado that you mentioned, for example, and, and how, and I, like I think Judith Kiros, who is a, a Swedish uh, poet who um, w was with us uh, yesterday in, in Stockholm, talked a lot about like uh, when you are in spaces that are not 100% um, uh, safe, or like when you're in, an, in this room, for example, or in institutions, um, how you, how you uh, must harden up a bit, or when you're in, in our society, you must have a, a little shield, you must protect yourself, like, in a bit. Uh, you, you can't let all, the, you, you can't let, like, the world in, because it would be, like, um, so, maybe I'm just losing, losing track here, yeah, a bit. but I was just, I wanted to say that it was more about that, about, like, how we, how we protect our, ourselves and how and I, I, I what I wanted to add was that like uh, I, when people are talking about this is a safe space like I think that is something to really stop doing but to practice that instead and to 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 see can we make a safe space and then we not, don't have to say those words but like really try to practice it instead and I think uh, it's it's also a question Tim and me for, for you as well um, between is there a difference between what we do as culture for ourselves and for, for me and you to do for ourselves uh, as culture or as an educational model? Like uh, the responsibility often on our shoulders is to be teaching and informing and also saying things like, uh, this is a safe space. Can we, do we already have practices which is just culture? And we don't need to talk about it if it's culture. But I think often, particularly when we step onto a stage as a teaching or a pedagogical kind of uh, coat or, you know, baggage that we wear. So I have a question whether you might see a difference between doing it as culture for ourselves and, a, and, a, and an educational model. No. Everything we do is teaching something, someone something all the time. Every interaction is a learning opportunity. And the, it's all about the context and the viewer. Right. Um, everything we do from the stage now, if, if I was to punch you in the face, what would the reaction be? Why did I do that? What, what, what was the context? But now just talking, asking questions of how, 
how are we talking about just knowledge and and I think again that's why I always fall back on it's not a one person it's 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 the collective it's it's collective knowledge it's the shared knowledge all the time because there are as many ways to be queer mm. as many ways to be an artist as many ways to be indigenous as there are people we will do things differently so all of them will be teaching opportunities then we can look back like on history and statistics statistics that we have today um, we talked about it if it was yesterday or during breakfast but I mm. like I have never not been open with that being a professional indigenous homosexual is my selling point. But if right. people want to throw money on me because this is what I am, when I already do it every day, why would I not take this opportunity if I feel that I have a power position and a privilege from right. where I can work and also have a collective around me that I can invite, make sure that them, they are actually getting paid for, for being what they are. I mean, all of us have at some point in history been seen as actual circus freaks. Mm. We, have, we have been yeah. measured, we have been weighed, we have been looked at, we, are, we still are. You don't ask a flower to do circus tricks for you to, to let it grow there, but we have to. So sometimes I will do it to get paid and then other times I, I, I do it for, for the people I'm around, but no matter what I do, everything is a learning opportunity. Mm. And I hopefully always learn something as well. Um, right. But that's also, again, why I need this co the collective, because I need to ask people, like, is this something I should do? Am right. I too tired? I've been talking to you, like, is this a poem that I should present to people in general, or is it something that we share? It's, it's all a learning opportunity. Hmm. Otherwise, we will say that knowledge, again, is something that is just in, like, there, there's a difference between being taught and being schooled but they are both learning opportunities. Yes. I mean, I think also yeah. this is such an interesting question in relationship to the space that have been and are being built during this year. In are we talking Norway. too fast for anyone? Also, we are talking so much, you are not saying anything, sorry. I understand, I understand. That. No, I was asking everyone, just, <laughs> I talk a lot. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Uh, what was I saying? Now I lost my uh, train of thought. I'm so sorry. Um, Oslo, yes. I mean, just I'm, I'm, I was looking at you and, and thinking, of course, about, about sort of the talk that you sort of gave this morning and, and how many, you know, spaces are being sort of constructed now at the moment. It's not even asking for a response, it's just me venting, basically. <laughs> it's just like how, how many of these spaces that are being built this year that, yeah, may appear a certain way, but actually are quite a different thing. And I did want to ask you, uh, Christian, Especially because, you know, we haven't really talked so much about that, but your uh, curatorial work, actually, you know, in, in, in that sense, is how are you thinking through some of these sort of uh, questions through that part of your uh, sort of uh, practice of building a space for the artist and sort of the uh, practitioners, let's say, that you show in uh, exhibitions and you've done a lot of uh, sort of different things. Um, and it depends on where, of course, and, and with whom, but how to build that space for those artists that they can express in a safe way what they want to. I'm very curious. Well, I, uh, I start to make a curatorial, my curatorial work uh, when I didn't know the, that work. Uh, at that time, when I was 23 years old, I found, found the foundation, yeah, the create a space for uh, children who live in the streets, they don't, who, who didn't have houses, house, homes in Iquitos. We, with two friends, uh, we used my atelier in Iquitos to make a, a workshop and an exhibition with that guys who lived in the streets. And then the house uh, turns into a association, 
and it works for 20 years. And now I work with many of the kids that are uh, artists, uh, directors of uh, film directors, uh, chefs, and and in some works they are my my este my boss <laughs> and uh, and in that time i start to make a little exhibitions in the same place we lived and then in bars and discotheques in Iquitos because we have a, a message to the people that was first uh, well, then I have to to go to I had to go to Lima to be in the official space of art, and uh, I continue my work as a curator, thinking exhibitions for many people that don't have that opportunity to to show their works, but basically because there, are, there were works so interesting that the people was not a, the people didn't understand in that moment. And in that group, I think the indigenous art of the Amazonian that now is I can do it so I can say it with total uh, so sure, so sure, certainty. In this moment, the Amazonian art and the indigenous uh, art from the Amazonian is the most important in these years in, in Peru. So, uh, many exhibitions, uh, awards and international exhibitions of artists that didn't uh, have the opportunity 10 years ago. And uh, in that uh, practice, um, I work, we work, because many people work in these projects, um, we have uh, archives, we have uh, um, historical art that was not a, that don't have the attention in the last years we put uh, we, we generate attention in artists that in the last 20 or 50 years was uh, forgotten and was so very important in the time um, now in this moment I came, I was flying to Oslo and I, I didn't uh, stay in the inauguration of my last exhibition because I was flying here. Yes, and sir. it's a big exhibition in the Contemporary Museum of Art of Lima. And its name is, I don't, I don't know if I can say it in English, the rivers can exist without waters, but not without orillas. The, the, the limit of the water. Barriers. 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 Shores. 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 Shores, but not without shores. shores. And it was because uh, there are many, many things that was invisible, but was existing and many artists that was invisible for many time but was creating and growing and this exhibition is uh, try to to show a big a uh, panoramic of what are the uh, amazonian artists uh, thinking about amazonia no uh, change the way to see uh, the, the classical way to see the, the Amazonian uh, and can uh, understand that uh, it's 
more bigger than we we know. I I saw the photos, the photographs of the uh, inauguration, and was fantastic to see many people, many artists from the Amazonian in in there, no, like a, like superstars now, no, and uh, different people from cities, from. Uh, Ethnias and every kind of people. Good job. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I um, want to look out a little bit. I know we're at the end of a full day, um, but if you have any like uh, questions for our amazing uh, artists on the stage, now is the time. Um, but I can also imagine, you know, uh, that we need to uh, continue over some wine at, s at some point. Um, and I don't want to run too late. We've actually managed to sort of uh, catch up a little bit, which is nice. And then, um, so I think I That's want to... That's actually called gay indigenous time. It means you can take as long as you want, as long as you can run in heels. Well, as long as the body right. holds up, you know, and <laughs> it's falling apart, gay honey. Life. So <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask you to give these four amazing speakers another warm round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I am, before I give the floor back to you, um, want one more round of uh, applause for Solveig, the whole team of Astrup Fanley, our amazing AV people over there. Thank you for supporting us throughout the entire day. Uh, Tomas over there on sound. Everyone's worked amazingly and so hard to make this happen. And so thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Timimi, the final word is yours. We're going to go off the stage. And then it's your turn. So please, one more round for Atimimi Marak. Hello. That, hi, how are you? You good? Drinking water? Any gay people in the audience today? Tired gayness, that's so cute. <clears throat> the noises you make, the sight of you naked leaves me sleepless. So I sleep, less you're my weakness, I'm a mess. Up you're my princess, I'll gladly bow down, wrap your legs around my head and wear you like the crown you are. Your pussy is like music to my tongue, your pussy is like music to my tongue, your pussy is like music to my tongue. Hi. Yeah, you're, I, I always get weirded out when it's like, am I supposed to interrupt or, or just see how long the applause are going? Uh, but since my gay ADHD is like peaking right now, I'm gonna just try to do this. Uh, and I'm going to read in both English and in some Swinglish, so I hope you're fine with that. Uh, I don't think that I would have been standing here if it was not for gay people, if it was not for allies, and if it was not for especially my grandma, who always read loud to me. Uh, so I, I've been trying to like think about what are the gayest poems I have. Um, and then I realized I'm gay. So they're all gay, I suppose. Uh, and since uh, so many of my queeros are in the audience, uh, I want to follow that one up uh, with one that I know is a favorite to a friend of mine. Sipping coffee more than often. Women loving women, loving women and the land. Fighting for the right to breathe fresh air, the right to hold her hand, the right to for just a little while. Feel 100% safe. 
if you were to ask me to choose between her and my culture, it would be like asking me to choose between breathing or drinking water. I need both. Without any of them, I am no longer me because what I am is not a choice. I cannot choose to lose any part of myself. Coloniality, you hold functions because you don't feel one. Sipping coffee more than often, but spilling the tea. Gender benders, beings beyond the binary, decoloniality has always been a part of me. It is what we are. Sami. I know you saw me. I know you know little to nothing about my gap there, so don't come at me with your questions and opinions about my identity, coloniality. Having to pass, to be able to pass people on the streets without preparing to run. Sipping coffee more than often, and we keep it salty. Manhood in the woods, in the mountains, in the middle of nowhere, and still you care. Out of all the things, you choose the one thing not connected to how you act. I see friends act colonially manly, mainly because of convenience. Your convenience. If not, it is used as evidence when declaring yet another war disguised as work opportunity, coloniality. You build roads and refuse us our ways. Sipping coffee. Decoloniality is to feel love for the land naturally. Decoloniality is to be you, present and connected, rather than do according to whatever has affected our perception of perfect and right. I rather do wrong being me than being right-wing dividing human beings. Coloniality is not seeing that indigenous starts with I, with me, and ends with us, and that us includes you. I cannot be without us. I cannot be without us. Sipping coffee. Women loving women, loving women in the land. If you were to ask me to choose between her and my culture, it would be like asking me to choose between breathing or drinking water. I need both. If you were to ask me to choose I'd ask you to go first. Yay, gay stuff. <clears throat> Where did I put my phone? I have no fucking idea. There's one that I've translated and I'm so tired that I don't even know if I can remember it correctly right now. Is this like bugging? Is this, if I feel like, that's your phone. <laughs> Where the hell's my phone? Yeah, fuck that. Um, I, I really want to do like two more. One of them is longer, uh, but I also, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this is a, it might be a long shot, I don't fucking know. Um, but there's another amazing poet in this room and I was wondering if you had something short that you wanted to read because sharing is caring and I think that you should hear this amazing artist. Do you have a short poem that you would like to share? Can you please give a warm hand to this amazing poet? Ologito, tusen tack. Fantastisk i Timmy. Det var inte förberett på. Vi snor lurte i det hela tatt. Hej Queen. Gott att se dig. Huskar du vem som satt vid detta bord först? Och vem som täckade så fint för många glömmer att också Norge har en urbefolkning. Men idag. Slappa. På skolan så lärde vi om detta hela två och en halv sida i storboken. Vi vet om joik, vi vet till och med om förnorskningspolitik och ja. Vi kan känna att det var ett stick i hjärtat på en hel befolkning. Behovet ditt för att skrika om detta i nitrine mitt hjärper ingenting. Dör och fortsätt till. 
Gör det? Vad jag berättar dig att inte stoppa i 1960 att vonde vaner är hare och vänner att folk fortsatt lever med konsekvenserna av livene som blev tvunget på dem som blir tvunget på dem vad vet du om samhets diskriminering och inträngande ingrepp i naturen som inte är Norges men deras men våres om namn som att det läggs igen i fortida våra namn for det var den eneste måten å eie land, navn som ikke lenger finnes tunga mi. Den krøller sig hver gang jeg prøver å snakke språket til familien min og være for norska. Er du av deler av den du er strødd rundt som brødsmuler som jeg mistet på veien, finner du mig? Og strekke sig til hender som jeg ikke lenger kjenner og sier unnskyld, unnskyld for at jeg glemmer, for vi må alle huske. Huska att det fortsatt sker, huska att vi sammen kan göra något med det lytt till glömte stämmer. Lär och läs och bli med i kampen mot diskriminering och usynliggöring hilsen. En liten och för norska del av vår urbefolkning. Tack. So I, I, we, we did, no, just keep going. I'm just going to talk anyway. We also had not coordinated our, our, our outfits. Yeah. Indigenous dykes. Are you really? Uh, you gave a person with ADHD a microphone. <clears throat> okay, I've got two more. Uh, one in Swinglish and one in English. You ready? Halv lapp, halv läbb, halv slapp, halv känd, mitt emellan allt jag är halvvärst helt utbränd, undviker politiken. Kalla mig skygglapp men jag vägrar att bli utsliten. Kalla mig brasklapp men jag är så fucking trött på skiten. Det måste finnas mer för oss i livet. En kampen, identiteten borttappad, upphittad, som av Columbus utställd och uttittad, som Herma Lundborg utmätt och uppsnittad. Men jag svär att du kan aldrig lära gamla hundar sitta. Jag är långt ifrån din fördom, är lika långt från färdig. Är långt ifrån din fiende, är lika långt från fullärd. Arctic indigenous excellence in progress, baby. Borta bra, men hemma överallt här. Välkommen till Satmi. Oavsett årstid, alltid vackert här som ut. De vill spränga bort oss, men vi vet att jag kan mera kraft än krut. Våra decolonized eyes, baby. Visar alla deras colonized lies, baby. Och jag vet att det har varit mycket kaos lately. Men ingenting är svartvitt via colorized, baby. Våra decolonized eyes, baby. Visar alla deras colonized lies, baby. Och jag vet att det har varit mycket kaos lately. Men ingenting är svartvitt via colorized, baby. Vi är som norrskenet mer än vi är sken av. Vi är som midnatt sol om sommaren tar det helt av. Vi är som elven, ingen här får skera något. Som en eld här, alla här brinner för något. Så vi är colorized, ingenting är vitt svart. Vi är som regnbågen, kalla mig för slicklapp. Kalla mig Elsa Laula, jobbar i härdigt. Kalla mig Baruk, språkgeni och karriärsvep. Kalla mig Boyne, jag hörs över hela världen. Kalla mig Kitok, för jag gör det obekväm visst. Ingen tid för colonize lies, ingen tid att minimize. Kalla mig långa lappflickan, jag är minority supersized. Våra decolonized eyes, baby, visar alla deras colonized lies, baby. Och jag vet att det har varit mycket kaos lately, men ingenting är svartvitt via colorized, baby. Norr om på många eyes, eyes, babies. Du som gnäller över vintern, gråten, istapp, babbage. Vi jobbar oss varma, vi svettas i sauna, vi biter ihop och vi kommer att stanna. Vi kommer tillbaka vid nutid som ader. Vi vet hur vår jord, ingen allsmäktig fader. Vi vet att vi alltid bär med oss vårt hem. Men det är hit vi kommer när vi kommer hem. Våra the colonized eyes, baby. Visar alla deras colonized lies, baby. Och jag vet att det har varit mycket kaos lately. Men ingenting är svartvitt via colorized, baby. What are the colonized eyes, baby? These are all of their colonized lies, baby. Oh, I know that there has been a lot of chaos lately. But nothing is white with the colorized, baby. Thank you. Before this last poem, which is one of my 
the oldest one I've got. I I said that I like I've been I've been thinking so much about the things that I want to say and so many shout outs and stuff like that. And I know that there's been a lot of chaos lately. There's bullshit going on everywhere, but a lot of the subjects that we are touching on, like as gay people, as queer people, is like the, the kink life, having to sell our bodies and prostitution and trafficking and, and all of that. But I, we have to remember that sex work is work and pro or against sex work, it's not gonna disappear and pro or against sex work. If you want to see representation, go to Pornhub. Anything that is called phobia, anything that is called racism, all of it, that's where you find representation. And if, if you think it's horrible what's happening, then you should work for their rights too because there's always someone who has it worse and we should never belittle them or their struggle, never kick downwards, because they are paving way for all of us, whether we like it or not. Me and my sister have been working against the mining industry for I don't know how fucking long, and the mines are not gonna disappear, and people will still need work, and they sign contracts that fucking sucks, but there's work, it's, it's workers' rights. Can I, I, please, can we think about sex work in the same way that if you're, if you're against it, if you're for it, make sure that people stay safe rather than you stay comfortable. Um. There will be helicopters chasing us for the beats we dropped, we dropped them. Cause like with Pringles, once you popped them, you can't stop, man. We pop a political question cause we're on a political quest, man. And for all of you that understand this one goes out to my biggest fan. They see me rolling. They hate it with a buggy and a board and an attitude you can't afford to keep hating all you want cause the pen is always sharper than the sword. Cause my sister, siblings, brothers, I won't even try to bother to explain it. Each it beat it, my land, my hand, like a fist in the air, shake it like I don't care. When you try to scare me, please be joking. I'll be choking, calling me a junkie. What the fuck have you been smoking? My kin will live on when you and I are both gone and they will know that you were wrong because sisters, siblings, brothers, never hush. We know you think we're too much. Local people never crush. You know we never stop opponents. Be afraid because when I laid my head to the ground, I knew it was bound to happen tapped and those under tapped back and don't attack our land thinking she won't fight back don't attack our land thinking she won't cry taking what's ours and yeah you owe me whatever you got go ahead please show me how you're gonna give when there's nothing left and you still without it being called theft and i wonder if you sleep well i wonder if you can tell what that cold chill down your spine is and if when they come for you you still think ignorance is a bliss when the storm comes We'll write it out and you will know me. When they come for you, you will know that you owe me. Gate.